The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Ms Hogan Doran, good morning. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, this morning, we, or today, we move to looking at recovery from natural disasters uh, in the local government context. Uh, this first up, we have um, Mr. Peter Fitchett from the Shire of Dundas, WA. Uh, then we are moving to Ms. Dovey. We'll take a panel from Tawong Shire and Indigo Shire Council. After the morning tea break, we will have a panel uh, with Bega Valley Council, Southern Downs Regional Council in Queensland, and Wallandilly Shire Council. Uh, this afternoon, we will hear from the local recovery coordinator at Shoalhaven City Council, and then we will complete the day with a quite large panel of local government associations representatives uh, from New South Wales, South Australia, Victoria, and also the national body. I should note that overnight we received a submission to the issues paper by the West Australian uh, Local Government Association, which we're grateful for, and we'll um, provide that uh, to you in the course of the day. Uh, and in addition, uh, after lunch, there have been a substantial number of additional responses to the issues paper on local government. Uh, those are being processed and we will provide those to you formally this afternoon, uh, including uh, issues papers that, sorry, responses to issues papers from councils that have already been heard from yesterday and the day before. Uh, so we'll identify those to you so that their responses can be taken in, into account when you're considering their evidence from the earlier sessions. Thank you. Busy day. Busy day. Yes, we have 16 witnesses today. Look forward to it. Uh, I call uh, Mr Fitchett. Mr Fitchett, good morning. Thanks for joining us. In fact, a very good morning for you in WA. Oops. Oops. Mr Fitchett, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I think you might be on mute, Mr Fitchett, just one moment. We'll just try that one more time. Yeah. Just make sure we've got Mr. Fitchett up. The voice is still on mute. No, we still can't hear you, Mr. Fitchett. One moment. Can you hear us, Mr. Fitchett? Just, uh, we'll just hold on. We'll work that this end first before we continue. Um, Mr Fitchett has affirmed, just while that's going on, uh, what I would do, Commissioners, and seek to have uh, RCN 900-016-0003 readied, operator, which is the map of the Shire of Dundas. Mr Fidget, we'll try that one more time. Can you hear me and can I hear you? Uh, Mr Fidget, I can hear you very faintly. I don't know if the sound is not being put through to the hearing room as opposed to... Um, because if I can hear you, it means something's coming through. was off mute, you can see it. <laughs> Misha, let me just see if I can get an update. <clears throat> Yeah. 
Mr Fitch, it would be assisted if you could speak and we'll see if they, by doing that um, they can test your volume. Perhaps you could start telling us about the Shire of Dundas and then uh, if we don't hear you, we'll ask you to repeat it. I've got quite a large area. Of yes. <laughs> awesome. Magic. Thank you. No worries. It's a long way to WA from camp. <laughs> yes, it is. Mr. Fitchard, um, so, Mr. Fitchard, because you were, uh, the sound wasn't coming through to our end, we didn't hear you affirm or, uh, um, so what we might do is have that, uh, we might proceed that and do that again, just for the benefit of the transcript. Thanks, Council. Mr. Fitchett, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, Council. Thank you. Mr. Fitchett, thank you for joining us. Um, I've just had shown to the commissioners and have shown to you a map of the Shire of Dundas. Uh, uh, and the Shire of Dundas is in the Goldfields Esperance region of Western Australia and I understand covers an area of 93,179 square kilometres. Could you describe to the commissioners the Shire of Dundas, its land size, its people and its main cities and features? Yeah, we've got quite a unique demographic. Uh, we are um, fortunate enough to have on the Eucla side the Murning people uh, on country, and then we're on the, the woodland side towards our Norseman Down side, we've got the Naju people. Um, the air highway that links Norseman with Eucla uh, takes, takes us about seven and a half hours drive to get to Eucla from our office here. Um, you cross over quite a vast, um, beautiful country with uh, woodlands where it changed to the uh, um, plainless trees. Um, there's all sorts of rock formations, granite, salt lakes, and we've got 480 coast, a kilometre coastline with hardly anybody living on it. Um, I think there's three people living on that coastline, uh, <laughs> apart from the Eucla community that consists out of 40 people. But from one, from our boundary to Eucla is uh, uh, almost 10 and a half to 11 hours drive non-stop just to cross. We're closer to Perth than what we are to the other side of our Shire. And how many people approximately live in the Shire, in that vast expanse of land all up? In, in Eucla, we've got 40 uh, permanent residents and along the air highway with um, all the, the fuel stations, the motels um, and also the pastoral leases, sort of adds up to roughly about 150 to 200, depending on what season it is and what's happening on those properties. And then in the town of Norseman, we sort of 550, um, and we've got a small number of mining activity that change our population up and down, uh, depending on activities happening. So the air highway that runs through the Shire of Dundas is the mainland route connecting Western Australia to the eastern states. Could you describe to the commissioners the types and volume of traffic in normal conditions along that highway? Yeah, so average between 600 and 800 vehicles per day. Uh, the traffic consists mainly of uh, essential suppliers, so trucks, uh, truck movements, um, grey nomads, frequents, uh, travellers, uh, your um, backpackers, we've got people cycling, walking across it, um, there's camels, it's quite a, it's a phenomenal place um, and it's a beautiful place. So it's, we've, it's, it's, a, it's a place of interest and it's a crossroads and it's an entry into WA and it definitely is a statement to WA. In your uh, submission and response to the Royal Commission, you described the impact of the 2019-2020 bushfires on the Shire. I want to take the commissioners through parts of the impact assessment that was prepared for the Shire and have you comment on parts of it. If we could have DUN 500-001-0029, which is Volume 3, Tab 12B, commissioners. Uh, this is the impact statement of the Norseman West Complex Shire of Dundas and the fires between 16 December 2019 and 20 January 2020. 
Um, it's a summary of known and emerging impacts resulting from all Level 3 incidents and Level 2 incidents where well, there's impact um, and recovery ongoing. Now, um, if we could start at page uh, 33 of that document. which uh, is page five of yours, Mr. Mr. Fitchett. So just at the description of the incident, we see at the top, the Norseman bushfire complex comprised one of nine fires, um, and all of these fires being started by lightning strikes during the period mid-December to beginning of January. Um, a number of those, if we go down to uh, the dot points, four of those fires were within your shire, uh, so areas and had areas burnt. Could you just describe to the commissioners the, this, um, the severity of the incident? It's identified as a level three incident and then being downgraded to level one and just give some sense to them of how those fires um, impacted the shire and their general area. Yeah, so it sort of started in December, so uh, 16th of December, um, with spot fires, lightning moving through, and then escalated quite rapidly. Um, and through the whole period, we had over 300 volunteers. Um, DFIS, Department of Fire and Emergency Services, um, and over staff um, uh, allocations. To, to fight this fire, so for it's quite it was quite significant. It was quite frightening for our residents that um, and travellers that came through. The town was surrounded. We were covered in smoke. Um, so just to paint the picture, it's, it's it's quite daunting when you log on to the fire emergency map in the morning, and every time you look, it's increased in size, and there's more popping up as as that lightning season. Every year, this is a yearly occurrence. Unfortunately, this time it was close to town and close to a highway. Normally, it's in remote areas and you drive along the highway and just see it in the distance. Um, so uh, the previous year, we were closed for four days, but um, that didn't sort of make any impact. It was just a highway. It wasn't close to town. But, yeah, so... I've. Uh, and to describe Mr. This Mr. Fitch, what we might yep. do is uh, to assist you, if we go down um, on that page to the next two paragraphs, the fires were contained, where they were, uh, and then the fires threatened or directly impacted a number of roads, uh, including the yep. air highway, and that's just what you were just speaking to. What are those other highways? Are they major or arterial roads as well? Yes, so the the Esperance, the Kulgadi Esperance Highway, that uh, comes all the way up from Esperance and go up to Kalgoorlie, Kulgadi and then Kalgoorlie and then head over east towards Perth. Um, so that's a major. So most trucks that comes into Norseman either turn left or right, depending on their route. I would say most probably 80% of them turns right towards Kalgoorlie and then on to Perth. Um, so it's a significant arterial route um, and to have that closed and the impact um, was immediate. Um, we, you know, it's the trucks backed up on the border all in town. Um, there's quite some good footage around with the trucks moving out of town um, where, when we had the gaps to let them through. So... Um, from Baladonia to Palmango Road, those, that's a dirt track. Um, so that road is four by four only, um, used in emergencies. A lot of people got stuck out there. The Zangfius fires, um, people tried to go around through the bush. The fire emergency services spend a significant time, amount of time and cost to recovering people trying to go through bush tracks to get to Kalgoorlie. Mm. Um, so I think from that point of view, those tracks, and for us to get out, we couldn't even get out there, the communication to those properties, um, which already were under stress because of drought. So they didn't, their staff were carting water, they were destocking. It was a perfect circumstance. And we were very lucky that decisions made saved lives. The Teledonia Roadhouse, uh, the fire actually ran over the top of it. Um, no lives, but uh, property, minimal property damage. We were lucky there was a fire unit on the ground. Uh, there, there were police and managed to evacuate that that um, location quite safely. 
So you speak there, uh, you've just described to us the significant disruption to local, regional and interstate transport. You note there that were protracted road closures. How long were the roads closed, or the most, imp and importantly, the air highway, to your re recollection? Well, 12 days um, was was the physical road closure, but there were days that um, parcel traffic could... So there, on that 12 days, no, there was no movement at all, but there were days that we managed to watch weather conditions, wind direction, that they did manage to move people through, although they were still stranded and had the opportunity and had escorted um, assistance to get out of town and get moving again. Um, so with limited access, 12 days of no movement and the rest, I would say, the, from the 16th to the 20th um, was limited um, movement with assistance. So if we could just go through the report, um, page 34 is a checklist of impact areas. Uh, I'll just identify that but move on from there to the next page where you summarise the known, emerging and anticipated impacts. Um, you note there that a significant number of travellers and heavy road transport vehicles were stranded um, and you've mentioned the small businesses and, and you say here the mining operations and um, uh, pastoralists were impacted. I want to ask you some questions about the impact on the natural environment. Um, you speak about uh, the point there of damage to internationally significant area of great biological richness. What are you referring to there? So our area consists out of quite a significant woodlands, which consists out of a variety um, of eucalypt, um, salt lakes, granite outcrops. Uh, there's a merit tree that our Naju people, um, to survive out here, there's no surface water. Surface water. Naju's turned these trees into what they call a water tree by put placing a tree, a rock at the bottom of the tree while it's young. That creates a hollow. Those diversities, that, uh, those trees were impacted. A lot of those, I would say about 80% of those trees were lost in this fire. Um, old growth takes years to recover, if not thousands of years to recover. And the concern is that um, it's on unmanaged ground land and there's no impact assessment done on that to date. Um, and there's no indication if it's gonna happen. I take you to the emerging risks and the overview on page 37. Uh, and if we can just have that box shown and broadcast, I want to ask you some questions about this. Um, the first dot point you have there is the danger of contamination um, of asbestos and other contaminants of the old mine sites. Where was that area um, impacted in the Shire? So just, um, if I may, Commissioner, there's uh, sorry, Council, there's, um, in our woodlands is littered with mine sites, old mine sites from the 1800s, uh, um, so late 1800s. So that impact at the technologies and then going into uh, the 30s and 40s and 50s, those mine sites and the use of wood, uh, treated wood, uh, chemicals to process on site, process gold, there's carcinogenics involved. Um, a lot of those areas aren't properly managed, uh, it's still exposed. Uh, some of those contaminants are still on the surface. Uh, it's, not, um, it's not contained. Uh, so unmanaged ground land with mining tenements, uh, significant bushland over the top of it with its bio, uh, biodiversity um, just created a perfect recipe, recipe for disaster. When the smoke came over town, um, the concern is that, that some of those uh, contaminants could have been picked up and, and blown across town into water tanks, um, breathing it in. So, and we're not sure. We, we, we speculate because we can see the uh, treated wood lying on the surface. We can see the sites where gold was um, processed uh, on, on location. So... Um, and we needed some expert advice on this and somebody to come and tell us that we are either wrong or right um, on our assessment of these areas. So from from our point, that it, this whole area needs a thorough um, assessment from the Department of Mines, Environment, Bios, 
fire security, um, so if Mr. that makes any sense, yeah. Council. Thank you, Mr. Fitchett. So what, what is the Shire doing in terms of leading and funding recovery projects? You've identified a range of impacts uh, both on the businesses and on the people uh, and the local environment. Uh, what kind of role yep. does the Shire have and how is it funding those projects? Yeah, um, to give you a picture of our Shire, um, over the last 25 years, we've lost three quarters of our community because of mine closures. So we used to have three and a half thousand people in our community and it was quite a vibrant place and because of mine closures, uh, the impact on FIFO, uh, the, the benefits uh, to move to the city and then a lot of these miners still work in our area but now lives in Joondalup, Mandurah or Bustleton. Um, so for us to be able to assist uh, in, uh, to our full extent, because of the lack of revenue that's coming in, uh, it's like any business. We look at our council as a business, and to assist, you have to have uh, income. And if you lost two thirds of your income, um, it puts severe pressure on on our our, our community uh, expectations. Um, we've got over a hundred and forty um, 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 crown land blocks in our township that's state owned those they're not paying rates uh, that putting more pressure on us to maintain the service levels that we have to so from a practical point of view we are impacted and we need it, uh, state government to come and visit for a full assessment on where we at and how we can assist now council we've we've um, we are on a road of recovery financially with state assistance or not. Um, this year we managed to knock almost a million dollars off our deficit. Uh, so with, with uh, financial management uh, under the audit, Auditor General's um, eye, we have corrected and doing a thorough job of getting our community back on track. And Council has put a whole range of initiatives in place to um, assist our community and through COVID and through drought, um, we've started um, quite a number of initiatives. And we had some assistance from some of the mines in this aspect, but nowhere near where the impact, as anybody that runs a business know, if you lost two thirds of your customers, that the infrastructure is still on the ground and still needs to be maintained. And I think that assessment needs to be addressed and we need somebody to come and have a proper look at how we do our business. So, Mr. Fitchett, the last dot point in the overview um, says that uh, you may have difficulty uh, accessing federal funding uh, because of eligibility, because um, the state would need to spend, as I understand it, some $240,000 before Commonwealth funding could be accessed. Um, what success have you had in applying for Commonwealth funding? Um, and uh, and I, as I understand it, in addition to the, <clears throat> the revenue issues that you've identified, um, you also, the Shire is also um, under an obligation under the local legislation to manage and undertake risk mitigation measures on that unallocated Crown land to manage those fire risks out there. Um, what's the status of your position with um, obtaining any external funding assistance? So either from mining, we had no assistance from federal or state government. Uh, we have uh, uh, quite a um, uh, good corporate player in IGO. Um, the Nova Group has a has a mine in our in our in our Shire boundary. They've assisted uh, with a donation to Shire bushfire related donation. Um, as far as state government goes, as far as, far as federal government go, we had zero assistance. We don't make the criteria. The criteria is we had to have $240,000 of uninsurable assets damaged directly by cause of the fire. Um, we only got to $105,000. Now, keeping in mind $240,000 is 10% of my revenue that I raise in every year. Um, so... And that for us, it's significant. So that one size fits all approach that the state and federal government has with these type of things. Do not consider 
uh, already impacted uh, community through legislation. The, the Bushfire Act is outdated, it's over 42 years old. Uh, it makes local government responsible for fighting as a first responder to fire. And over the last 24 years, we can track back that we spend the average between $150,000 and $250,000 a year. And that has basically impacted us. So almost between 10 to 15% of our revenue had to go to manage land that we don't get any revenue from. Um, so that impact, nobody seemed to want to listen to that. I've tried raising this now since 2018. I've taken this to the um, executive committee through our WAGA conference um, in 2019 with my elected members. We presented our case. Um, the, the traction is very slow. Um, the one-size-fits-all approach has certainly left its scars in our community. Mr. Fitch, but we're, yep. Thanks, I'm, I'm sorry I cut you off there. I didn't, didn't yeah, mean to. No, no, all good. I was actually going to invite the commissioners to see if they had some questions of you. They may take you further on this point. So, Mr. Fitcher, thank you for that, and thank you for taking us through the, the, the process. Can you just comment from a consistency point of view? Was there there were a number of fires in WA over the um, over the the period 2019 2020? Did DFRA kick in for any of those LGAs or if they didn't, have you had a chance to talk to those LGAs and see if there's a commonality in the, the situation that you face? As, uh, if I may, Commissioner, there's um, un under the DFRA's uh, criteria to um, be eligible, we had to have a combined or an individual um, damage pool exceeding $240,000. We couldn't reach that, unfortunately. Um, we were the biggest uh, impact of $105,000. Uh, um, I believe Esperance Shire came to, um, about, I'm not 100% sure, about $25,000 um, in road furniture uh, and related damage. But for us, um, uh, we couldn't make a combined regional um, uh, target of two hundred and forty thousand dollars to get over the the line to to be eligible. Okay, and and from a uh, coordination point of view, has, has, is there any flexibility that you can see around those uh, those figures, or is it a hard and fast interpretation uh, of the DFRA? We've um, we've tried all angles. We've we've written. Um, we've uh, we've approached uh, the best that we could get um, is uh, assistance for a position to do a mitigation strategy uh, on unmanaged ground land. So there's no real benefit to our community. Um, this position would work in our community over the uh, next two years to see how the state government can better manage their own land and remove that responsibility from local government that does not have the ability to raise revenue off that, those, uh, those areas. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Commissioner Bennett? Um, thank you. I just have one question. I was just thinking about whether or not your Indigenous communities um, had any opportunity to uh, derive assistance or, or how they were impacted in particular. I mean, I guess the first question is, did they suffer a particular impact um, including health impact, um, and secondly, whether there was any, whether you looked into whether or not through that venue there was an ability to obtain some assistance. Yes, yeah, so we're very fortunate. Our Naju community is quite quite strong. They also our volunteer bushfire group that assisted um, DFS in their firefighting. Uh, so as an overall. Um, uh, exercise with our Naju people, there wasn't any additional uh, assistance that we could that we could gain through that channel. Um, we're still waiting for um, feedback on, on how that's going to be managed into the future because they have got um, a title over some of that land. Um, we would like 
to see that uh, our Najib people get more involved to do uh, their own uh, pre-burns in colder times, so this time of the year, to mitigate that process. So we are lobbying and part of our strategy with the mitigation officer that we based in our region for two years um, to work with our Naju group and see if we can bring that seasonable burn along all the infrastructure around communities and see if there's an opportunity through funding. But as we sit at the moment, um, there's no indication of assistance. Um, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Um, quick question. I, I know that when we've heard that the Commonwealth has, has um, announced a number of packages to assist with environmental recovery. And in your submission, you point out quite rightly that the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Great Western Woodlands is, in your words, an internationally significant area of great biological ri richness. I, I wondered whether you had had any success in gaining Commonwealth funding to assist with the management of those parts of the woodlands that were damaged by these fires? Um, unfortunately, my, my capability and staff, we run this whole 95,000 square kilometres with 26 staff members, that's internal and external. Um, we don't have a HR department, uh, so I don't have an executive assistant, so all this is typed by myself, so you'll see heaps of grammar, uh, English is not a first language. So the assistance to, to get that application through um, and, and the links to it, the, the, that whole process, there's no, there was no assistance, and we lobbied quite extensively uh, through political um, while go to try and get assistance on the ground for us to be able to do those applications. We have attempted some of them. We have written to the Minister about assistance regarding the $240,000 as a start. Um, that all failed. Thanks very much. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, Mr Fitchett, one other question from me, and, it, and it, it's around the road closures. Uh, the, the road closures, was that the, the state uh, imposing the road closures? Did they do it at the border or was it uh, just a function of the fire so it was down to local commanders to close the roads? And if that's the case, how did they stop people continuing to drive in and just increase the, the problem? Um, Commissioner, my, my understanding of working daily with DFIS, uh, the fire was sort of, the road was closed at Belladonia and at that point, um, that's from traffic coming from uh, Adelaide side, South Australia side, it was closed at Belladonia. So um, that was a hard closure. And what happened from in Belladonia, you can, there's quite a number of tracks heading north and south, uh, gravel roads, um, four by four tracks, um, old cattle tracks, mining tracks, and people uh, attempted using those to get around the fire and got into strife. <coughs> so from a, uh, and it was managed by state government. The the air highway is a state government maintained federal highway. Um, we have got no jurisdiction over uh, Coolgardie Esperance or the air highway. Okay, thank you, thank Thanks. you for that. I appreciate it, Sergeant Doran. Thanks. And I understand, Mr Fitchett, that border is closed but for different reasons now. 100%. So now at the moment we're dealing with COVID. Um, and, and during the bushfires, if I may counsel, uh, just to get a picture, we, we had drought, we had pastoral leaseholds trying to cart water through road closures. Some of them had to destock. And the fire behaviour was severely um, affected by the drought. Uh, there was fires that ran 26 kilometres during a night, which is normally at night fires sort of slow down. Um, so all those different aspects to this melting pot of disaster was all um, quite interesting to be part of, but the frustration is to, to draw people out of the woodwork to come and do assessment. I think that is our, our issue at the moment. Thanks, thanks, Council. Thank you so much, Mr Fitchett. I think that's all I had for Mr Fitchett. Um, and 
If there's nothing further from the commissioners. No, Mr Fitchett, I've had the privilege of visiting your area a couple of years ago and you're right, it is very unique, it is very beautiful and it is a long drive from Norseman to the border. So I appreciate uh, everything that you've uh, you've done throughout the, the, the season and your very small team and thank you for taking the time this morning to be able to tell that story to us. We appreciate it. And you may be excused. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Commissioner. Thanks, Council. Um, if you excused him, but may he be released from his summons? He may be released as well. Okay. We don't need him to return. Uh, uh, Ms Dovey, we'll take the next uh, panel. Thank you. <coughs> Just before we call the next panel, which will be a panel involving... Taowong Shire and Indigo Shire Council. Um, I just, uh, we hear a lot that best practice in disaster recovery is community led. And in the materials that were tendered yesterday, there's just one example I'd like to draw the commissioner's attention to. Um, last week, uh, we had the opportunity to speak with the Eurobadala Shire Council Youth Services team. And we spoke with them about their Eurobadala Youth in Recovery Forum. And they've put in a very helpful response to a notice, which can be found at exhibits 10.441 and 10.442, which were tendered yesterday. And I'm not proposing to go to that. I just wanted to draw the Commissioner's attention to that useful example of best practice in the context of recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, so now can we please call Ms Pagan, Mr Irino and Mr Florence? Thank you very much. Now, Ms. Pagan is the Acting Director of Relief and Recovery of Taowong Shire Council, who we also heard from yesterday. Ms. Pagan, would you like to take an oath or an affirmation? Affirmation, please. Ms. Pagan, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Now, Mr. Irino is the Chief Executive Officer of Indigo Shire Council. Mr. Irino, I understand you will take the oath, is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Irino, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And Mr. Mark Florence, is the Director, Community and Economic Development of Indigo Shire Council. And I understand, Mr. Florence, that you will take an affirmation. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Florence, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Okay, now this morning, I'm going to ask questions on four topics. The first is an introduction to yourselves and your local government area. The second is an overview of recovery coordination in your area. The third is financial assistance, and in particular with a focus on recovery support for indirect damage. And the fourth is recovery support issues that you've identified. Moving to the first of those topics, and perhaps I can start with you, Ms Pagan, would you please describe your role with the Council and in particular your role in relation to natural disaster recovery? Yes, thanks. Thank you, Council. Uh, yes, I'm uh, the Director of Community and Planning, uh, so I have a, a formal responsibility uh, in terms of emergency management arrangements across the Shire and also I'm the Municipal Recovery Manager as a nominated role. Thank you, Ms Pagan. Mr Irino and Mr Florence, would you please also describe your roles at the Council and in relation in particular to disaster recovery? So Trevor Irino, I'm the Chief Executive Officer with Indigo Shire Council, so I oversee uh, the whole of strategic and operational uh, aspects of the Council. Uh, in, in the case of emergency, emergency management plans kick in and we have various staff that are assigned to various roles and uh, separate plans kick in uh, and separate responsibilities kick in at that time and which other people take responsibility for certain aspects of emergency response as well as recovery. Thank you. Now, uh, Mark Lawrence. Oh, uh, Go ahead, Mr. I'm Lawrence. the Director of Community and Economic Development. 
uh, within my department, uh, we have a couple of specific roles, one being the um, municipal recovery manager um, and some deputy recovery managers as well. And we take responsibility for the implementation of relief centres where required and also to manage recovery post-event. Thank you. Now I'd ask, um, first starting with Indigo, if you could describe your local government area in general terms, looking at its size, its natural environment, its population and its main industries. And while you do that, perhaps we could bring up a map of the Indigo area, which is Exhibit 10.28.1 tendered yesterday, which is RCN 900-016-0005. It's at volume three, tab four. And he, this is a map of your local area. Um, Mr. Irino and Mr. Florence, would you please give a, a, a brief description of your area? Thank you, so as you can see on the screen there, um, indigo shown there in orange. Just to the north, you'll see the words Aubrey, but just to the south of that Aubrey is a uh, local government area of Wodonga. So we basically wrap around Wodonga. Uh, to our east on that map is Tawong, and obviously the Tawong fires immediately to our east. And mainly to our south is south to southeast is, is the Alpine area. So we're, we're nestled in the northeast of, of Victoria with um, basically high country that surrounds us to the east and to the south. Uh, as we go further west, we flatten out a little bit. We have wine growing country and things like that. Indigo Shire is, is, is made up of... Um, Four, four main towns with four smaller towns. Uh, our, our towns are all linked by a common thread, mainly of uh, gold and heritage and tourism. So we made up of the towns of Beechworth, which is about 3,500 people, Rutherglen over in the west, which is about nearly 3,000 people, Yakandanda, uh, a couple of thousand people, two and a half, I think it is, and Chilton, uh, the four main towns. Uh, they're all very reliant on tourism. In fact, tourism uh, makes up about 51% of our economy, the impact of visitation and the flow-on effects throughout the economy. We've got a population of about 16,500 16, people spread across an area of uh, about 2,000 square kilometres. We're about an hour, an hour and a half drives from east to west. We touch the Murray River, a couple of places uh, to the east and the west. So over in the far west, we touched the Murray River at Morganya, and over in the east, we touched the Murray River near, near Lake Hume. So as I've said before, mainly tourism. We've got some agriculture, wine industry, some dairy, some farming. Um, uh, but our heritage and our gold tree is what really binds us together. Thank you. Now, Ms Pagan, we heard from Tawong yesterday, so I, I won't get you to repeat the description of it. Um, for the reference, uh, for, for the record, the reference was at page 1007 of yesterday's transcript. But just by very brief overview, would it be correct to say, and sorry, while I do this, can you please bring up exhibit 10.24.1, which is the local government area map that we saw yesterday. The the RCN number is RCN 900-016-0013. And we were told yesterday that the population is about... Oh, sorry, and here's, here's the map. I understand that Tawong is the orange area on that map, is that correct? That's correct. That's right. And the other two areas were places we were speaking to yesterday. That's Snowy Valleys and Snowy Monero, is that right? So they're over the border in New South Wales. And so there's yes, a significant border area that Tawong shares with New South Wales. Yes, that's correct. And then, as we heard just a moment ago, over on the western side, you also have a border with Indigo. Yes, that's also correct. <laughs> yes, that's right. And um, what we heard yesterday was you're a smaller council of about maybe 6,500 people, but with um, an sorry, about 6,000 people, an area of, of just over 6,500 square kilometres, uh, of which about 75% is public land. Is that, that all right? Yes, that's true. Um, yes, that's correct. With an ageing population with a median age of about 58. Yes, that's correct. Um, and also an economy that's centred around agriculture, forestry and tourism. Yeah. 
Yes, that's also correct. In the recovery context, are there any key features of the Shire that you'd like to add to that description? Um, it, it might be worth just explaining just the, the proportion that um, actually was affected. So 308,000 hectares of the Shire were affected. So we're just talking about just under 50% uh, was, was directly in the bushfire um, zone. Thank you, Ms Pagan. We also heard yesterday from Ms Phelps from Taowong the, the, the area that was affected and the effects on the local com council of Taowong. And in particular, Ms Phelps, I noted, described it as a very, very significant impact on a very, very small council. Um, so it was, it, there were rough times. Moving to Indigo, would you be able to describe what happened during the bushfires from Indigo's perspective and the effect on your council area? Uh, yeah, um, thank you. Basically, uh, New Year's Eve, or oh, thereabouts, fires started in that Kaowong area. Uh, the immediate impact on ourselves was to um, provide uh, Taiwan with assistance. Uh, in terms of relief centres um, and things like that. So we had staff working up at Taowong at that time. Uh, the immediate aftermath of that was um, we weren't at that stage directly affected by fires. However, we had the smoke immediately come over to our area. We also were affected by uh, the, the, the um, warnings of evacuation. So basically uh, the state... Uh, uh, provide instructions for all the tourists and visitors to leave the area. So with um, Indigo, we've made up of the smaller towns which are solely reliant on tourism at that busy time of year, the Christmas, New Year, holiday season, we we're full of tourists, uh, immediately asked to evacuate and leave the area. So the immediate aftermath was basically a desertion <coughs> of, of our town, of our towns. Uh, so all, all tourists leaving and then basically... Um, shut down our economy at the time. Uh, then afterwards, that that period lingered on then for some uh, four to six weeks. Uh, heavy heavy uh, smoke impact. We had uh, um, periods of high, uh, high uh, sorry, poor air quality or hazardous air quality for some long periods of time. Uh, visitors were, were not uh, encouraged to return to the area for the whole period of January. Uh, it severely impacted our economy. We had Something like at that time of year, we would expect something like 160,000 visitors, uh, at, which would have fallen back then to some uh, 40 or so thousand visitors. So, you know, 70 to 80 percent reduction in visitation, with similar flow on effects then to, to spending in that area. So, we normally would expect spending at that time of year uh, around, I'll say, $46 million for that quarter, which then plummeted down to, say, $14 million in visitor expenditure for, that, for the quarter what our estimates are. Um, but, you know, by the time there was any sense of the air clearing and, um, you know, it was safe to return to the region in terms of visitation, then uh, that season was lost. People, the kids were back to school. Uh, and so basically, uh, a lot of our traders who, who rely on that season for a large proportion of the income lost their income during that period. Um, we would next then rely on um, our autumn period has been very popular, beautiful time of the year in the northeast Victoria, uh, and then COVID hit. So we sort of had this period of devastation in our economy, which really blended from one into the other. So our, our towns didn't experience any recovery then during the autumn period as well. So um, that's, that's the direct impact on us was on the economy and on our traders. And as I mentioned before, about 51% of our economy directly affected by tourism. Oh, uh, reliant on tourism. Uh, we also mentioned um, our wine growing districts, so particularly uh, around Beechworth and then around the Rutherglen district. Uh, key wine growing dis districts, red red wine, fortified wines from the Rutherglen district, severely impacted in terms of smoke, taint, and things like that. So I don't have the numbers handy for that. But we can certainly get numbers available on on losses to to agriculture in terms of smoke impact on grapes themselves. Um, I just pause there. I might just throw it to Mark if I can, just to top up, fill any gaps I may have missed. And that, that's okay, Council. Yeah. Uh, thank you. The only thing that I would add is uh, the impact um, on the community itself. 
was reasonably significant, not only through the loss of services at that time of year um, with you know, uh, visitation, as Trevor has mentioned, but also access to you know, swimming pools and general recreation activity um, that contributes to community life. Um, another important fact was that our staff um, were providing support services to Tawong and Alpine Shire and uh, in a blunt sense, we we're only one uh, match away from um, Indigo being directly impacted by fire, which then uh, would have created some issues about our personnel having to come back to Port Indigo, which is their obligation, which then would create challenges for Tawong and Alpine, but also would have created some um, heavy demand on already fatigued people providing support there. Thank you. I'd now like to turn to an overview of recovery coordination in your respective areas. Um, perhaps we'll start with Indigo, so Mr Arino and Mr Florence. Would you be able to give an overview of the local disaster recovery plans that were in place or were developed following the fires? Um, how those plans interact with regional and state plans and who is responsible for implementing and delivering them? Uh, um, I'll take uh, that one as much as I can. Um, we would link fairly closely with the Department of Human Health, Human and Health Services uh, recovery team um, to ensure that any actions uh, complied or were aligned to the state recovery plans. Um, in practical terms, we were focused at that point on um, the relief support that we could provide to uh, Taowong in particular. Um, and since the event, our recovery efforts have been more focused on advocating to government for business support and uh, receiving or applying for and receiving grants from the federal government and state government to provide uh, support programs um, through whether it's through community events or direct business development and resilience uh, opportunities. So that's been the focus of our recovery. Um, but the, during the event, our main focus was on the uh, relief centre support that we were providing to, um, to Tower. Do you have a formal emergency management plan that covers recovery operations? Yes, we do. We have uh, a formal municipal emergency management planning committee that oversees the uh, development and adoption of the municipal emergency management plan and within that uh, I think it's part six of that plan um, is the municipal recovery plan which uh, we were guided by through this process but given that we weren't directly impacted and our recovery efforts were more aligned to business support and advocacy for that support wouldn't be as in-depth a response as for the likes of uh, Taowong. Certainly. Um, you've noted in your notice response um, that in terms of relief and recovery, there's no additional facility for staff who have full-time roles to take on, essentially the same staff who already have a full-time role have to take on those relief and recovery roles. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, uh, this is a, a really uh, important issue for the Commission to consider that for small rural shires, uh, the staff that have responsibilities under emergency management um, are generally or always um, have substantive full-time roles or um, full-time positions and that the emergency management responsibilities uh, are quite difficult to uh, be trained for, but also to um, provide time to, to manage um, appropriately. Um, essentially, as we've said in our submission, small rural shires do the best they can with what they've got, but in some cases it's not much, and uh, it's really, I think, beholden on the... Uh, governments of the day to provide greater coordination from a regional perspective which would allow small rural shires to provide the local knowledge and local support they they could um, provide 
in a in a relief and recovery situation. I think it's quite um, uh, a challenge for small rural shires and a, a very unfair expectation of government and communities to expect shires the size of ours and Tawong and Alpine and others, where I might say that most of these natural disasters take place, uh, particularly bushfires, um, to expect small rural shires to take the full load of uh, relief and recovery responsibilities is, um, to be blunt, is quite unfair. Thank you. Uh, Ms Pagan, moving to you and looking at your, um, the, the Tawong recovery sort of field, um, I understand that Tawong also has an emergency management plan um, and that it was in 2009 the subject to an audit which included some indications from within council about how people felt about the potential of that plan to assist in a disaster. Would you talk about the plan for a bit and maybe also discuss the findings of that audit? Uh, I probably can't share the findings of the audit because it's well before my time oh, in council. Um, but I certainly can uh, probably reflect on, uh, I suppose, the, the setup that we have, which is very similar to Indigo's, which is an emergency management plan and a committee that uh, obviously oversees those arrangements. Um, and I suppose the, the learning out of the December fires have really been that it doesn't matter how much paperwork you have, I think in a particular catastrophic condition as the one that we had, uh, in many ways those roles, some of those roles hold true, but many don't. And particularly in our situation where we had 19 days where power wasn't fully restored, 24 days where telecommunications were fully restored, and we had hundreds <laughs> the relief centre that was meant to provide tea and coffee, not actually house people as a, you know, effectively a hostel. Uh, it's, a, it's a really different arrangement uh, when you have those kind of conditions. Yes, thank you. Uh, is it true that Tawong is now in the process of finalising its community municipal recovery plan? Yes, that's correct. Yes, we've had a lot of involvement from the community and hope to continue to have more. Uh, but it's been a, a very complicated process, as well as, I think, one where we've learnt that um, in many ways our recovery is not only just about recovering from the events, but also about making sure our recovery looks at prevention so this never happens again. And what's the process for forming that plan? Who are, who are the people who have input into what it looks like? Yeah, so... We really tried to canvas it as wide as we can, uh, and uh, there's probably some more groups that should be part of that. But in effect, we uh, tried to learn from previous bushfires, so we engaged um, uh, new consultants that had quite a lot of experience in what traditionally was put in place around recovery, and we started with that as a base. Uh, we elected an interim community recovery committee to help advise us on what, what the input would be, but also advise us on what ultimately our community recovery structure should look like. Uh, and then on top of that, we've tried to engage a whole range of residents in what we call our working groups who have got very particular interests, so environment, um, social recovery, uh, to actually help construct what the best outcome under each one of those thematic areas are. Thank you. We heard mention earlier of the fact that there was resource sharing between you and that uh, Indigo sent support, so it sent people to assist during the recovery process. Um, perhaps, uh, Ms Pagan, you could start. Would you like talking that a bit for, and then I'll, I'll turn to um, <coughs> Indigo to get their side of that story. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Council. In short, we really couldn't have done without it. Uh, Indigo provided uh, a, a very capable, fantastic um, director to help us out in the first week. So both he and I were uh, on staff in the Relief Centre for the first week, on and off. And uh, had we not had that, um, that that resource, it just wouldn't have been possible for us to deliver the centre. So it really enforces the points that Mark and Trevor have made about needing to support each other in the region, but also the challenge of uh, perhaps an unfair reliance on a small shire to be able to um, provide the kind of relief for the kind of period of time that we had to do it. Certainly. Mr. Irino or Mr. Florence, would one of you like to describe your your side of that? 
Uh, thank you. Look, the first, uh, I guess the biggest impact was the first, uh, I think, couple of weeks of relief, um, relief centre assistance for Taowong. So we had uh, a number of staff who volunteered um, to put time up at Flanger in particular around the clock. So we had, uh, I'd say, about six to 12 different staff, perhaps at different times, volunteering different, different shifts throughout the day up there. Uh, we also had one of my executive team, for example, volunteered to, to go up to the Corion Relief Centre and um, and in that case, found himself trapped up there. He knew he would be uh, once that was encircled and they couldn't get out for something like uh, four or five days. I think uh, one of my senior staff was up there around the clock. So there was that, that impact um, initially. We also had um, um, municipal um, near a, uh, resource officers that were assisting both um, Howard but also at Alpine. So we were providing relief resources of a number of number of staff down at Alpine who were experiencing the Abbey Yard fires uh, later on in January. So we had a few staff then uh, helping as well. A as then the, the uh, situation grew, then there were more and more resources coming available from around the state. So our role started to decline sort of towards the middle end of January and others were able to step in. But for those initial one to two weeks, there just uh, you know, there was no resources anywhere and we were all scrambling to help out Tower as best we could. Might I again ask Mark to just add, add a bit to that? Uh, I can comment more um, on the Talangata situation. Um, and I think it's credit to Taowong with the resources that they have available to them, the work that they they did. But it was quite evident at different times that they were very um, thinly spread um, in terms of staff being available and um, people understanding what the responsibilities were. And I think that was a factor of um, a lot of staff were personally affected by by the uh, by the fires as well, which diminished the resources available. So whilst we were more than um, happy to provide as much support as, as we could, um, it, it had a, 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 a fair sense that um, because of the thinness of resources from a Taowong perspective there, um, it, there just seemed to be a, quite a lack of coordination in the responsibilities and the, and the actions that are required to maintain a, a relief centre at, at Talangata. Um, the rest of the local government industry was very supportive in providing personnel, um, but sometimes that can be a blessing and a, and a curse. You may have people on the ground, but that lack of local knowledge and uh, experience in a, in a relief centre can be missing, which can be a challenge. And I would also just make the comment that I made before that we were, we as an Indigo were always uh, in Taiwan with one and in Alpine with one eye over our shoulder looking back at Indigo, uh, hoping that nothing would emerge from there, which would um, require us to, to move back to the, uh, to the Indigo scene which, would have, as I said, would have created pressures for Taowong and Alpine to be able to manage. These sharing arrangements, were they run through a, a formal system that had been set up in advance or were they informal arrangements? Um, Council, uh, uh, Council is probably the... We'll Sorry. start with Ms Pagan, please. My, my apologies. Sorry, um... So it was a combination. Uh, we had um, the Municipal Association of Victoria and Local Government Victoria tend to get involved in those arrangements generally. Um, my guess is that given the extent of the fires across the state, their own resources were probably stretched. Uh, so we also um, relied on our existing arrangements with our local shires, but Darabin uh, Local Government Area also stepped in to help coordinate what would traditionally be the Municipal Association of Victoria's role in terms of assisting us to gain access to the other local government areas. Okay. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. I just want to quickly ask about communications. And Indigo, I'd like to turn to you. I, I, we're going to briefly move out of the recovery space because there is one matter that was raised in your response to the notice in relation to communications and neighbourhood safer places. Mr Irina or Mr Florence, would either of you like to speak to your concerns around that? Yeah, thanks. That's in two parts. Um, 
communication side, we, we do suffer a lot of significant black spot areas. Uh, and, and in particular, um, a number of our major high, major roads in and out have black spots for significant periods. So, for example, between Beechworth and Wangaratta, which is a, a main arterial, uh, Wangaratta in particular, if, if you're coming from Melbourne to Beechworth, you go through Wangaratta and turn off. Large parts of that road are not covered by um, by TELF mobile coverage, um, as well as links between uh, Beechworth and Wodonga. Our concerns were our concerns are that, as we understand it, the the prioritisation for black spot funding is is more about um, revenues uh, for the for the um, telcos themselves, and that emergency management doesn't feature high on the prioritisation for dealing with black spots. And we would ask that more consideration be given to um, emergency management in regards to then fixing black spot areas as a general comment. We're aware also that there are some, um, um, not just large towers, but there's, there are features out, facilities out there to put up temporary smaller, what I call repeater, I think repeater stations that may be considered as being uh, short term fixes for, for that sort of communication, particularly in, in a fire. Uh, and as you can imagine with, um, um, the fear that that raises, you know, we we weren't you know, certainly weren't threatened by Tawong fires. We were by the Abbey Yard fires. They were south of Beechworth, for example, uh, and people were constant on constant alert about about those fires. And communication is very important. And the the lack of that sort of coverage of the whole area we felt was a problem. Um, and if you know if people found themselves evacuating and found themselves uh, in difficulty en route leaving the area, then they had no way of communicating that. Uh, you know, like I say, major arterial between Beechworth and Wangaratta. The tree had come down and blocked their escape and they would have been in trouble because there were no phones uh, along there. Um, the other issue is the neighbourhood safer places and this is a really strong one for us that uh, there's a terminology, I suspect it's Victorian terminology, which describes neighbourhood safer places uh, hyphen places of last resort. And there's a real misnomer uh, around the community. I'll say particularly around Beechworth because we're sort of surrounded, but surrounded by forest. Uh, we're up on a plateau, and there's uh, limited uh, access in and out, limited safe access in and out. Uh, there's this misnomer that there exists in in, in, in Beechworth safer places. So people uh, would con constantly contact CFA and council and say, "Well, when do I go to this safer place?" Uh, you know, will there be people there to help me, protect me? Who will come and get me when the fires come? And the, the messages were really difficult to get out there to say, the safest thing you can do is evacuate uh, and, and get out of here before any fires come. The difficulty comes when um, I have such a long fire season, people sort of get weary then, they can't evacuate, some people don't have anywhere to go. Uh, they don't, you know, they may need to go for a day or two then come back because nothing happened. So people will tend after a while to stay put and then feel that I'll just, I'll just evacuate to the safer place. Now, these places don't really exist in terms of being safe from a fire. They're just somewhere to go as a last resort if all else has failed, your plan has failed, you haven't evacuated, you're left too late, you're in big trouble. Uh, this is, the, this is your very last resort. Now people, but the branding on them in Victorian side is that they're neighbourhood safer places. And so people think, oh, I'll go there if I'm in trouble. Uh, well, chances are you may well die there as you, as you will at home. Uh, and that message just isn't getting out there. Uh, people believe that there's a refuge there, that there's a shelter, that there'll be facilities there. And they just aren't. Some of these are in the middle of a football oval or places like that, where there'll be nobody there now to protect them, but they think that they do. And, and I would say perhaps, uh, I'm making this number up, but maybe 20% of our population perhaps in Beechworth particular thought they would go to a safer place and they'd be safe there and sit out of fire. Uh, so we need better communications and get that story out there that we don't have refuges, we don't have old fallen bomber shelters, we don't have places to go to survive a fire at all in safer places. Safest uh, force of action is to leave the area. So I'm probably rambling a bit now, I'll probably stop there. Thank you, Mr Irino. Ms Pagan, did you have anything to add? We we've heard in respect of the telecommunications issues yesterday in Taowong, but in relation to the safer places, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, probably much the same as Trevor. I think the challenge we had certainly during the evacuation, uh, actually on the night, on multiple nights, because we had two effectively fire um, periods of time, uh, people were often told by um, sometimes different emergency services 
that they should be going to some of these um, places. And in many cases, they were no longer places of last resort. So they were actually being sent to very dangerous places within um, certain towns. So I'd, I'd echo Trevor's comment. It really needs to be addressed. Okay, thank you. In the interest of making sure there's time for the commissioners to ask you some questions, I'm, I'm going to. I have two more questions that I want to take you to. The first is in relation to getting funding assistance in relation to support for indirect loss, um, and the second is in relation to cross-border issues. So, turning to the financial question first, perhaps I'll go to, to Indigo, Mr. Irino, or Mr. Florence. Um, and if you could keep your answer as brief as you can while covering the key points, can you describe? The, the issues that you had in respect of getting support and where you have ended up um, in relation to indirect financial support. Our biggest issue for us was um, the impact on the economy, uh, not so much in terms of you know, no fires directly, but the economy. So our, our biggest need was the short-term cash flow of businesses to keep them afloat. So in the initial phases, we were um, we were hoping for more money, but we got a, a grant of uh, $200,000 initially, and uh, but we were not eligible. Our businesses were not eligible for the $10,000 grant for business recovery. That was a real problem. Uh, the $200,000, which we were very grateful for, but our, the main uh, priority to spend that money on was re was to attract visitors back to the region. So we were making plans for events and. Um, uh, certain uh, marketing and things like that to attract people back to the region. So unfortunately, while we were doing that planning, COVID-19 hit and changed everything, so we couldn't attract visitors back to the region. So that money was really not used effectively in the immediate aftermath because we couldn't get used get to the businesses that most needed because of COVID-19. The other issue then was that immediate cash flow. They couldn't get their hands on that support. We were not categorised as being... Um, uh, bushfire affected and therefore we're not eligible for the $10,000 grants initially, although we lobbied hard with the help of uh, local members and uh, hard work from a lot of people uh, to keep lobbying. We were finally granted that um, uh, eligibility for our businesses to be eligible for $10,000 grant if they could show a loss of revenue. That didn't come through until just this month, so we're now six months later. So the biggest priority at the time was cash flow and getting it to business, getting them through. And so that, um, grateful for it now, um, it's helping them through this and COVID, but it's, it's, it was too late for some. They, they needed it six months ago and they didn't have it when they needed it the most. Yeah. Thank you. Ms Pagan, yours is a different story, as I understand it. Yeah, we, I would say um, much of what Trevor um, said applies to us, although we were eligible for a range of grants for our businesses. But I think our other concern was really around individuals and the subsequent um, events that occurred post bushfire. So I don't have the actual count, but there was at least two landslides post um, fire, as well as multiple um, floods. And those incidences weren't considered part of the event, uh, but they had quite significant consequences for people who are already heavily bushfire affected. And just and in many just cases. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, um, but those events, were those landslides things that would have occurred if there had not been fires? Possibly, but I think the extent to which they occurred, so the amount of effectively public land that was coming down in, into um, people's properties in the valleys would definitely um, was increased because of the sort of the, the fallout of the fire. And... In, did those people seek recovery support in respect of trying to deal with those landslides and what was the outcome for them? Yeah, it was one of the trickiest situations. So we had a number of people come into the recovery hub uh, seeking support and what we found was uh, it is something that falls between the remit of pretty much all the emergency services as a response. Uh, so the only real agency who's able to respond is the SES and they check for um, risk to life. Uh, and if there's no risk to life, they effectively leave the landslide on the property. And there's no subsequent um, money available to clean up. And certainly we knew of at least one who spent two and a half thousand dollars alone, just um, having the rubble removed uh, after he'd already been quite bushfire affected. Okay, thank you. Now, turning to the question of cross-border issues, um, yesterday from Taowong 
and neighbouring councils in New South Wales, we heard about cross-border issues during a disaster. But in the recovery context, Ms Pagan, I might start with you. Could you speak to the cross-border issues that you've seen in the recovery context? Yeah, so I think um, in the sort of relief stages, there was some quite significant issues between uh, around eligibility and uh, access to uh, recovery funds. And particularly, I think the vast contrast between New South Wales and Victoria, where Victoria had a payment um, called the personal hardship payment, which is worth $550. And the equivalent didn't exist on the New South Wales side. And perhaps even more challenging, we have a number of properties that span the New South Wales and Victorian border, and those residents have to have a postal address. And in many cases, they had a New South Wales address rendering them incapable, or they were simply told they were unable to apply for the Victorian grant. And, you know, my view was, I'm not really sure why there's a postcode lottery around bushfires in terms of grant funding. And ideally, there's uh, a package that's put together that irrespective of what state line you sit on, that's what you're eligible for. Yeah. Thank you. And what were the effects of that on the community, like the, the way in which the community is interacting with each other? Yeah, well, this is extremely frustrating. And I think um, it, caused, it really caused a lot of anger, uh, particularly towards, unfortunately, many cases, um, the Victorian <laughs> Um, departments where uh, people on New South Wales and Victorian border, but with the New South Wales postal address, um, not being able to access that. Um, and certainly for us, it was a, perhaps a frustrating experience because we also weren't able to assist uh, people who did have properties that span those two borders uh, in terms of things that they might be eligible on the New South Wales side. Thank you. And I, I, I think going on post-relief, uh, the cross-border issue is um, really important and it's something that I think we're really trying hard to tackle in terms of how we set up our ongoing committees and um, really thinking about the way in which uh, those communities interact as the overall Upper Murray and not just the New South Wales and Victorian side or the various local government areas. Uh, and, and I'd see that as something that... Um, is, is really true or really important to those communities that that's the way both local governments and state governments think about uh, recovery as an overall area. Thank you. Now, did you have issues with people from New South Wales trying to access Victorian recovery centres when that was their closest? Were they able to do that? Yeah, so on the in, in terms of relief, we effectively didn't discriminate. We, our view was um, if, if this was the way that you would normally come, uh, and in many cases we have people in New South Wales, Wales border that have to cross a bridge into Victoria to get out of their own property, uh, that we were there to support everyone who was bushfire affected. And we certainly had uh, centres in from the New South Wales side that were evacuating into the Victorian side. So we didn't discriminate at the, at the time. And um, I, I, you know, I'd probably say is ideally when you know, these arrangements get it set up that we actually expect that that's going to happen and there's a clear flow between the two. On the night, it would be impossible with no telecommunications. But <laughs> Yeah, certainly. And I understand that there was there was a leaflet that was sent around and you sent that to people on the New South Wales side of the border as well, in closing recovering information from New South Wales. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, I guess to um, just to improve the way in which that information flow worked, we recognised that people on that border had said that they weren't getting recovery information from their own council. Uh, who has a recovery centre much further away than we were. And when we did our mail drop, we decided to include their information and actually had a lot of residents on the New South Wales side thank us because it was the first time they'd seen their own councils on the New South Wales side um, newsletter. Thank you, Ms Pagan. Uh, now... Indigo, Mr Irino and Mr Florence, you have a border, a much smaller border with New South Wales. We are running low on time, but if you have a quick comment that you'd like to give in relation to cross-border, um, do you have anything to add on that front? Um, no, Council, in the interest of time, there's nothing significant on that front. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, commissioners, they were my questions. Did you have anything to add? No, I've got a couple of questions and I have to say we've been trying to think of how to break down national coordination issues and the like to something that 
is digestible. I think postcode lottery wins so far because it uh, it actually encompasses the, the the problems that we're we're seeing. Um, Ms. Pagan, a question for you. Yesterday we heard uh, about an is issue briefly of uh, Victorians who ended up evacuating to the New South Wales side and the, and some difficulties with the New South Wales. Uh, recovery folk trying to handle all their needs. I know that you had, I think it was people from Gingelic and all that area into Walwa, into the recovery centre. Are you able to provide any details on difficulties that New South Wales people had in the Victorian recovery centres, uh, a bit more than just the, the information flow and all that? Were there difficulties accessing uh, information and, uh, and funding grants and uh, on all those recovery services? Yes, thanks, Commissioner. Absolutely. Uh, and I think if we had a time again, what we would say is uh, we would happily administer those for them, uh, and particularly for uh, residents that came out of Cancoban and other areas on the uh, on the north side and, and Delic. Um, I think um, it, it was much easier for them to get to us, and in many cases there were roadblocks that actually would have prevented them getting to uh, the communities that, where they could have had those grants administered. I okay, appreciate uh, that. And one other question, and it would be for uh, Mr Irino or Mr Florence. I've looked through your submission uh, in, in trying to get an understand about, understanding about how assets, in particular people, were coordinated across different LGAs uh, during the emergency, and the, the Municipal Association of Victoria pops up all the time as, as doing this. Might be a bit old-fashioned. I thought it would be a state issue, a state government issue, to, to coordinate resources within LGAs. Is that does the association pick that up on behalf of the state? How does that mechanism work? Is it a formal mechanism, or it just just happens? Uh, thanks, Commissioner. I think it's the latter, in practical terms. That uh, uh, when an event occurs. Um, it's the goodwill or the communications or the relationships with local shires that kick in. And uh, in our case, we received calls from Tawong and uh, we put into action the support services that we could provide. It wasn't until uh, later that the MAV um, kicked in to try and provide uh, some support. And that was ultimately, as uh, Amanda has talked about, through Darabin Council. But in general terms, it's... Um, it's uh, sort of not ad hoc, but it's uh, it's not a formalised state government approach. All right, thank you for clarifying that that for me, Commissioner Bennett. Yes, thanks, Chair. I also actually um, had a, a thought about coordination that you could assist me with. Um, uh, Mr Irene and Mr Florence, you've talked in your submission about some of the difficulties in going into Taowong and, and what role you were to play there. And um, you've both talked about the various people who ended up coming in. So you had, um, you know, from now looking at Ms Pagan initially, you had people from Indigo, you had um, then other government resources come in. I'm assuming you had, so you had both a local council that you knew well, and then eventually I'm assuming you had people from more broadly in Victoria um, as other, other support came in. Uh, and um, there may have been charities or, or something like that that also came in to assist. Could you give me an idea of how that worked in a coordination sense? So you're actually in the recovery centre, you're trying to coordinate it, you've got all the, you've got the local knowledge, you've got some local knowledge out of Indigo, you've got less local knowledge coming in, I'm assuming, from other parts of Victoria. Can you just very briefly give me a feel for how that coordination worked? Yeah, thanks, Commissioner. Um, it was very challenging in, in a nutshell. Uh, and I think uh, what we found, is, as um, Trevor said, uh, the less local knowledge you had, I guess, um, the, the more challenging it was. Uh, and I think we had uh, so many people cycling both through our incident control centre and through our relief centres. It was very difficult to coordinate um, knowledge, transfer, making sure people understood where the arrangements were, uh, and, and um, making sure that, particularly in the early stages where we had some really extreme needs where people didn't have water, uh, that, that, that those sorts of, I guess, messages um, were able to be coordinated. And I think in our, in our submission, we've suggested this notion of a flying squad that uh, really is trained up to deal with this because I think that familiarity in a, in a disaster of the kind of 
size that we had would have um, probably offset a, a lot of the challenges we felt. And I think the other thing I'd say that we learned out of this was the role Wodonga City Council could play uh, in relation to uh, all of our sort of potential um, needs in, a, in the event of a, a disaster was actually probably not something that had been well tested, but it's certainly something that um, think moving forward, they definitely need to be part of our arrangements and part of whatever uh, sort of a flying squad equivalent would look like to assist uh, a small shire should another event like this occur. Thank you. I'm um, just turning for a moment to Mr. Irina, Mr. Florence. I noticed that you made the observation that um, you thought that Tawong would have been quite happy for you to take over, but you, you, uh, for all the reasons you've given, um, you, you didn't do that. Um, I don't know if you want to make any further comment on that in terms of coordination. I'll just leave that where it is. But I do have a question for you. Um, you've made, you've, you've commented in your response a lot about the smoke and the the fact that it stayed around for a long time. I was just wondering. Um, whether you've noticed any, any in your in your population any health impacts attributable to um, that smoke because you you've, it obviously was something that was of great concern to you at the time. You may not have observed any. I just wondered if you had any any reports. I um. I actually, I'll just say on a personal note. Uh, my wife, uh, who will be listening to this, uh, <laughs> in her role visited Tao Wong, some of the affected areas, but also experienced uh, smoke um, uh, pressure herself in her own health and still feels the effects at the moment. So I suspect if there will be others in a similar situation who were exposed for a long period of time uh, and have done perhaps some damage. Thank you. In, in that regard, I don't mark that. So we. Um, Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, we work closely with our health services uh, in general, and whilst there's been no definitive uh, assessment of it, anecdotally, there were um, cases of you know smoke inhalation issues, you know, particularly triggering um, uh, established conditions like asthma, etc. So it did uh, exacerbate uh, some of those conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Um, I was actually in your LGA during the period, I can attest the smoke was unbelievable, as bad as, as Canberra. Um, but other than that, um, the question I'd like to ask you was, um, you mentioned that originally that you weren't eligible under the disaster recovery funding arrangements and then it was only this month that you've been, become eligible, your small businesses have become eligible for the $10,000 grant. I just wondered whether you could tell us um, what program that $10,000 comes from, um, how many small businesses have received it, and what is the total amount that has been distributed in your LGA, if you have it handy? Um, I guess um, I'll answer that in a different order, but uh, we're aware that the take-up is slow so far, but it's only just recently been announced. So we're doing all we can to get that out to our businesses and the information out there. Uh, so with, there's awareness raising that we've got to do. We're also aware that some people have applied and come up across some hurdles in meeting some of the criteria uh, and have been put off by the process and we're, we're pleading with them to get back on and try again that they may well be eligible. Um, people tend to self-diagnose, self uh, self-assess and they get it wrong. So there, there is the take up, I'm not sure the numbers, I've seen numbers of about 30 or 40 so far. And I'm sure there's far more going to be eligible and need to put their hand up. Um, so I can't quite name the program under which it came, but it was some sort of National Bushfire Recovery Assistance Program yeah. uh, for which we weren't initially... Uh, we were eligible for some components of it. That there was a $200,000 grant. I think Cowan uh, and Alpine got a million each. We got 200000 under one of the programs. And then there was a separate arm of that, um, which we were not affected. And, and Commissioner, if, if you would indulge me just for a second on, on a slightly side issue, um, if I can, there were... A, a side issue to do with the insurance industry where um, although the, everyone was told to evacuate, all the tourists and visitors told to leave and so on, um, our businesses couldn't access business interruption insurance because there were no, specifically there were no roadblocks in the area. So I'll, I'll, I'll call them virtual roadblocks or mental roadblocks where the Premier said told them to get out and not to, not to travel down these roads, but there were no physical roadblocks. So again, perhaps due to, I'll say cross border, I'll say postcode borders. We weren't in the right postcode to be declared um, 
uh, eligible for insurance either because there were no physical roadblocks in the area, although there were mental roadblocks in people have been told not to come down down certain roads. Um, I don't know, Marky. No, OK, thank you, Commissioner. No, thanks very much. Nothing more from me. No, thank you. And and thank you for uh, that that addition was uh, gives us and uh, and I think the public who weren't affected an idea of the complexity uh, of being able to assess potential damages and look for for claims. So thank you very much for for that, Ms. Pagan. Thank you very much uh, as well. We appreciate uh, all your evidence this, this morning, Ms. Dovey. Chair, there's nothing more for this panel. Would the panel participants please be released on their summonses? They will be released on their summons. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Um, and I think uh, if we could adjourn until 11.45. 11.45 Canberra time. Adjournment. Thank you. All right. The Royal Commission has adjourned until 11.45.
The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Commissioners, we now have a panel uh, consisting of uh, representatives of Bega Valley Council, uh, Southern Downs Regional Council in Queensland and Wallandilly Shire Council in New South Wales. I call Leanne Barnes, Craig Magnuson and Ali Dench. And good, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Still morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is still morning. <laughs> <laughs> Just. Um, all witnesses will affirm. Miss Barnes. <clears throat> Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr Magnuson, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Ms Dench, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Could I ask you, I'll take you in turns, what you ask you to describe to the commissioners, what your role at the council is and what your role is in relation to natural disaster recovery. I'll start with you, uh, Ms Barnes. Um, my role with the council is as the general manager, a position I've held since um, late 2013. My role with the council in relationship to emergency uh, management has been as the chair of the local emergency management committee and um, subsequently under recent events um, I've held the position of a regional recovery coordinator for um, the Tathra fires in 2016 and most recently um, I've led the um, local recovery action team and participated as the deputy chair as the, of the regional recovery committee. And I'll go to you Ms Dench. Yes, uh, good morning. My role uh, at Wollongilly Shire Council is as executive director for community and corporate. I uh, have been in this role uh, since 2005. I also um, have the role of the local recovery coordinator's position, which is attached to the local emergency management committee and have had that role for the, for the last um, seven years. And finally, Mr Magnuson. Yeah, thank you. Um, apparently I'm the acting director of sustainable development here at Southern Downs Regional Council. Um, my role in disaster management with council, I'm the deputy recovery coordinator. Um, I ran the evacuation centre during the stint of bushfires and I chair the, um, the environment recovery subgroup. Mr Magnuson, I'll stay with you, I'm going to start with you. The fires began uh, in September 2019 in Southern Downs. Could you uh, just sketch for the, for the commissioners um, how those fires and the context of those fires impacted your local government area and just some sense of the local government area as you give that description? Sure. So the Southern Downs Regional Council area is um, in the southeastern corner, I suppose, of Queensland. We're a couple of hours uh, drive from Brisbane with the two major centres of Warwick and Stanthorpe. Stanthorpe being the major centre in the, in the southern part of the region, and it's only located about um, um, oh, 60 kilometres from the New South Wales-Queensland border. But the fires began in Stanthorpe, uh, like you say, in September. Um, we had been in severe drought and we continue to be in severe drought. Um, and, you know, some, um, some really harsh weather conditions culminated in, um, in the accident lighting of a fire which quickly spread. It was not far off the outskirts of the town of Stanthorpe and with the, the strong winds and heat we had, it quickly uh, was threatening the township of Stanthorpe, um, spread into into pretty well inaccessible um, natural areas of bushland, uh, threatened the township, threatened a number of residences. <clears throat> that was all on a, um, a Friday afternoon, as I recall, Friday evening, and um, sort of was exacerbated through through Friday night and into Saturday morning was the was the main part of it. The fire itself continued on for, for quite a number of days after that until it was deemed to be under control, but um, yeah, that's when it that's when it um, when it flared up was the Friday 
afternoon, evening. Just, Mr Magnuson, I'll just pause you there for a moment. I um, neglected to ask the operators in the broadcast to broadcast RCN 900 016 0011, uh, which just helps the commissioners and those following situate uh, your regional um, council area. Sure. So you've got a national park to the to the west and Brisbane to the north. Yes, uh, and yeah, and um, quite an area of protected area state to the to the east and southeast of, of our region as well. <coughs> um, excuse me. Where the fire started, you can't see it on that map there, but just to the west of the township of Stanthorpe is a state forest. Um, the fire started uh, edge of that and quickly ran through that state forest. Township itself of Stanthorpe was situated just to the east of there. Um, so that's where the that's where the initial threat came from. Um, and is the area spread from there into sort of rural lands? Sorry, council. I'm sorry. Um, is the area a largely agricultural area? It is council. Yes, it's um, it's Stanthorpe surrounded by a lot of rural residential areas. So small acreage, um, lifestyle, hobby farm. There is still you know some horticulture and some. Um, grazing that happens in that area. You don't need to go too far out of the, away from the township of Stanthorpe before you get into bona fide, you know, large scale orchards uh, and larger scale grazing. Um, but certainly a lot of the area impacted was that rural residential sort of area. Um, the residences that were impacted and there was a number destroyed, I believe it was five homes were destroyed. They were on the outskirts of town. So not right in the middle of town uh, and probably not considered to be rural residential, but more lifestyle uh, bush type blocks. Right. And I take it that the area was subject uh, to drought at the time? Extreme drought, um, the worst drought on record, and we're still in the grips of that. We're still carting water from Warwick to Stanthorpe for, to supply the town with um, drinking water, which in itself was, a, was an issue. Um, you know, when you're trying to conserve every last drop of drinking water um, and you know, needing to needing to use a lot of it to fight fires with as well is not an ideal situation to be in. Of course, um, it was pleasing to note that we were able, in working with emergency services, to um, to identify and and use some um, some alternative water sources, so we weren't drawing on the town's drinking water to fight the fire. Thankfully. Now, you're, I, I will come to, to the other New South Wales councils in a moment, but I might just stay with you since we're in this, we're discussing this um, aspect. Uh, Southern Downs, as I understand, was e affected by the 2011 floods, but is this the first time that you've been significantly impacted by bushfires? So, um, yeah, council, that's probably fair to say. In my time, I've been with the council for eight years, um, and certainly there's bushfires. Um, you know, there's bushfires every year. But to my recollection, this was the first time that we've been impacted in such a way in that it, um, you know, destroyed houses, was threatening our town the size of Stanthorpe, as well as a number of other rural, rural residential, a lot of rural residential properties and towns and villages as well were, were at threat. So certainly this was the largest scale um, that I've seen in my time at council. Um, so between the 2011 floods and that, that predates my time on council, although I I was resident in the area at the time. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it was, certainly was the, the largest by a long way in terms of scale and scope of bushfire that we've experienced since the 2011 floods. Thank you, Mr Magnuson. But I might just turn to Wallandilly. The fire started in Wallandilly in November 2019 with the Green Wattle Creek fire, um, and that wasn't declared contained until the 29th of January 2020. Um, Ms Dench, could you give some uh, indication to the, the commissioners about how um, the Wallandilly Shire was impacted by those fires, um, the effects on those who live in your community uh, and, um, as I understand it, the impacts being felt not just in the urban-rural interface but also world heritage areas and water catchment areas and national parks in your shire. And I'm having shown now RCN 900, uh, 900 016 which is the map of the local government area. 
Yes, yes, thanks, Ms. Hogan Doran. Um, yes, the Wollandilly Shire is actually a peri urban area on the outskirts of the southwestern uh, Sydney. Um, we extend from Warragamba in the, in the north right down to Yandera in the south and to the west. We're couched by the World Heritage Area, uh, water catchment areas, um, two and a half thousand square kilometres approximately is the size of our area. Uh, for 10 days, the fire actually surrounded the township of Urandri, which was out uh, in the water catchment area. Um, and uh, the firefighters undertook really heroic efforts to, to um, save the township. The fire um, worked its way through the National Park towards the western rural interface of uh, Wollandilly Shire. And on the 5th of December, the fire actually jumped Lake Baragarang and across a burning towards Natai and Oakdale. There were small sporadic spot fires around Orangeville, Warrombi and Teresa Park. Um, and it continued to flare up sporadically around the 15th of December around Oakdale and Buxton as well. It moved backwards and forwards, threatening the rural um, the urban interface. Um, it, the fire um, left Wallandilly um, with a lot of impacts. Um, the, the most um, uh, uh, disturbing impact was the loss to, of two, our five, two firefighters, two fatalities. We had 18 injuries as a result um, of the fires in the area and 17 people were actually rescued as, as a result as well. 33 houses were destroyed or damaged um, uh, due, to the, due to the fire and um, we had 11 facilities that were destroyed or damaged and 66 outbuildings were destroyed. 278,700 hectares impacted on the rural urban interface, the World Heritage uh, Area and water catchment area in our national parks. We lost lots of fencing, about uh, 1,200 kilometres of fencing, and known um, animals were displaced, about approximately 190, um, which were the number of animals that were, were at the evacuation centre, which our neighbouring council, Camden, um, uh, worked collaboratively with us at the Camden Bones Centennial Park. It was major disruption to businesses and industry and education institutions. And yes, it was declared contained on the 29th of January. Um, it had major, major impact. It was uh, um, an enormous spread. Uh, and the sheer size of, of the Green Model Fire had our community on high alert for, for well over a month to two months, which um, has caused some um, ongoing issues for, for, for many of our residents who were, were quite stressed and on high alert due to the fires coming backwards and forwards and sporadically wiped out uh, the village of Balmoral and impacted upon houses in uh, Buxton and Bargo area and we lost some homes in Oakdale and the Warrombi area as well. And Ms Dench, you also mentioned, uh, I think in one of your submissions, that um, you also had a number of nursing homes that had to be evacuated, uh, and of course, yes, age, age residents, in, I imagine age residents in your community um, have, have um, had significant recovery hurdles uh, with both the bushfires and the impact of COVID-19 restrictions. Yes, correct, definitely. Um, a very vulnerable group within our community. Um, we had over 200 people registered at the Picton Bowling Club in the evacuation centre. And, and we had a significant amount of people with their animals at our library. We had chooks and pigs and horses and, and things around in our car park around, uh, around the council as well. Um, but yes, quite an impact upon uh, the evacuation of nursing homes in the area. Thanks, Ms Dench. I'll turn now to you, Ms Barnes. The experience in Bega, the fires ran from 29 December to 11 February 2020 and there were four fatalities in your, in your, um, in your shire. Just give some indication of the impact of the fires and the experience of living through the fires for the commissioners. Um, yes, it definitely was um, an extremely sad time for our community and continues to be so. Um, the fires commencing on New Year's Eve started um, in the west of um, the Bega Valley and we're a shire of six and a half thousand square kilometres. Um, so they started in the west at Bemboka and also in the north um, at Cabago and Corner um, and uh, raged in the and around the area um, for several months um, with 
us then being really impacted by the border fire that came um, from the south across the border, as you can see on the map, Commissioners, where we um, border with um, East Gippsland in um, Victoria. Um, we're a large shire, as I mentioned before, we've got a small population um, of 34,000 um, across that area with major centres um, in the north of um, Bermagui, Cabago, um, we have Bega, Tarthra, Marimbula, down to Eden, um, and then we have some isolated rural po pockets, pockets and um, lifestyle pockets across the area that were impacted. So um, we've also been suffering drought and the area had been, like the other two councils, very significantly impacted for a number of years by drought um, going into this um, summer season. We then had the fires. Um, we're also then in the same period impacted by significant flooding um, in the fire um, damaged areas. And um, during the peak of the fire, we were cut off to the north, to the south and to the west. Um, of course, we've got the ocean um, to the east. And we had in excess of 70,000 um, tourists um, in the Big Valley at that time, which we had to um, look after, um, support um, and help evacuate the area um, with the help of emergency agencies. And we also um, took a number of evacuees that came from East Gippsland, particularly from the Malakuta area, that came up the coast um, into our, our area. So significantly impacted. We um, uh, have um, lost over 470 properties um, across the Shire, uh, a significant um, number of families and communities and businesses impacted. Every um, sector of our economy has been significantly impacted. Agriculture across all sectors. So dairy significantly, beef, poultry, um, sheep farming, significant impacts in the forestry industry, and of course, tourism um, and even agricult um, aquaculture in some of our um, uh, fisheries, um, which were impacted by foot getting into lakes for the oyster industry. Um, and then we we sort of commenced the process of being in re response in that early um, period. We we're also in recovery and we we're in response and recovery over the period until the end of the fires. So thanks, Ms Barnes. What I want to do now is turn to the focus of today, which is recovery coordination and recovery issues. Um, Wallandilly, and I understand also Bega, Shire, um, were both affected in 2016 by severe storm events coming out of the East Coast Low. Um, what I wanted to understand from both of you, um, Ms Dench and Ms Barnes, is to what extent did that experience and then subsequent disaster experiences affect the recovery, um, um, both planning but also the recovery activity from the 2019-2020 bushfires? I'll start with you, Ms Dench, if I may. Hang on, I'll just, just wait my moment, Ms Dench. Um, we'll just take you off mute. Thank you. Please proceed. Thank you, Ms Hogan. Doran. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, we were, we've been impacted by the East Coast Low in 2016. And as a result, we've developed a framework, which is called Activate Wallandilly Framework. Um, this particular framework is a, a council-led strengths-based approach to disaster management um, preparedness, which is aimed at building resilient and informed communities. Um, the um, lessons learnt from the 2016 floods um, were uh, uh, realised through some deliberative dialogue sessions that we had, workshops uh, with the community afterwards to look at what worked well in our recovery efforts uh, and also to what we could improve upon. Um, the whole Activate framework consists of, um, of the components of recovery starting right when response commences. Um, we also have a mirror relief fund attached as part of the, um, the Activate Wollandilly framework. And this is a fund that is immediate and addresses the gap in getting emergency relief out to those that have been impacted on the ground quickly. Um, so that is a fund that is set up all the time for us to activate uh, to enable recovery and efforts with emergency payments. The, the framework has a community recovery um, information centre that is established immediately by council in our foyer area. 
and also to it's supported by a community resilience and recovery committee. And this particular committee oversights the, the implementation of all our recovery efforts. As part of this framework, we have developed a community preparedness toolkit. And that toolkit, as I say, includes the Mayor's Relief Fund. It it's also has how to prepare your family to ensure it's safe during a bushfire event, storm event, flood event. We have online um, uh, tools for people to, to, to access about getting ready. It's called Get Ready Wallandilly, a Get Prepared app, a home emergency kit and checklist, and also emergency information. But the biggest part of that particular uh, framework is our deliberative dialogue uh, debriefing sessions where we bring through together all the different cohorts of the community and local residents and stakeholder groups. Um, and actually, our first session is happening today, Council, um, with our Community Recovery Hub is the first of our debriefing sessions. Um, and, and, and these sessions um, develop recommendations papers as a result, and recommendations are then fed into our community strategic planning, our Wallandilly local disaster recovery plan that we have, which is a localised plan that feeds back up into the local recovery committee and back into the LEMC for us to discuss in between events on how we prepare uh, for the next event. Um, I must say the workshops are not a replacement for a full, full field debriefing or desktop exercise. It's specifically designed with a community engagement in mind with specific reference to recovery in emergency management, uh, emergency crisis. Um, and our, our, our community have actually expressed their appreciation for these sessions because it enables them to express their views mm -hmm. and also to their appreciation uh, for the content that's delivered during those sessions uh, where we look uh, uh, at the role of the, of the Recovery and Re Resilience Committee, an overview of response and recovery arrangements we talk about. We had the debriefing session and feedback, and then we also seek, seek comment online, also through our online engagement portals. Oh. So uh, it, it feeds back into our recovery plan and helps us to be prepared for next time. Ms Barnes, um, <clears throat> You were telling me earlier that you that that Bega was exp ex uh, exposed to the East Coast low and was going through recovery processes when you were then tested by the Tathra fires. Could you explain to the commissioners or identify the commissioners what what the experience of the Tathra fires did for your planning for subsequent recoveries from subsequent disasters? Um, yes, Council. We were um, sadly tested in 2016 and then in 2018. So the East Coast low, which um, uh, 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 impacted our whole coastline, and then the fires, the Tathra and District fire in um, March 2018, and then the Yankees Gap fire later that year. Um, one of the things that we did, not un unlike um, Wallandilly, was to review constantly um, the things that had worked and had not worked. We had a regional recovery coordinator appointed for the um, Tathra and District Fire, and that was um, Ewan Ferguson, who um, has had a long experience in this area. We were able to hit the ground running with his appointment literally the day after the fire in Tathra, and we established straight away then the local um, recovery committee and were able to bring in all of the agencies and established our recovery centre, um, our support service and a whole range of other programs that have, were rolling out and still in place when the fires hit this summer. So I think one of the things that we were able to do very quickly was call on staff that had worked in all aspects of recovery across our organisation um, to, to step into roles um, that would be able to support the community and um, to reflect on what had worked previously. Um, and we had also undertaken and engaged in some independent external evaluations of the work that had been undertaken um, since 2018. And that work then informed a number of our preparedness activities that rolled out over 2019. Um, that set up a number of our community areas working with other emergency service agencies to be um, as informed as possible. Um, but I think the scale of the 2019-2020 fires was something um, 
that was um, unpredicted, but we are as prepared as we possibly could be. And I think one of the things that we've relied on um, very much is that we walk with community in recovery. So it's a community-led recovery and communication, um, listening to community and providing information to community has been one of the things that has been absolutely critical and the things that we've been doing. Um, and at the peak of um, our response recovery activities in the, this summer's fire, um, we were getting up to 45,000 hits on our two or three day, times a day um, Facebook videos where we were seen as the point of contact for those um, activities and in that feedback session both online and in the community, listening to the community, we were able to do our continuous improvement um, assessments both um, of previous events and in the current activity as we roll those out and also like Wall and Billy, our local recovery action um, committee is also um, commencing and has commenced um, at their last meeting the review of this current recovery program. So we're constantly looking at rebuilding, refocusing um, and looking at what we would renew and do differently in the future. I just want to turn some of the things that you've raised uh, to working with other councils and working with other uh, levels of government. Um, as I understand it, uh, in the Victorian the Bega Valley um, had uh, the experience of many Victorians evacuating across the border. Of course, Bega's southern boundary is on the Victorian border. Um, and and uh, what, what sort of support did you receive either from Victoria or from the cross-border commissioners on either side of those borders, which are state roles in the relevant regional departments, um, in supporting the recovery process getting underway? Um, we've had very close um, uh, liaison with East Gippsland um, Shire Council. We have regular um, meetings and catch up with catch ups with them on other issues. So the relationship is already there, and so we were able to um, be in contact to discuss issues. For us, the Princess Highway, particularly being closed, was an issue going south. It um, it was closed for many many weeks and had significant freight economy. Um, uh, personal health um, constraints um, on both sides of the border. And so being able to work with the local government down there to refer our issues up through the New South Wales um, Cross-Border Commissioner with politicians um, and state agencies to actually try and um, get that work brought forward um, and moved along um, were, was useful. However, um, I think that there's opportunities for improvement in how that can be done in the future. Um, our group of councils, the Canberra Region Joint Organisation of Councils and the 10 councils that formed the um, Southern Regional Recovery Committee also worked very closely together on cross-border issues between councils and also cross-border commission uh, uh, issues with Victoria. Um, because Snowy Valleys and Snowy Monero, who are our councils to the west, also had those cross-border issues and, and, and needing to progress communications, planning issues, um, uh, economic issues um, and transport access issues. Thanks very much, Ms Barnes. I want to turn uh, just to back to Wallen and then I'll come to you, uh, Mr Magnuson, in, in relation to Southern Downs in Queensland. Um, Wallen Dilly is on the south of uh, or southwest of, of the Greater Sydney metropolitan area, um, obviously not having cross border issues. But what support did you receive from other councils uh, in the either in the area or through LG NSW? Just one moment again. Yeah, please proceed. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Hogan Doran. Um, we, uh, we, we, the fire actually straddled across two local government areas for us with between Windsor Caribbean and Wallandilly, and uh, we worked collaboratively. There was no boundaries with the fire, of course, uh, and we worked uh, very closely with Windsor Caribbean Council, providing mentoring and support and guidance, particularly in relation to um, donations, a removal of joint uh, of rubbish and trees and joint arterial roads. And also, to we jointly supported the community-led recovery hub that was located at Balmoral. Um, it was a great successful collaboration with Windsor Caribbean and a great demonstration of how local government does work together. 
for the biggest de the biggest demonstration was, um, and we're extremely grateful for the City of Sydney's coordinating role in the local government bushfire recovery support group uh, that they set up. Um, and it was uh, set up early, quickly in February. And this program was established really to simplify the process of um, inter-council resource sharing. Uh, and as a result, um, councils registered um, with, uh, with more than 500 individual offers of support, which was fantastic through this particular program uh, for bushfire affected councils. So this was councils assisting and helping councils and the City of Sydney had a coordinating role to match up requests for assistance and, and also uh, what resourcing was available. So it actually created, uh, there was an online portal for the requests to go through. So it was a really easy program and really um, a, a great way of, of, of getting direct support. Um, and through through this opportunity, there was, um, resources were created and, the, and uh, it was accessible and easy. As a result, Wallen Dilly was able to get support from Blacktown City Council to assist us uh, with in-kind support. Um, particularly around communications and graphic design and all different things um, because a lot of our officers were in other roles trying to help with the recovery area, so helping and doing the day-to-day -day stuff was very much appreciated. And Campbelltown Council also came to the assistance of one of our requests and that was in regards to um, recovery centre governance issues to, to help assist in some administrative support. So, um, it, it, we, like I say, very extremely grateful for the way in which this program and support group was set up so quickly to provide um, assistance in such an easy, accessible and timely way. Thanks, Ms Dench. Now, Mr Magnuson, can I turn to you in Southern Downs? Um, as I understand it, uh, in Queensland, there's a Queensland Reconstruction Authority. It's been it's an agency of some long standing uh, provided by the, or led by the state government. Um, Am I right in understanding that, uh, that that's where you draw most of your su external support for your council as opposed to other councils or, my, or perhaps you could expand on that? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, uh, Ms Hagendorn. Yeah, that's correct. So the Queensland uh, Reconstruction Authority Council worked really closely with QRA um, immediately once we stood up our recovery um, capability, if you like. My understanding the QRA was established after the 2011 floods in Queensland to help with recovery efforts and um, the council is very appreciative of the support we've had from QRA um, in in helping with uh, the recovery uh, response if you like and recovery planning. Um, also there's been follow-up work that uh, QRA have assisted council with as well in, in getting out and visiting impacted residents and businesses immediately after the bushfires and some six months after as well to check on to check on that progress with recovery. So, um, like I say, council uh, enjoys a, a, a good working relationship with QRA. It'd be remiss of me not to mention the other partnerships we have, of course, with our local uh, emergency services and a uh, plethora of volunteer groups um, and other agency staff that all deploy uh, state and council um, community services type staff that uh, deployed immediately to um, to assist our community. Now, your um, might just while I'm with you, Mr. Mr. Magnuson, uh, identify that in Southern Downs, as you've spoken about the sort of institutional support that you've received from QRA, in terms of the actual activities now, to move to the next topic on recovery centres, um, did you have an established local community recovery hub or was that set up in the post-2019 um, bushfires? And I also want to ask you to expand to the commissioners about the mobile um, recovery um, efforts you have. Sure, thanks, Ms. Hagendorin. So Initially, once we stood up recovery, the agencies, state agencies, sort of descended on Stanthorpe and um, and set up a hub within the council offices. Um, as an extension to that, council established a hub in the main street of Stanthorpe because um, we thought that might be not that there weren't people coming to seek that assistance and information from the council offices. We just thought it might be more um, it might be a more approachable means. Um, and people might be more open to coming into a shop front rather than a government building. 
So we gave that a go and it was it was really quite successful. We had, uh, I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but it was in excess of 500 people came through the door to, to obtain information. Um, and I think it also provided some people could just drop in and, and have, have someone to talk to from agencies, support services about their issues. So it was really good from that point of view. Moving to the next part of your question, which was about the use of the mobile library, we further we would hear reports from residents that there were people who were impacted who hadn't reached out, who hadn't come to seek assistance, um, be that because they were just either too proud or unwilling to come and ask for help or if there was um, you know, language barriers or whatnot. Um, so we deployed our mobile library van and obviously when it was safe to do so, drove into some of those areas and essentially door knocked. We had council community services staff in the mobile library and on occasion we had other agencies like Red Cross uh, attend individual households with, uh, with those staff. Having mentioned that, Ms Magnuson, I might just ask a question of Ms Barnes. I understand the Salvation Army um, had a mobile bushfire recovery team that worked in, in the Bega Shire. Um, is that, was, that, was that part of the standing arrangements uh, uh, and what impact is it has it has how has it been impacted by COVID-19? Um, we um, had a range of because of the huge area and the large number of um, community pockets that were impacted we had a, um, a central recovery <coughs> um, centre set up in Bega but we also had um, remote um, and localised ones across the Shire and the um, Salvation Army also had um, a program that they rolled out locally um, and with the COVID, <coughs> excuse me, with the COVID um, overlay, a number of those were then reduced um, and, and changed in their in their framework. Um, but we've also had community relief centres that have been supported and set up um, by local community groups, um, and those um, in the main have been able to be supported to remain open as a point of contact through the period um, of the COVID um, overlay. And the um, we're working through a process now of getting those other services back out into the community. And we've supported those programs as well with quite a significant online um, presence. So um, doing daily um, initially interviews with people um, and getting those onto our Facebook page and website um, and getting other forms of information out to the community. So hopefully in the next um, short period of time, we'll have the full suite of um, integrated services involving groups like the Salvation Army and others, Red Cross and other organisations um, out and operating within the community again. You've mentioned um, the support that you've received from the charitable sector, Ms Barnes. Ms Dench, in Wallandilly, I understand uh, you were um, received an enormous amount of donated goods and uh, but which created some problems though for the Wallandilly Shire Council to manage. Could you just expand on that for the commissioners? Oh yes, it was uh, an outpouring of donations. The community uh, was very, we're very appreciative of the amount of support that was given, but it, it created a tsunami of donations um, that was very difficult to manage. We set up a uh, community recovery information centre initially in Picton of where we used our Shire Hall because it was right on Christmas and everybody, a lot of our families have lost Christmas presents and everything. And so there was a big outpouring of donations of toys and goods. Um, so it, it was distributed from our, our Shire Hall and, and as part of it too, we helped establish actually in the fire zone where the support was needed. The, the community-led and driven recovery hub located... It was originally located at Buxton Hall and then moved down to uh, Balmoral Hall from there. Um, and it, 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 it was the Picton CWA um, led by um, their president and also a member of the uh, Buxton RFS, which was co-led and co-managed by um, these two uh, wonderful leaders within our community, uh, Kim O'Grady and Kim Hill. And um, their stamina and, and the volunteers uh, from the CWA and that uh, the work that they did 
to sort through all the donations. We actually had seven shipping containers donated uh, down at the hall to, to, to put all the donations into. Um, and uh, it has since been distributed, and we've also distributed to other areas across um, across the, the fire impacted uh, across the state. Um, it, it highlights, although, the complexity of uh, recovery in, in, in the processes in recovery and the dynamics of relationships and people wanting to help and support and how those donations were distributed was also a very big, big factor uh, in, in some of the, some of the dynamics and, and challenges that, that came as a result of that. Um, it's something we are learning from this on how we actually deal with spontaneous volunteers and also the, um, the, the wanting to give donations and how this sometimes can take away from the immediate uh, recovery uh, the recovery efforts it takes a lot of energy and a lot of effort people are trying to uh, donate and do, do things that they think as well but it creates a whole nother problem that needs to be managed thank you Ms. Dench Mr. Magnuson I can see you nodding your head as as Ms. Dench is making those observations did you have those same experiences up in Queensland we did, um, Ms. Ogendora. Thanks for the question. Yeah, we um, and I'd like to yeah, in, endorse what uh, Ms. Dench had to say there. That you know the, the well-meaning and, and generous spirit of the community, the local community, but also from far and wide, was just um, overwhelming. Um, however, it does take some management and um, and can take away effort and resources from uh, from other aspects of recovery, not to mention the response too, because. It doesn't take long for for those um, those donations and uh, and well-meaning uh, charity to to come in. Um, what we did find too was that the donation of goods and services from outside the region into the region, you know, that obviously, well, not obviously, but it is obvious now, has an economic impact in the town itself because you're mm -hmm. taking away from local businesses who are also suffering yep. due to the effects of drought and then bushfire, of course. Uh, so that you know the messaging that we tried to push really hard was, uh, yeah, you know, obviously anything is, is really uh, greatly welcomed. However, cash was king because um, we didn't want to have sort of perverse outcomes by people's generous nature having a, a negative impact on our local businesses. Now, we've just uh, lost contact with Bega for the moment, but we'll have that re-established. And while that's happening, I might just turn to the question of the broader issues that are involved in recovery concerning the clean-up from the direct impacts of the bushfires. And, and obviously, Mr Magnuson, you, um, your area would have had that experience in a different context initially from floods. Um, how, is, how has that been managed in the Southern Downs region? Has it been supported by the state or have exemptions have to be sought to try and speed up the process of, uh, of the clean-up? Sure. So thanks, uh, Ms Hogan-Doran. So with the, so the clean-up was supported financially through the QRA, through the Queensland um, um, Recovery Authority, QRA. Um, so once the disaster management, sorry, the disaster declaration um, was made, then you know we were covered for for those costs of the cleanup. Uh, some exemptions were need, were um, required to be sought. So, for instance, with the with the disposal of a lot of um, a lot of debris and and damaged um, damaged material, we had to seek an exemption from the state government to the waste levy. So that was sought and gratefully uh, received as well. So that ran from a number of months to give. Um, Give landholders uh, as much time as possible to to affect their clean up without the um, without the worry of having to pay a waste levy. Now we're just um, I did have some questions I want to raise with Bega. I might just note that what I understand with Bega that um, they've uh, they're building a new cell to receive clean up debris so that they can actually manage it on uh, within the shire rather than having to truck it out or, or seek alternative um, landfill or other arrangements to get all of the debris that's associated with um, uh, the damage from the bushfires in Wallandilly. What's been the experience, just briefly, if I may, um, Ms. Dench, in relation to the council's involvement in the cleanup? Yeah, thank you for the question, Ms. Hagen Doran. Look, the general public looks to council all, uh, for the cleanup. However, it's not just the sole responsibility of council. I, I need to say up front, because of the cumulative impacts and effects of 
we've had drought, flood, fire, and of course now COVID. Um, recovery is actually embedded in Wallandilly Shire Council's psyche and culture. It's actually the vibe of our councils, part of the vibe. Uh, whereas when the, when the community looks to council for help, council jumps in and does it. Um, so we just implemented the cleanup. We just got in and did it. Um, we implemented bushfire waste drop-off options that were implemented for fire-affected residents in, uh, at our Bargo Waste Management Centre. And we actually opened that up to Winter Caribbean um, residents as well because it's straddled across uh, the two areas. We've worked uh, collaboratively with Lang O'Rourke, the state government's appointed contractor, to undertake post-fire cleanup. And there has been some delayed, it has been a bit of a delayed process, which has frustrated some of our fire impacted residents. But we do see that this is because of the sheer size of the cleanup across the state it has been one of the, it's been one of the major issues. Um, council also managed very significant tree clean up operations in the bushfire affected area and trees are becoming out to be one of the biggest issues, um, uh, utilising uh, lots of council's resources um, to, to remove at risk and hazardous trees as a result. And there, there is some um, issues in relation to trees on private property and the role of council in cleaning those up, as well as issues in the public public realm and public domain that we, we, we need to do. Um, our council's tree experts just made themselves available to inspect uh, fire damaged trees on private property. Uh, and help to determine if tree removal was uh, required. Again, this was a resource, um, intense resource that impacted upon council in that regard. Um, what I'll do now is I'll move on to our final topic so that there is time for the questions for financial assistance. For those commissioners, if you're concerned, um, uh, uh, the battery died on the laptop, so we're just arranging for a swap, a swap to occur with the laptops. So there'll be a couple more minutes from Bega. Uh, if I could turn to our final topic in relation to financial assistance, I'll go to you, um, Mr. Mr. Da uh, Mr. Dance, Mr. Magnus, and I do apologise. Uh, as I understand it, the, the significant, there have been significant economic impacts, and um, it's a it's a tour an area that it, it is of some interest to the tourists. What what has been the um, the way in which uh, businesses have been supported, uh, and what are the what are the challenges that have emerged in terms of helping businesses recover from in the area? Sure. Well, thanks for the question, Ms. Hogan Doran. So, council was um, uh, really um, fortunate to receive the. The million dollars through the federal government, through the National um, Bushfire Agency, that was administered through QRA. Um, we've been fortunate to receive other other funding that's come through, um, or is coming through from the state government as well. Um, and there's, you know, there's a there's a range of of funding packages and things that are starting to come through now, which will um, which are aimed at helping our businesses get back on their feet. Um, obviously, it's been compounded by COVID. And so there's a number of those packages coming through as well. So they're starting to blend together a little bit. Um, but all in all, you know, all of the assistance that we can get, that we can help our business community um, take advantage of is really gratefully uh, received. One of the challenges, however, has been the timeliness of the delivery of that funding. Um, as you mentioned from the outset, the Stanford bushfires were in September and from memory, I think it was early September. We're in late June now and much of that money is yet to hit the ground. Um, so while council and residents and business are extremely grateful of the funding assistance, when there are funding announcements made you know, while recovery is going on straight after the response or sometimes during the response, the lag between um, the announcement being made and the funding actually hitting the ground can um, can be really detrimental, lead to a sense of um, well, people almost feel forgotten, I suppose. So the, the, uh, the announcement's made there's a sense of hope that it's coming, it's coming, and then, um, you know, there's, there's lengthy delays like we're experiencing now. So if, if at all possible for that, um, that funding to be streamlined to hit the ground where it needs to go, that would be fantastic. Another challenge we've seen is um, the, the delivery, particularly of some of the state funding initiatives, again, which were really welcomed by council and residents, delivered through existing, um, existing avenues, existing funding avenues, not necessarily tailored specifically to suit the needs of bushfire recovery. Um, that, that saw some, some fire, bushfire impacted businesses miss out 
on the opportunity to, to tap into some of that um, some of that assistance because they didn't meet the eligibility criteria in the established uh, funding streams. One of the questions I want to, and the commissioners no doubt will have additional questions that come uh, in just a moment. Um, Ms. Denshin, Ms. Barnes, um, and also Mr. Magnuson. Um, what Mr. Magnuson was just directed to was the sort of immediate impacts and, and disruption that is caused by uh, natural disasters and the need to um, uh, have financial assistance in order to effectively bounce back from that. I want to raise with you the question of the more broader impact of funding to um, support community resilience and uh, risk mitigation measures so that when subsequent disasters do occur, that there is um, perhaps less damage occurred or less less impact on the community. Um, there, Ms Dench, you raised uh, in the Wallandilly uh, submission uh, the, the, the troubles uh, that is experienced by other um, shires and, and evidence we've heard during the course of this week where there are communities who have one road in and one road out uh, or limited access to those communities when having to call upon to evacuate. And if I might just have called up WOL 500 001 0023, uh, which, in which the Wallandilly Shire, and I mentioned this in my opening, uh, describe the difficulties experienced uh, with the evacuation um, and moving to safe places. And if I can just have uh, this, the, the dot point above the photographs and then the dot point below highlighted and the, and, and the photographs right down to the bottom of the page. Thank you, operator. Um, what we can see here is a, a long line of traffic uh, with smoke in the background uh, um, and quite, quite um, multicoloured smoke, which suggests that perhaps the fires are not far away. Uh, and um, this was what I mentioned in my opening, that uh, an alert was given to the southern villages of Buxton, Tarmore, Thirlmere and Picton to evacuate thousands of people, tried to evacuate at once, causing a 15 kilometre traffic jam from Bargo to Picton. Um, and as a result, an entire road network became gridlocked. Cars were at a standstill and some ran out of petrol after being stuck on the road for an, over an hour. The gridlock also impacted upon emergency services. And you, at the bottom it says, the RFS and council staff helped to clear the traffic. However, the shire could have been left with significant loss of life. Um, as after clearing of the traffic jam fires went through where the traffic was gridlocked. By sheer luck, we narrowly avoided the loss of many lives due to the sheer number of residents trying to leave their homes. Now, just pausing there, um, Ms Dench, uh, this submission identifies this problem of, of a, a number of people needing to evacuate it at, at, at once uh, under threat of, of fire. Um, how, does, how might long-term planning help um, and, and help avoid those kind of problems or mitigate those kinds of risks uh, in the future? Thank you very much for the question, Ms Hagendora. This is the number one issue for Wollondilly. This is our biggest concern and biggest risk, is how are we going to get people out of areas? We are, we are a growth area. Um, we are fast growing. Um, and what's looked at, at uh, in, in, in the areas where we are growing is precinct planning for evacuation routes. Mm -hmm. And also, um, but it's, it, it's the accumulative effect of all these different housing developments and different places that needs to look at what infrastructure is needed to be put into place to ensure there is essential evacuation routes so people can get out if need to. It's the accumulative impact of growth that needs to be looked at in the planning system um, and, and also the investment in infrastructure. We have been advocating for the Picton Bypass for years and years as an alternative route. Had the Picton Bypass been in place, um, it would have it would have uh, prevented this from happening. Um, we would have had extra uh, uh, infrastructure and routes for people to get out of. The Picton Bypass is not in the realm of councils to be able to provide. It's a hundred million dollar piece of infrastructure that's needed in this particular area. Um, and it needs to, it, it really does solely fall at the state and federal level to assist ensuring that housing, we are in a peri-urban area with growth and we're providing the housing needs. Um, evacuation out in these areas, peri-urban areas, is where it's becoming the norm for um, natural disasters to be happening. We need to be looking at how we're planning for the future. 
needs to be able to ensure that government provides the core infrastructure around which orderly development occurs and to make sure that we have in place that infrastructure to help. We are catching up with just the needs of the here and the now, let alone the new growth area that's coming in. Um, so it, it's a really big concern. We have 27 planning proposals on our books at the moment um, and they all need to be talking to each other in regards to how we, we, we plan for evacuation routes and infrastructure that is needed. Now, Ms. Dench, bypass is critical. It's thank you. critical. Ms Dench, I'm very conscious of the time uh, and I do want you all to have an opportunity to uh, respond to questions from the commissioners. Uh, commissioners? Thank you for that. And Ms Dench, I'm glad you, you went to that, that point because I, I, I had a question around your, uh, your planning processes and if I can actually take us to that paragraph I think you're referring to. So it's uh, that same document, page 24 or 27. So it's the next page, actually, that you've got there. And if you go to the dot point midway up from the bottom, about 10,000 new houses, can you just... Ms. Dench, can you see that? About, that's the 10,000 new houses statement that you were talking about, 27 planning proposals are currently with council. Can you just clarify for the Commission, it, it, those 27 planning proposals, we said they all need to talk together, but the council, does the council approve those or, or not? And if, if you don't, how do you take into account those evacuation routes being adequately addressed in the planning proposals themselves and if they're not, <coughs> should those proposals go ahead? Planning proposal, these, these planning proposals are uh, date determined a lot of the time. They, um, they go through a state gateway uh, and a lot of them are, are assessed with the evacuation at a precinct, like I say, at a precinct level. It's the cumulative impact that needs to be considered and Council has raised these issues. We have our, in our recent local strategic planning statement that's been um, developed. We are looking at a study um, to, to look at um, the emergency management approach to these types of hazards and how things are planned. So as uh, before considering planning proposals in the area, uh, the outcomes of this particular study that we're, we're now going to be putting into place will, will assist in the consideration of what should be approved and not approved in which particular areas. There needs to be uh, more um, a collaborative approach between with the state and with ourselves in, in the assessment and the needs of these particular and ensuring that they're all talking together in relation to uh, the cumulative effect of growth in an area such as ours. Yep. Individual uh, pre things are looked at, but they need to be looked at in a cumulative way. I understand the cumulative way, and, uh, and uh, in fact, I would look at that as a state issue to make sure that's the case. But Definitely. surely if you identify the level of risk that you have there, and it, and it came to fruition as an issue during the, the fires, you have the ability to say yes or no to those planning proposals going ahead, is that right? until you get the appropriate infrastructure in place? Uh, it's it's state determined. We have a growth area, which is a state significant uh, area, and it's determined by the state. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Uh, I have another question for you. In fact, it is with the, with the state's uh, issue. If we can go to page nine of your uh, submission, which is coordination, and it's the third dot point down, Wallandilly Shire Council. We had had a session before and, and this came out with talking to Victoria. Uh, and so I just want to clarify with New South Wales now. It, it seems like the, the local council or local government area associations uh, within the states uh, do a lot of coordinating. And in this case, the City of Sydney has jumped in to coordinate this bushfire recovery support group across the, the councils. Um, Mm -hmm. Again, I would have thought that's a state issue rather than delegating that down to the councils to look after councils. Is is there is there a process above that that we're not we've not seen so far in the in the submissions that coordinates that uh, that work? Um, I think you're correct. It's left up to to councils to coordinate I'll amongst to ourselves. We, um, there is the Greater Sydney Regional Recovery Committee that's now looking at how we coordinate and how we collaborate together. That's come as a result of these fires. But uh, yet yeah, during this, the City of Sydney, they, they took on board that through our, our local government 
associated took on board that coordinating role um, for us all to 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 use, and they developed a portal for us. Um, look, any assistance from the state to enable local government to do its role uh, is very much welcomed. Thank you, Miss Barnes. I think you wanted to add something there. I can see the hand going up. Yeah. Well, I was because um, Miss Dench is very much Commissioner covered um, the local government to local government support. But there was also um, the role local government New South Wales um, and the Office of Local Government worked very closely yeah. on this project as well. So there was a large number of councils supporting councils. Um, we had, um, I think, uh, 15 councils provided staff to come and support us. Um, and our regional recovery coordinator, um, Dick Adams, also um, played a role in some of that coordination role. So there was an overlay um, from the state as well, but um, obviously these, the City of Sydney putting together the portal was fantastic and some councils actually rolled out and were helping us um, three or four days after the fire. So um, councils support each other, um, but the state and the local government association were also involved. Yeah. But again, it seems, and we'll chase this up with the state <coughs> next week, it seems like the local government association, the association does a lot of the work uh, to get that coordination going. It's just an area that we're, we're obviously interested in from a national coordination point of view. And speaking of which, which Ms Barnes, uh, evacuation routes and uh, in infrastructure. Um, the Commission's had a chance to observe as we went down and visited your, your area, um, Highway Number 1, the National Highway for, for Australia, and observed the fitness of purpose of it as a major evacuation route right up and down the east coast, where Victoria and New South Wales. Can you just take us through, you, you alluded to it about, uh, I think, um, works to upgrade the highway or what might be needed, but could you provide the Commission just a summary of the, the challenges and the funding issues and where the funding comes for Highway 1, please? Yes, um, the Princess Highway is not um, a road of um, strategic importance or funded through a federal um, uh, program. So it's uh, predominantly the New South Wales State Government who have been doing an enormous amount of work in terms of trying to get the highway upgraded from Sydney to um, the Victorian border and obviously on the other side of the border getting it done the other way. But um, there are extreme challenges and we had the um, Princess Highway blocked to the north and to the south. And you would have heard in um, your visits down here, it was blocked to the south for weeks. Um, and so whilst we had the challenges in terms of evacuation, we also then had the challenges in terms of recovery, particularly the economic recovery post the fires. So in many instances, it's the roadside clearing. So the number of trees, because the highway does travel through um, picturesque and beautiful forests and national parks, um, but it was there was significant damage by roadside vegetation um, and fire to the actual um, road, and um, that was a, a challenge. So um, the funding profile for it as um, route number one in Australia to be upgraded to provide um, as all-purpose um, access north and south is is absolutely critical. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying that with the, the funding. We appreciate that. Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I'm interested in, in recovery agencies, and I might start with you if I could, Mr Magnuson. Um, you raised the role of the QRA, the Queensland Reconstruction Authority, which I understand is described as the state's lead agency on disaster <coughs> recovery. Um, but then you've also described how the councils run recovery shop fronts and the like. Does, does the QRA act as a, as a one-stop shop or does it work with the local councils in delivering recovery services? Thanks for the question, Commissioner. Um, the, the, so, in short, a bit of both. Um, <coughs> certainly, a great assistance um, with the recovery efforts, efforts, sorry. It's probably more other agencies in the Queensland Government um, that provide the, the coalface um, uh, recovery effort, if you like, uh, like the Department of Communities, they um, they uh, sent you know that we had staff mobilised immediately once we'd stood up recovery, and they came out and they manned the initial hub that we had in the council offices that I spoke about earlier. Um, they generally 
uh, deployed for my understanding is like a two week period following the event. The shop front that we established was was subsequent to that. that we recognised that people were going to need assistance for a, a greater period of time after that two week uh, initial two week period. So that's when we established the shop front. It was primarily um, manned by council staff. We did have some other agencies, um, the likes of Red Cross and, and some others that no doubt I've, I've forgotten. My apologies. Um, so, again, I'll get back to the short answer to your question, Commissioner. Is it's a bit of both, but there's the distinction between the the state um, community staff initially being deployed for the for the couple of week period, and then it was um, the council led recovery activities subsequent to that. Mm -hmm. Does the fact that there's so many players in that space cause confusion amongst the community or did, did your agencies work collaboratively so there, there was effectively a one-stop shop? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Commissioner. There's certainly the potential for that, no doubt. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to say that we did work very collaboratively. We had, um, we had excellent working relationships with those guys. Um, and I think in no small part due to the local disaster management planning um, that occurs, so before the event, Subsequent to it, um, you know, our, our recovery is still um, still actively working on, you know, COVID, obviously. So we enjoy some really good working relationships with those agencies and that enabled us to, to streamline those recovery efforts and as much as possible uh, ensure there wasn't that duplication and ensure there wasn't the confusion amongst the community about who or how to access the assistance they needed. Thank you very much. If I just could quickly turn to you, Ms Barnes, you, you in the submission from your council, you, you offer the, a model whereby the council becomes the lead agency and monies, recovery monies is, is funnelled through the local council. Could you tell us a bit more about that model? Um, thank you, Commissioner. I think the model that we've seen work well for us when we're talking about recovery being community-led is one that is focused through delivery and support at a local level through local council. We're there with community and local emergency service agencies in doing preparedness and building community resilience. We're there supporting all the agencies in the community in a response phase. And we're there in all stages of recovery. So um, our approach um, following the Tathra um, fires was to really look at how we could build the capacity in our organisation to be able to have the plans in place, to be able to switch um, on that process, to be able to walk with community, to set in place the communication channels, to listen to community. Um, and we established very good relationships with the then Office of Emergency Management in New South Wales, which is now Resilience New South Wales. Um, and we started looking at how we could roll out a different model into the future. Um, our joint organisation of, cam of councils around Canberra has been identified through that to start looking um, at a model um, for how that could be rolled out into the future with councils working together to support each other, but the focus being on locally led recovery um, with councils um, being funded in a way that can do that on the ground community led recovery. Um, supported by the state. And then obviously um, this time round, we've also had the involvement of the National Bushfire Recovery Agency being established through the process of January. Um, we've worked very closely with them to ensure that their resources um, are actually working in through our teams so that we're not having three levels of government doing things separately as well as other agencies, but with a very coordinated on the ground local approach. Do you think that sort of model could work for the smaller, more resource-constrained local councils? So, you know, the, the, the concern for me is if you adopt that sort of local government-led approach, then those smaller councils might really struggle. So there's an argument then for taking it up to a state level and doing it. Do you, do you, do you have any ideas about how, how you might manage those sorts of issues? Um, yes, thank you, Commissioner. And for us, we're, we're not a big council, but I suppose we're not one of the smaller ones either. And I look at the group of councils that we represent um, or we're part of, which covers, you know, hilltops, um, comes goes across to Yass, the two snowy, snowy, Monero and snowy valleys. We've all got different levels of capacity. And I think if you have a focus that looks at there being a local link supported perhaps by a group of councils that can then step in when something um, happens, 
then it would still be able to still be that model that really walks with and um, supports the community locally to do things. Thanks a lot. Nothing more from me, Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Bennett. Yes, my, my question is, is coming back down much more to the um, to the specific. Uh, you've, both, you've all told us about the frameworks I mean, that you, you had in place prior to this. Um, I've got to the stage where I'm, I, I look at framework and my first question is, yes, but how did it work? Because frameworks are great until you actually have to implement them. And you've all, um, you've all identified, I think, some of the specific issues uh, that, you, you've, I, uh, that came out of this particular uh, recovery process. And I, some of them included um, concepts of the difficulties for people with data sharing between different um, agencies. Um, and, and I think you've discussed the question of dealing with donations uh, that came in and how that had to be accommodated. Um, I think you've all raised the question of a manifest need for more training for people to deal in the recovery space. And the one I loved, I should say, out of Wallandilly, Ms Dench, was acronyms. I must tell you, um, if there's one thing uh, that I personally have found very difficult in coming into any of these spaces is I have to keep asking um, what the acronyms are so I can understand the difficulty that some of your residents had in dealing with, with the various acronyms. But my question is, is really this. Um, you've all talked about the fact that you have um, a review of how the um, of how uh, you worked in the in the recent um, bushfires, I just want to be uh, just just to have an understanding of the. Uh, are you going to take all of these um, evident all of these um, examples of things that probably did not work as well, and it bring mm. them back in, and and if so, are you doing in the process of doing that now? So if there were to be another emergency. Um, sooner rather than later, you are actually implementing those, uh, what I would call lessons identified, and then make them, as the Chair would say, into lessons learned. If, if, if I could, Commissioner, definitely in Wallandilly, we we have a report that is developed. Uh, we had this happen out of the 2016 flood event, where um, we had a, a number of recommendations. Um, the, re the report was, was written in, uh, by uh, Ken Maroney and Dave Owens on behalf of Council. They facilitated these debriefing sessions and those recommendations have all been picked up by Council and incorporated back into our uh, planning documents and also we did a review of the local recovery plan as a result and we developed a long-term recovery and resilience plan with initiatives and actions that uh, come from the community uh, for, for what we're going to do to assist in that long-term recovery. Uh, the, the important thing is to ensure that everything is documented, that people are understood, and those recommendations are incorporated back into our planning processes and, and also acted upon. Um, they, uh, our, our, I can provide to the Commission the, the report that we've had and demonstrate where those recommendations have been implemented since. And as a result of that, it made us a lot better to recover this time around Thank and you. to implement things quickly. Thank you very and, much, and Ms Barnes. Commissioner, if I can just um, add to that, following the 2018 um, Tartra bushfires, we had um, independent reviews I mentioned previously undertaken and took on board those um, uh, recommendations into our planning. But the Office of Emergency Management um, also implemented and carried out quite an extensive independent assessment of the um, local recovery, the recovery um, committee and the actions that were undertaken for Tartra in 2018, and that informed a lot of the base planning um, for establishing templates um, and work that now Resilience New South Wales are rolling out to guide um, activity in, in local government. And mm. I think that putting a continuous improvement program into all of the work that we're doing is absolute. We're not always right. ever going to get it right, but it's important that we continually look at, learn, reflect and then refocus that thank, work. Yeah, thank you, Ms Barnes. Mr Magnuson, do you want to add anything or, or are you in the same place? Oh, I am in the same place, Commissioner, but really quickly, um, yeah, we and we have done the same thing at a number of levels. So right down to the um, evacuation centre level, you know, we had a debrief of the staff that, that helped out there and, um, and made some improvements as a result of the learnings through our disaster management coordinator. We had debriefs and reviews of the response and recovery um, internally, both internally at Council and in conjunction with Queensland Fire Emergency Services. So, um, yeah, certainly there's, with any event like this, I think, as you mentioned from the outset, there's lessons to be learned. 
um, and we're, that's not um, that's not lost on us. We we're hoping to improve our capability moving forward as a result of this um, as a result of the bushfires. Thank you very very much for that. Thank you, and uh, Ms. Stench, Ms. Barnes, and Mr. Magnuson. Can I thank you for the candour in which you've approached this discussion today? I know it's very difficult to revisit some of these issues, but the commission has appreciated it very, very much. So Ms. Hogan Doran. And at the time, uh, Chair, could all panel participants be released from their summonses? All panel participants can be released from their summonses. And once again, on behalf of the Commission, thank you very much for participating and for the submissions. We appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, thank Commissioner. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Commissioners and Council. Thank you. With that, I think we'll adjourn until 1400 Canberra time. Thank you. Thank you. All rise. The Royal Commission has adjourned until 2 p.m.
You are now on mute. The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. <coughs> Ms. Hogan Doran, let's uh, proceed, please. Uh, just before I call uh, Mr. De Pietro, I will tender some additional material that I think I foreshadowed this morning. Uh, the first is 12. Uh, this is on a second supplementary tender list that has been provided to parties and commissioners you should have. Uh, first exhibit is 12.1, which is the notice to give response received from the City of Darwin. Uh, which was received yesterday. Uh, then local government responses to the issues paper. We have received a large number, as I said, of local government uh, responses and for local government associations. These are the ones who have agreed to publication and were provided up to 12 p.m. today. Uh, so I'll just go through those. 12.2 Alpine Shire Council, 12.3 Bega Valley Shire Council, 12.4 Bundaberg Regional Council, 12.5 Burnie City Council, 12.6 Central Highlands Council, 12.7 City of Belmont, 12.8 City of Bunbury, 12.9 City of Gold Coast, 12.10 City of Greater Geraldton, 12.11 City of Hobart, 12.12 City of Wanneroo, 12.13 Karangamite Shire Council, 12.14 uh, East Gippsland Shire Council, 12.15 uh, Eurobadala Shire Council, 12.16 Glen Orkey City Council, 12.17 Greater Bendigo City Council, 12.18 Hawkesbury City Council, 12.19 Hinchinbrook Shire Council, 12.20 Kyogle Council, 12.21 Local. Uh, uh, Just check that for a moment. That can't be right. Uh, Commissioner, I'll just put 12.21 to one side because it seems to be a submission from Local Government Association of Queensland, which I thought I had dealt with on day one. 12.22 Midwestern Regional Council, 12.23 Mitchell Shire Council, 12. Same with the next one, which is 12.24 Municipal Association of Victoria. I believe that's already been tendered, but I'll just have that checked. 12.25 uh, Nambucca Valley Council, 12.26 Rockhampton Regional Council, 12.27 Scenic Rim Regional Council, 12.28 Shire of Karnama, 12.29 Shire of Dardanup, 12.30 Shire of Narragan, 12. Uh, 31 Shoalhaven City Council, 12.32 Snowy Monaro Regional Council, 12.33 Snowy Valleys Council, 12.34 Sutherland Shire Council, 12.35 Town of Victoria Park, 12.36 Townsville City Council, 12.37 Tawong Shire Council, 12.38 uh, it's also the Western Australian Local Government Association. Could, could it be that they're actually responses to the paper rather than submissions? The, I think that's, that's the, the issue, Commissioner. Yeah. That's right. 12.39 okay. um, Wellington Shire Council, 12.40 West Tamar Council and 12.41 Clarence Valley Council. So, Commissioners, as you can see, we've received quite a substantial number of issues, paper responses in the last few days. Um, and what we will need to do is to read and digest those and come back to you with something uh, to see if it shapes in any way what we've dealt with in the last three days. Um, then there are uh, public submissions, uh, additional public submissions that were referred to in my opening. Uh, and those are 12.42 Queen Bee and Palarang Reg Regional Council submission. I've just been given an updated list. When I said 12.42, I'm told that should be City of Bunbury. Okay. No, that's an addition. 12.42 is an additional one. Thank you, Chair. So that means 12.43 is Queen Bee and Palarang Regional Council, 12.44 Southern Downs Regional Council, 
4.45 Karangamite Shire Council and 12.46 Nambaka Valley, Valley Council. Um, so those are the submissions in addition to the issues papers that those four have also provided us. Uh, the final matters are relevant to the panel session, which is um, after Mr Pietro's evidence. Um, the first is 12.47 Australian Local Government Association uh, NGA 19, which is their National General Assembly meeting in 2019, their resolutions. And 12.48 is the Victorian Council's Metropolitan Municipality Map and Regional Municipality Map. And I am told that where I paused, LGAQ and MAV, those are, as you said, Chair, they're the response to the issues papers. And okay. I, have, I have tendered their responses to notices and or submissions. So that was 12.21 and 12.24. OK, we'll take all those documents uh, as exhibits as marked. And I would like to take the chance to thank all those councils uh, for responding to that uh, that issues paper. That's a, that's a great response. And a lot of effort goes into that. Thank you. And, and a number of the issues that were raised in the issues papers for comment were in addition to the issues that were being canvassed in the hearings this week. So, <coughs> uh, that being done, Chair, I call Vincenzo Di Pietro. Mr. Di Pietro, good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Di Pietro, we'll just get your uh, sound levels um, increased so that we can hear you, and I understand you'll take an oath. Yes, please. Yes, please. Mr. Di Pietro, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Now, Mr. Di Pietro, um, you're presently the local recovery coordinator for Shoalhaven City Council. Yes, that's correct. All right, and I, I just note that um, Shoalhaven has provided a number of uh, responses to notices to give information, which is from the broader council, not just in relation to recovery. Uh, commissioners, you have that in volume three, tab seven, eight and nine. Uh, SHC 501 001 0002, SHC 502 001 0002 and SHC 503 001 0002. Yes. Um, Mr. Depierto, you've come today just to sp speak specifically in relation to recovery issues, and I will confine myself to those questions because I do appreciate you'll have a limited role um, in council. But just uh, in order to orientate the Commission, if we could have RCN 900 016 0010. Uh, what we're seeing now, uh, Mr DiPietro, is the uh, local government area on the New South Wales map. Um, if you could just sketch for the commissioners, or you live in the area, perhaps give a sketch to the commissioners um, uh, the, the boundaries or the sense of the, this, uh, what is a semi-rural municipality uh, and its exposure to the most recent bushfires. Certainly. Um, we'd be happy to do so. Um, the Shoalhaven City Council <clears throat> is about 4,600 square kilometres. It has about 102,000 people. It extends from just north and halfway between Berry and Kiama to the north, um, all the way south to just north of Batemans Bay, and all the way west to uh, just beyond the, uh, the Shoalhaven Gorge, and, uh, and encompasses uh, a, a dramatic uh, variation and, uh, and, and variety of landscapes from one of the world's largest fluvial canyons to the west all the way through to um, river, riverine and uh, coastal estuaries, hamlets, towns, villages um, and some fairly high concentrations of uh, urban centres such as Nowra and, uh, and Ulladulla Milton. Um, it's a very diverse area geographically. About 80% of the area that I've just described is uh, National Park forefront, uh, coastal uh, waterfront reserve or, uh, or bushland, and about 20% of the area I've just described is, uh, is effectively developed and for, uh, for human habitation and, uh, and so on. So it's quite a, uh, quite a large area, very, very sparse population by, by 
find virtually you know, mass per unit area um, and very, very diverse geography. And just to, um, on the map, we can see the Jarvis Bay Territory, which is excluded from the local government area. That's to the east, uh, about a third of the way down. That's correct. The, um, the Jarvis Bay Territory is a part of the Australian Capital Territory. Um, it encompasses uh, a, a certain amount of uh, ocean, bay, uh, as well as communities such as Rec Bay, the Jarvis Bay community and the Royal Australian Naval College. Now, I appreciate uh, the limitations of your role, but I just wanted to bring uh, this to the attention of the commissioners. In the material that was provided by Shoalhaven uh, Council, uh, you provided an extract of the Shoalhaven Local Emergency Management Plan and in particular an extra B, which is the Hazards and Risk Summary. If I could have that brought up, SHC 501 001 0058. Now, Commissioners, this is not a document we've seen from many councils. Uh, this is, as I understand it, um, quite a detailed risk register that's been uh, uh, prepared as part of the Local Emergency Management Plan. Uh, and we can see in this document um, a number of different hazards have been identified, communicable disease, agricultural disease, storm, fire, utilities failure, flood, earthquake, tsunami and flood, flash flooding. And it goes over the page to identify a range of other issues concerning infrastructure failure, uh, transport failures, and so on. Um, this is probably a good moment to uh, uh, to raise this issue. Mr. Mr. Di Pietro, you've had a previous life. Indeed, you'd retired just prior to having been brought on board uh, as the local recovery coordinator. Um, if you could just, just uh, identified to the commissioners what your immediate background was and then your longer term background um, uh, in terms of the other Absolutely. ones. My, um, my main uh, employment was 40 years in uniform in the Royal Australian Navy. My last three years uh, in, in, uh, in the service was as commander of the fleet air arm based at NARA at HMAS Albatross. Um, on completion of uh, my service, uh, I took up um, an appointment from uh, August of uh, 16 through to April of 19, Chief Executive of Lockheed Martin Australia in New Zealand. And uh, I was then in, re in um, well, semi-retirement, I suppose. Um, and then the uh, council sought, uh, sought my views and, and assistance if, uh, if, if I was prepared to, uh, to, to come on board and assist. That was uh, sorted about the third or third week of December. Um, and it was pretty patent and obvious that fires were not going to get any less. And so we waited until uh, effectively the um, first week of January when I came on board and uh, have, been, have been established as a local recovery coordinator since. So I appreciate that your role is in recovery, but is, is it right to understand that you had a background in understanding and managing or risk management in, a, in its, both its both broadest and systemic sense? Uh, very much so. Um, in the service, uh, in aviation, of course, we, we base a great deal, in fact, all of our operations, um, as uh, Commissioner Binskin was no doubt well aware, on very thorough risk assessments and risk mitigation. Um, and that stretches right from the most basic of maintenance and uh, modification procedures all the way through to the most complex flying, uh, flying evolutions. Um, and in the service, I was uh, fortunate to be the Director General of Certification, Safety and Acceptance, in which one of the, uh, one of the three directorates that were directly under my purview were Navy safety systems. Um, so I do have a, a, a very comfortable and conversant knowledge of risk management and the processes involved in risk, risk management and most importantly in risk mitigation, um, understanding how to reduce residual risk to an acceptable level. So one, the first step in that, of course, as we've just seen from this document, is identifying what your risks are and mapping those risks as against um, various evaluation criteria. When it comes to... This, um, this, sorry, yes? Sorry, this document is, um, is a very good... Um, considering the, the diversity and, the, and the, uh, the range of, of available possibilities in, in an area the size of the city of Shoalhaven, its local emergency management plan is very well developed. It's very carefully considered. 
there are many aspects of it which I, I believe that in the in the recovery into the resilience side of the transition from the bushfire, uh, we would be well served to amplify the contents of this plan and to make sure that its, uh, its practical applications at the most basic levels in the community are understood because I believe that that's part of uh, the things that can uh, can actually help our future resilience. But uh, to, to if, I, if, I, if I understand your question correctly, um, Ms Hagen-Doran, it's, it's a very thorough document and I think it's, uh, it's a very um, a very concise description and uh, an understanding of what the Shoalhaven faces. It, it is a it is a very thorough document. I'm not going to take the commissioners to all aspects of it, and I note commissioners part of it has not been tendered because it includes restricted inf operational information, but is the kind of um, document that uh, identifies vulnerable facilities and and things of, of that nature. But what it what it doesn't do, and I don't raise it as a criticism, but I raise it to sort of amplify the points you've made is that it is um, it, it doesn't it doesn't look at the question of risks in recovery that is the the, the success or plan for recovery uh, as being a continuum of the risks that are faced by by a council is that a fair assessment let's take that question on notice I'm afraid because I haven't um, I would just need to study the document a bit more carefully to uh, to, to confirm um, that appraisal. I don't believe it's inaccurate, but I would prefer to uh, take it on notice and, uh, and, and advise formally after a closer scrutiny of the document. That's quite fair, and it was a question by me, not on notice to you. Uh, and I'll just um, return to that uh, in subsequent hearings if necessary, um, Mr. Di Pietro. What I would like to do is to take you to um, first to SHC 503001. Uh, 0082, which is part of the uh, submission made by SH uh, by Shoalhaven Council. Um, this is just picking up here the background to your appointment and the council's immediate response. And on what I'm wanting to do, we have a fair bit of time to trace this, is to identify um, uh, the standing up of the council response. Uh, what you then did, bringing the experience that you have from um, operational experience within the Navy and in, and in Lockheed Martin, which were the roles that you were in immediately prior to becoming the recovery coordinator, and how you adapted the otherwise, um, the, the guidelines or mandates that are specified by uh, the state government in relation to how to, how to uh, run and, sorry, establish and run a recovery operation. Certainly. Um, when asked to, uh, to come on board, I did a significant amount of, uh, of study into a number of documents. One was the Recovery Committee's document uh, of the New South Wales Government. Um, I also uh, looked very carefully at what the committee structure in, uh, in, in, in bushfire um, recovery looked like and came to an early conclusion um, that on the understanding that in, in, the, uh, in the fullness of time, as the, as the attention and the focus, uh, both political, media and otherwise, wanes, it's fair to say that the, that the, the, the agency most uh, in the driver's seat of the recovery and the one most uh, crucial to its execution and implementation, in whatever form it might take, would be the local government area council. It's for that reason, uh, and, and in particular, having looked at the committee structures as they sat in, at state government level, which included a map of about 56 boxes, um, it became fairly, fairly clear that um, the, the, the recovery committee, which had already been stood up and was chaired by the chief executive officer, Mr Dunshay of the Shoalhaven City Council, um, it had already met twice before I came on board in the later, later um, part of December. And by the time um, I was able to give some thought to how it ought to look, we were able to refine the shape of, uh, of our recovery committee to something which was far more manageable, in my view, in so far as that what it did was it kept the key people at the table that needed to be at the table, and then from there have avenues of, uh, of communication from the committee, either upwards and outwards into the state level if we needed assistance, but most importantly, ways for people to communicate with the committee um, at all levels of the community 
and council laws and council proper. If I could just um, pause there for a moment and assist you and the commissioners by going over to page 93. Now, uh, this is uh, the Shoalhaven Recovery Committee uh, and what I understand that this depicts, if we could just have that rotated, thank you, uh, information flow and organisation. And I, I'd invite you to just, just expand further on what you just said a moment ago in relation to how this is constituted, but also importantly, how it operates. Sure. Um, we took the key elements from the Recovery Committee guidance from the state government of the, of the positions that should always be considered mandatory in a recovery committee. If you have a look at the main, uh, the big blue box in the middle under the heading Shoalhaven Recovery Committee, the six positions identified there in the uh, in the documentation as being essential were the local area emergency uh, operational controller, the local emergency management officer, the regional emergency management officer, a representative uh, in, in this case when we started of the New South Wales Premier and Cabinet's uh, team and that turned out to be um, retitled uh, the Regional New South Wales Regions Industry Agriculture and Resources Rep. Obviously, the, the uh, Rural Fire Service, because we were still very much in an active fire ground uh, in the earliest stages of the recovery, and uh, the recovery coordination as the chair, which uh, which was the position that, uh, that I'd adopted. Now, those uh, six positions were then ably informed and were able to inform what we set up as four recovery action team leaders. Now, these weren't folks that were necessarily uh, in the leadership or the directorship or management of council. They were folks that could actually understand where the linkages inside council could best work and how to get them to work in favour of uh, actioning things that needed action very, very quickly. Um, so we had four recovery action team, um, recovery action teams. One was uh, social, the next was built, environmental, and economic and tourism. The important part of this uh, this committee process was two things. The first was a, uh, a very strict agenda so that we stayed disciplined in our approach to how we received information and how we dealt with actions that needed to be conducted. Um, but also it was a way of formalising the myriad of inputs that we were going to be receiving uh, as we got further into the recovery. And to that, I draw the Commissioner's uh, attention to the right-hand side. You'll see the big uh, vertical blue bar or aqua-coloured bar where it just says community input. That is effectively, as the name implies, the, the number of methods that the community could reach us as a committee, either through the consultative uh, group of the, of, the, of the council, which is effectively all of the, the city's councillors, councillors, um, all through the recovery centre, um, which in the early days there were three. There was uh, Ulladulla, Nowra and Kangaroo Valley. Although the Kangaroo Valley one wasn't an official uh, recovery centre as such, we, we treated it as one. And uh, then we also had council business as usual, uh, where we would see input coming into the council, which, uh, which while arriving through normal means, was clearly something that was directly fire related and would have to be dealt with uh, as, as, a, as a recovery issue. And so the recovery committee would take its inputs from the right-hand side of that picture, put very simply, or from above. So if it came from the council or from the CEO, it would come through my position straight into the committee, which met week weekly. And we met weekly since, um, since uh, January. And uh, in May, we, we, we stepped that out to fortnightly. And if you have a look at the two, um, like, a, like an arrows like conversation bubble in, in the light blue, you'll see two boxes, one which points down saying systemic longer term um, uh, broader issues needing external assistance. And down the bottom we had immediate, uh, immediate need, do it now, doable now. That was important because what we were able to do was we empowered the recovery action teams to work out what was actually something that could just be done now. So let's get on with, let's get on and do it, rather than necessarily reporting or, uh, or seeking approval or, uh, or more concurrence. But very importantly, for the things that we couldn't deal as a, with as a committee, and we thought we'd need external assistance, that's what the recovery committee would then refer up into the left hand, top left hand corner of the box, which was the regional recovery committee for the uh, for the regional recovery lead, and our spokesperson into that. Um, in, in, in a very disciplined way would be um, the regional New South Wales representative on the committee 
But in reality, we had a terrific uh, two-way com communication with the regional recovery lead, uh, Mr Dick Adams, and many folks inside New South Wales government when we needed it. So this, um, this model uh, was very cognizant of what was expected as a minimum from the recovery uh, committee guidelines, um, but it also worked more on how information needed to flow rather than a hierarchical structure of committee and subcommittee and sub-subcommittee. Um, primarily because if it got two, I think the first two meetings were, were seen to be just too unwieldy and you couldn't get through anywhere near a, um, a, um, a complicated agenda in a, in a reasonable time. Our meetings occur over uh, no more than 90 minutes and each week or each fortnight now, we resolve and close all of the issues that left the previous meeting open. The other thing this allowed us to do <clears throat> was maintaining the core of what the recovery committee needed to maintain. We were able to introduce um, additional resources as the recovery changed shape. And by that I mean, this was a very good model in the very first instance. But as we started to get further away from, uh, from the bushfire proper as, as, uh, as the fire became extinguished, there were things that became immediately um, uh, evident as, as being in need of attention in the not too distant future. One of course, and the most important one I think, is the community's mental health. In order to be able to address that, we invited onto the committee the New South Wales Health Representative from the local, uh, sorry, from the, uh, the regional area. And that, and that person is still on our, our recovery committee to this, to this time. We were also able to include things like the local Aboriginal Community Lands Council uh, or representatives of the local Aboriginal uh, community by invitation to help us out with things when, for example, in the post-fire period, things like um, um, cultural burns became an issue of, uh, of, some, of some discussion. So the committee could be across what it was that that would entail. We would always uh, we would always do that by seeking the appropriate level of expertise to uh, to join the um, join the committee. We also had a sta and still have a standing invitation to the local representative of Lango Rook, who was the clean up agency um, uh, contracted to the New South Wales state government to affect the clean up. And the way we would report any changes in governance of the committee structure would be through the monthly reports to council. And in that, at the very lead, the, the, the very lead discussion topic would be governance and what, it, what had changed in the formation of the committee in governance terms so that the council was always apprised of what we were, uh, what we were doing in terms of the direction that the committee was focusing on on that particular period. So on that, Mr um, Pietro, I, on that, Mr Pietro, I may just interrupt you because what I want to do is show that uh, report to, com to the commissioners. Um, there's one of them that I have here, SHC 503 001 uh, there, are, there are other reports in here, but um, this is one of them. Uh, as I understand it, so you're, you, this is a formal report to Council. And if we can go to the second page, um, this seems to be one from about um, uh, perhaps early March uh, or some... Yes, early March. We can see here on the second page, governance uh, shall have an LGA and governance regional and state. Is that the point that you were just alluding to? Yes, that's correct. So I've submitted four of these to council to date, and I'll be submitting the final one next Tuesday to an extraordinary meeting of council. Um, and this was how I would keep the council formally apprised of any changes to the recovery um, committee and the recovery agenda, which it had unanimously approved on the 20th of January. So as we changed shape or shifted, shifted um, attention, I would always report it through this in the, uh, in, in, to the council on a monthly basis. If you continue down this, um, this document, yes, we'll we see how page. we all... Oh, sorry. Yes, if we can go to 69 and 70. And in 69 and 70, we see under the headings community meetings, recovery centres and other forms of engagement. I'll have some more questions about this, but um, please just proceed, Mr Pietro, as you're explaining the, the way in which this is structured, this reporting up to the elected officials. Sure. The, the way, the way we, would have, that we would present these reports, or that I would present them, is to compile from all of the recovery action team leads 
give me what it is you've done in the last month and, uh, and, and the things that have actually been able to be completed and signed off. And that too was a way of making sure that um, the council uh, councillors had a, an active and, um, and uh, iterative part in the way that the recovery committee and, the, and its outcomes, most importantly its outcomes, were, uh, were measured and assessed. Now, um, the policy implications you've identified on the second, on page 70, um, goes for many pages, may I say. Uh, we can see it over to 71, 72 and 73. And I take you then to the heading, looking through the windscreen, uh, which appears in your other reports. Um, could you just explain or clarify what does that mean and what are you seeking to address in those matters under that um, heading? I probably, I probably have to apologise for my, um, my vincisms. That's just my way of that's just my way of saying let's look out the window. What's what's coming on the high? What's what's in front of us? Um, and it was a way of um, rather than just saying you know the next steps or the path ahead. Um, I would always treat it as a um, not light by any stretch, but just a um, a, a metaphor or, or a comparison that people could readily relate to. You know, you're always looking out the windscreen so you don't hit something. That was just uh, just my way of amplifying that. So in a sense of an emerging risk, although you do have over on the next page, if we take to the bottom, you've got a, a segment on your reporting on risk implications uh, going at the bottom of the page and over across to the page. Um, yes. You're identifying there um, the work and ongoing, the ongoing work and the wellbeing of council staff uh, and the uh, other issues that you raise there in the context of um, COVID-19. If I could just have that brought down, I just want to raise some broader questions to you, with you, um, uh, Mr. DiPietro. So you've spoken about recovery working through different stages. At the, at the first stage, you were speaking that recovery commences e even as the response is all, still ongoing and the fires are continuing. And then moving to another phase of having stood up the committee uh, and uh, and then moving and you've had to deal with the impact of COVID-19 as well and moving through to uh, the end of this financial year. Um, how long are you planning for the recovery committee in this form that we've seen to be stood up? Is there a point where it becomes business as usual as part of the, um, a part of the activities of council? Very much so. Um uh, you, if I could draw you back to the, uh, the, the recovery action plan where we had a look at the, uh, the schematic of what the committee looks like. Sure. On the page um, immediately before the, uh, the, the, um, the schematic of the recovery committee, That's, there's uh, a page headed... 92. Is that the Shoalhaven Recovery Committee transition to business and service? Yes, that's right. Um, so in there... It, 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 the third paragraph is the one that I draw the, uh, the, the commissioner's attention to. The most accurate indicator of the transition point from recovery to normal business and service will be when the demands for recovery action teams are referred directly to council without recovery committee involvement and referrals to external agencies are manageable as normal business for council. And um, <clears throat> that, I believe, we're at that point now. And to the extent that um, I've, uh, we've agreed with the chief executive officer that as of the 30th of June, the recovery committee um, as it currently stands and that in effect the, the, the recovery action plan, um, which leads and guides the discipline of that committee, um, has, reached, has reached a logical conclusion and, uh, and we, should, we should be concentrating now on, uh, on the business as usual, absorbing the, uh, the, the, the continuing work of recovery because it, it, it certainly won't be over um, forever, you know, we've still had an awful lot of work to do, but it's uh, it's well within the capacities, capabilities and competence of um, of the council team to uh, to now take take the uh, take the uh, the load from the committee and to, to wind the committee up as it currently stands. So just before we move from this, this question of um, uh, the way in which you've structured the committee and the, the systems approach or the information systems approach seems to have been um, if I can put it this way, a philosophy that has in, that has informed the way in which you have um, structured 
the arrangement. Is that a fair way of describing it? Uh, very much so, but um, but without without outcomes and and um, and I, I like to say without the verbs, the nouns don't mean much. Um, what I'd like to say is that what I am saying is that because of the way the information flowed, because of the way the recovery action teams rose to the occasion, because of the way we were able to action the things that we were directly in control of and to refer those things that we needed assistance with further uh, further afield, we have achieved a, a sizable and significant um, point in our recovery to the extent where we're well over 90% of, uh, of the properties that needed to be cleared having been cleared. The, um, the, the waste and the debris from those clearances have been processed in, uh, in non-contaminated form through the West Nowra um, Waste um, Management Depot, and over 93% of what was delivered from non-contaminated uh, destroyed housing and, uh, and, and the fire ground has been recycled and repurposed. And so out of the just short of 18,000 tonnes received by the West Nowra Waste Facility, uh, we've been able to, to put all but 250 tonnes uh, back into landfill. So, um, so what I'm saying is 250 tonnes has ended in landfill and the remainder has been recycled. Um, we've also had, a, uh, I think, a very effective callback service running where over 1,000 of the 1,500 registrations of um, Shoalhaven residents um, throughout the bushfire in the early phases, we've been able to get over 1,000 callbacks to those, uh, those residents to see that they're okay, that they're getting the things they need, is there anything else we can help with? Um, and I have those numbers uh, at hand. Of the near 1,000 uh, callbacks, uh, over 700 have been successful contacts, 370 people uh, or thereabouts required no further assistance from Council, 82 cases were required that required additional follow-up, and 100 plus were referred to external agencies, and those numbers are as of the 16th of June. So um, it was it was it was as a result of the recovery committee's focus on being able to to, to move and and manoeuvre where it needed to be to provide the best possible outcome for what is an enormously large area, but a very um, thin population in terms of numbers across that area. Um, we've, we've been able to get to a, a very satisfactory position in the, in the recovery to the extent where I believe, um, as of the 30th of June. Uh, we are in a good position to uh, to to um, migrate the recovery functions to to, uh, to council. So, Mr. Pietro, do you think if you had looking back, if you had a, um, uh, set up the recovery committee in the way that was contemplated by the by the guideline, which is you know 58 boxes or so of uh, of, a, of a structure, would that would you be in the same position today? Um, I, I couldn't. It would be unfair of me to make that conjecture because clearly there are other local government areas which are, um, you know, applying their, their logics and their, their perspectives to the same problem. Some may be very closely aligned to the recovery committees, others may not. And I'm not, I'm not sufficiently aware of, um, of the breadth and depth of, of the variation. Um, but it's fair to say from my perspective, and I believe from the perspective of the Shoalhaven Council team, that what we set up worked very well and it has given us, uh, it has given us a, a very satisfactory outcome. All um, right, now, Mr. Tetra, it is hard for me to see, sorry. Sorry. It is, it is hard for me to see how a multi-layered, many, many um, subcommittee and sub subcommittee and committee structure uh, can function with, to the extent where you can get as much done at the at the coal face as as you can in the in the sort of the, the machinations of, um, of of the committee process. Having said that, there's no doubt that we took great advantage of much good work in those committees because whenever we did refer up through um, through our our rep in the in the, in the Coal Haven committee. We did get very good responses, and we did get very uh, satisfactory outcomes right. from uh, from the uh, from the broader committee process. So it's hard for me to conjecture as to whether or not we would have done any better or any worse. What I do know is that what we did had a great information flow and worked well. All right. Now I've got two other topics I need to take you to, uh, Mr. Pietra, and I also need the commissioners to have an opportunity to um, ask some questions of you to, by way of follow up and additional interest. First is on aid, on the assistance of the ADF. 
there's a summary at SHC 502 001 0020. Question 28. Uh, just under question 28, um, this is an answer to a notice to give from the Commission during the 2019-2020 bushfire season what requests were made to Defence and or the ADF for assistance. And what's identified there is um, uh, requests were made uh, in the following broad categories, uh, quite a range there providing RFS with aviation assistance, clearance of roads, clearance uh, creation and clearance of fire containment lines, placement of temporary bridges, food drops for native wildlife and threatened species, transporting pallets of donated goods, clearing and food debris and so on, repair and clean up and provision of accommodation and meals for overseas and interstate strike teams. What we do have in, also in your, um, the material that's been produced is actually the list, that's just answering it in terms of requests, but as I understand it, those requests were filled. Um, these are DAC requests, that is at a, at essentially at a low level, category one requests, some of them. If we could go to SHC 503 001 um, And I'm not sure if you, I haven't asked you to see if you, if you have um, seen this document before. Um, Mr DiPietro, it goes right through to 0122. Um, During the I've role, seen it, but not in this format. Okay, um, it's quite quite extended. The question I and it may be that it, 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 it's it's beyond. Um, it looks like looks to me like it includes documents that are substantially beyond just uh, Shoalhaven. I'd say so. I'm looking at some of the locations there. Um, they're very much. Yep. There's one on. Uh, further afield. Yeah. If we go to uh, 0119. We can we can see a few from Shoalhaven there, uh, about halfway down the page, and and another one down from there. In the in your role as recovery coordinator, did did you um, initiate DAC requests, and in and in and in doing that, if the, is the answer to that yes or no? No. The um, the DAC requests would be issued or raised by the regional emergency management officer to the ADF liaison officer in the emergency control centre, mm -hmm. and then that would go off to um, to the ADF leadership and command, and it would come back uh, um, as uh, as a task. Um, that was one way in which the ADF responded, but there were others. And in terms of, but in terms of your recovery committee, did you ever identify tasks that you would be assisted by the ADF in the course of the work that was being uh, stood up and actioned by the recovery committee? Yes, we did. And on, uh, from memory, four occasions out of the six weeks that the ADF were present, uh, well, the ground elements of the ADF were present in uh, the Shoalhaven, um, their uh, senior... Um, um, well, their officers attended the recovery committee proper. I see. All right. Um, the other that can be brought down. The um, other matter I had to raise with you was in relation to the recommendations that have been made by um, uh, Shoalhaven Council, and um, it, it may be that you're able to speak to them. I'm not sure. Uh, SHC 503 001053. The question. Sorry, five zero. The Commission received um, 503 001 00, if we could go back to 49, sorry. Um, the Commission received quite extensive submissions from Shoalhaven City Council about matters, including building community resilience. Uh, one of the matters here is uh, microgrids and preparation for the next event, uh, with a recommendation about microgrids and other standalone electricity systems. Um, then the next page to concerning um, uh, investigating the feasibility of a fuel storage facility on the south coast uh, and other recommendations. Uh, also on the earlier page, it won't take us to it, but um, in terms of uh, telecommunications and improvement of telecommunications. How did um, disruptions to telecommunications and uh, um, uh, power and fuel supplies affect the recovery in the Shoalhaven? Um, the, the 
don't believe they they were a huge impact on the recovery once the recovery was in full swing. There is no doubt that power and communications, especially down some of the um, smaller communities to the south and uh, on the coast, the power failures were a significant impact on those communities at the uh, at the heat of the at the peak of the fire. The inability to communicate was also a significant impact. And the reason I can relate that firsthand is because it was certainly a significant point of concern and unhappiness with uh, with the communities represented to us during our recovery um, community meetings. Um, so the, the, there's no doubt that power and communications, isolated areas, are crucial. And when you have very significant restrictions to um, even to access one road in one road out in some of these communities all you need is a big wind or a, or a or, you know there's a thought a car accident into a into a power line or or a fire that burns trees onto onto power lines if there's only one uh, one power source in then, then you're going to lose it and uh, and it's and that happened uh, at many and on many occasions during the fire in the communications context, um, it's a it's a bit of a Rubik's cube of a, of a circumstance, in my view. Um, the reality is that there's a, a very heavy reliance on uh, on masts and, and uh, telecommunication masts, but that also is driven by a market demand, <clears throat> and as such, um, there's not a complete coverage all the way down the coast. And I'm, I'm fairly certain I can say that about a lot of areas in Australia where you lose signal in the, just driving along in your car, um, if you're not the driver. Um, and so, so there's, um, there's, some significant, there's some significant concerns that I, that I have for resilience being based upon not only having access to more reliable communications <coughs> and, and levels of redundancy in both communications and power, but also the ability to build communities to a level where they have a community-led resilience in understanding how to manage those things and how to use them to good effect in extremis. Uh, Chair, I'm conscious of the time and I wanted to leave some time for you commissioners to ask questions of Mr Di Pietro. Appreciate that and we appreciate Mr Di Pietro's evidence this afternoon. I will go to Commissioner McIntosh first. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Mr Di Pietro, for your, for your evidence. Um, in Shellhaven Council's uh, submissions and they're incredibly comprehensive. In multiple locations, there's issues raised about recovery services all the way down. Um, and to me, it speaks of a lack of readiness for an event like this. Um, one of the things we heard early was the proposal to set up a, a standing national acts of God agency, so a standing federal recovery agency. Um, do you think that that sort of idea? has applicability at the state level as well as the federal level in order to ensure that there is a state of readiness? In the ideal, and, and this, is, this is a personal opinion, um, in, in an ideal world, uh, what would be best to have is less moving parts, the better. So if you can work on some methodology that brings together the, the, the resources that we have at our disposal and that we are able to organise effectively and efficiently into one model, whatever whatever that looks like, then I think that would be a, an investment in uh, in success or better 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 outcomes. Perhaps not necessarily success, but certainly better outcomes. Um, it's very difficult to to uh, to put a yes or no answer to that question, um, um, Commissioner McIntosh. And I wish I could, but that it was clear that in my dealings and experience across the recovery, I don't believe I saw anybody that didn't have the very best intentions and, uh, and expectations of success. Um, sometimes the, the varying levels of, of, um, of administration, uh, of um, you know, uh, jurisdiction, um, they certainly can lead to to, uh, to things being perhaps uh, not as not as smooth as they might be. Well, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? But I think, as, as you're suggesting, it's setting up those systems to ensure that processes work better next time. But no further questions from me, Chair. Thank 
Commissioner Bennett. Yes, thank you. I just um, want to get an understanding of one thing. You came in um, at a particular time <coughs> in the Shoalhaven. You brought um, with you your um, uh, unique um, insights and experiences. So, and you've and you've told us now what what sort of systems you put in place. Um, in the recovery phase in the Shoalhaven. I'd be interested in two aspects of that. One is, how good was it when you arrived in terms of dealing with the recovery process? Um, in, in, and how much did you, I guess, how much did you have to change? And, and part of that is because I'd be interested in knowing whether you've shared or been asked to share your model um, with other councils um, in, in New South Wales. Perhaps if I start with the second one, the second question, um, Commissioner Bennett first, and then go back to the back to the first question. The um, I am aware, and I do know that um, uh, Mr. Adams, Dick Adams, the regional recovery coordinator, um, he did share the first draft and the final draft because we went through three or four iterations of the recovery action plan to make sure it could actually work. So we built a little, tested often and learned a lot. Um, and uh, and then when we were ready to go with a, with a plan that we thought would actually work for us, we uh, we, we printed it in uh, in mid-February. Um, and um, and the council, uh, Solheim City Council, unanimously uh, endorsed that approach um, on uh, on the 20th, uh, 20th of, um, of, uh, of January. Um, so I do know that it was shared right, right, widely and uh, I gave uh, every encouragement to do that because if it worked, and again, not one size fits all, but if it worked for various, for other areas, I'd be delighted if, uh, if, they, could, uh, if they could take it to a good advantage. In terms of uh, arriving in the, in the post, I can only say that uh, it was probably one of the most enjoyable and challenging and, uh, and, and rewarding uh, opportunities I think I've had the privilege of enjoying and I've had many. Um, and the reason I say that is because uh, the, the council was, uh, was very supportive. The mayor and the chief executive officer were, as long as, as, long as they, were, they were kept fully engaged and knew exactly what we were trying to achieve and what the outcome of, of something might look like, um, I, can, I cannot fault the uh, level of support that I was, uh, that I was afforded. And really importantly, there's a few folks in the system which uh, which really shone. And uh, the local emergency management officer was terrific, or is terrific. Um, the um, the recovery action team leads were all absolutely focused on getting as much as they could done and getting it off the books as fast as they can to move on to the next challenge. And so was, every, was anything broken? No, I don't think so. Um, was anything uh, was there room for improvement in, in, in things as they as they evolved and unpacked for us? Of course there were, and was it perfect? Probably not. Um, but I do believe that we've achieved a great outcome in a very very sensible and reasonable time. And the proof of uh, of, of the success of, of the um, of the team approach to this uh, is in the fact that most of the folks have had their properties cleared, and uh, and now we're. Uh, we're ready to uh, to move uh, move out with uh, with the resilience and, and the readiness piece for the next bushfire season. Um, very importantly, I think uh, the the um, the approach of, of meeting the rising challenges as they came came up. For example, assisting with trying to mail out letters to each of the registered landowners. We knew they were there because they paid their rates, um, so we wrote to each of them individually to to assist and try and facilitate. The, um, the registration of properties for clearance uh, in the fastest possible time. So there, there, was, a, there was a great deal of, um, of really fantastic work uh, that, that, that just uh, that, that went on. There were things that, that needed uh, some panel beating, but they weren't difficult to, to smooth out once we knew what the uh, what the dimension of the problem was, and more, more importantly, once we knew that once it was a little smoother, what it would actually deliver as we worked more on the basis of understanding and effect than trying to necessarily address every single cause. And I take it that now, from what you've said, even though the, um, your committee may come to an end, as you said, that the, um, the plan itself or the structure itself, is it going to be integrated into the recovery management plan for Shoalhaven for the future? That's a work in progress. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Commissioner Bennett, that's a work in progress with 
part of the resilience work because the council is um, is, uh, is moving towards uh, completing and further developing some community-led resilience work that it's been uh, um, approaching with Griffith University. We're also uh, very conscious of the readiness aspect of um, okay, what does what does the next fire season look like, and are we ready to competent you know to to, comp to um, competently meet that especially if, uh, if we're in some level of, of COVID lockdown, for example. Mm. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of uh, great thinking and great troubleshooting and planning going on. We would love to be in a position to have some early wins on the board in the resilience discussion. Um, and along those lines, things like uh, redundancy in uh, communications and power, those, uh, those are, are actually really, really readily and uh, not all that difficult to achieve. Um, time is, is the uh, time is the enemy. So I think um, I think it's uh, it's it's worked and working well, and I believe that the council is uh, is doing the best it can. Only only one other question, if I may. Um, you're you're doing what you're doing in the Shoalhaven, um, and I've, I've asked you about it being expanded outside. Have you? Um, How has it worked with neighbouring neighbouring shires? Have you um, been working with them to bring? Uh, for the border, when I call, well, now I'm talking about border issues. I don't mean state borders, but but um, shire borders. Have you are you working with them in those areas, and are they taking on some of your methodologies, or how does that? I mean, how does that work in the recovery phase? We, we, we meet um, the, the, the recovery coordinators meet uh, every fortnight. We spend ninety minutes uh, comparing notes. Really, um, I do know that the uh, the chief executive officer is a very active and uh, regular member of the um, of the weekly meeting of all of the general managers and chief executives of all the, uh, the local shires. So they, they work um, and bounce ideas off. So, this, off so just, I don't want to go into the whole detail, but there is a group of the, you are working with the neighbouring shires um, on a regular basis. Yes, and there's, there's also worth mentioning, there's been some terrific support from um, councils further afield uh, the first one that comes to mind is, uh, is Bankstown, which has been um, very generous in, in raising money for uh, for our our, our uh, local government area, okay. and we also had some seconded folks from other councils to come and help in the Shoalhaven from councils that were not affected by fire. No, thank so we had folks from uh, the eastern Sydney, the western Sydney suburbs. Um, it was a, it was a, it was a really uh, it was a collegiate approach. Thank you very much. Just to, dear Phil, just a couple of questions, and I, I'm just interested in whether you, uh, Shoalhaven Council, ever managed to address one of the ones that uh, came up and still comes up around Australia, which is people going to recovery centre and have to tell their story multiple times and diff difficult to track. And I'm wondering if, as your progress, as your process progressed, whether you ever ha ever managed to get around that so people only got to tell their story once, and you could keep that information and then action action it as you needed to across the board. So, um, thanks for the question, Commissioner Vinskin. Um, one, of the, one of the disappointments, and again, I, I have to emphasise that no one set out to do bad things or the wrong thing or inefficient things. But what became very evident early is that the registration process needs some attention. Um, what we had, we, we, we we believed we had a one-stop shop. What we actually had was one geographic location with numerous shop fronts um, where people would have to relive and retell their story at each shop front, depending on which agencies were represented or present at the time in the shop front itself. Um, in effect, I think what we, the, the best description I can give it is that we were effectively running wills and ledgers, but using laptops in support because we didn't get the cross flow of, of information. Ideally, what I would have loved to have seen um, is, you know, with the D21 ticket out of the, like I'm given the delicatessen, and they say, oh, I'm D21, and someone says, oh, you're Vince, I know where you're from, come and sit down. Yep, here we are, we've got your registration. How can we help you? And whereas it was more a matter of every time you went to a new desk, you had to re-register and re-report re, uh, who you were, what you'd suffered, and so on. The other complication that came with that was that there was very little avenue and there was significant discussion, and I don't think we ever achieved it, was that due to the privacy uh, provisions uh, of sharing uh, data, um, 
each of those agencies would hold that data close and near and wouldn't share it more broadly because effectively they weren't allowed to. Now, there's a couple of observations I'd make. Um, uh, perhaps perhaps there's, a, there's, a, there's a great opportunity to use the one registration at, at the entry, at the portal, and then have all of the agencies represented being able to have access to that person's name and address and what they're actually there to, uh, to, to seek. And then almost run on every registration like a like a like a grid that just says this address has been has applied for and sought this 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 and this. Um, if you roll that into uh, a couple of other aspects like the differences between opting in and opting out, um, there's 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 other ways perhaps of uh, getting a more efficient um, ability to get to the cleanup quicker. Um, equally, uh, I think it's important that. The registration process perhaps could have made more use of the capabilities and capacities of local government um, because there was a lot of things being asked at the registration process which local government may have been able to help with an awful lot sooner and perhaps even without even asking for all the registration details. Um, by way of example, in the early days uh, through the registration uh, process at the Ulladulla Recovery Centre, and I have the hard copy of the form here in front of me, um, people would register, but nowhere on the registration forms until about six weeks in, you would actually ask if you were the registered landowner. So what we would end up with is about 16 or 1,700 registrations, knowing that we only had 309 dwellings destroyed, which makes it very inefficient as the next stage, because then what you've got to do is you, to find those 309, effectively you'd have to go through 1,700 or 1,800 entries. So... Did, there, there, there were certainly there were certainly ways that it could have been um, smoother, and for the amount of effort that had been put in, if it had been presented slightly more smoothly or, or in a different way, where we, we registered once and plugged in as required, um, a lot of the horsepower could have been brought to bear, and, and away from just the registration process into the actual getting things uh, out and and, uh, and away would probably have been, been a, bit, um, a, bit, a bit sharper. I appreciate that uh, that insight. And, and I have one more question, then I know we need to, to move on. You mentioned then the clean-up phase, and I understand there are issues, a similar thing in a registration for clean-up, and then whether people were in or out, whether they, quali sorry, whether they qualified for it or whether they didn't, and then there was no comeback on a decision that might have been made, I think, by the contractor. Is that... That correct, and that that created a lot of angst that needed sorting out. Um, there, there, there was um, going back a bit. It was an opt-in system, not an opt-out system. So, in other words, the onus was entirely on uh, on the cleaner and the cleaners to find the clients and to approach them to get the deed signed to get the clean up started. Um, and I know that there is other 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 considerations, but an opt out may may have been, given the the, the incredible breadth and depth of the clean up operation required, maybe an opt out may have been a smarter way to go. But having said that, opt in uh, was was nonetheless the the preferred method. Now, I do know that in the Shoalhaven, we had over 900 uh, registrations. Of those 900, 424 were deemed to be in scope. Now, what might, what might have made a property not be in scope would be things like either multiple registrations, um, the registrations were probably only including fencing or outbuildings or, um, or, um, or the like. So from the 916 down to the 424, um, that was a, a very much an assessment by the contractors as to what was deemed to be in scope as, a, as they were contracted to deliver. Now, there was a way of, uh, of, of, of appealing, a small a appealing that process where you could actually ask to be revisited. And I am aware of at least three um, in the last three or four weeks that did go down that path and did receive very good and favourable attention. And uh, to the extent where one of those three rang me to say that the cleanup had been well beyond their wildest expectation. And, uh, and, and interestingly, that person did not lose their home. Their home was significantly damaged because he had sprinklers and things set up on the inside. But the, uh, but the cleanup did revisit and did 
clear up of, um, I think it was 12 or 13 trees which had been felled um, and were effectively impeding um, access on his own block. So, um, so there was a, there was a way of, uh, of revisiting with the New South Wales state government, and when uh, when that was uh, when that was approached, um, I think people people got good, good hearings. Uh, thank you. As uh, Commissioner Bennett said, a lot of lessons identified out of this. We need to turn them into lessons learnt. I appreciate your evidence today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it, Miss Hogan Doran. Uh, that's all for Mr Pietro. We thank you for your assistance. Uh, may he be released from his summons. Of course he may be released from his summons. Thank you, Mr B D Pietro. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Commissioner. Thank you. I think we'll take a break now until... I think we're down for a break, yes. Uh, quarter past. Uh, let's go down to 20 past. All right. OK, nice try. 15.20. <laughs> thank you. All rise. The Royal Commission has adjourned until 3.20 p.m.
The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Ms Hogan Doran, let's continue, please. Uh, this afternoon, we have a panel of local government associations from South Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, and also the National Peak Body, uh, ALGA. I call Matthew Pinnegar, Robin Daly, Andrew Johnson from South Australia, Troy Edwards, Emma Lake from Victoria, Kelly Kwan, Sean McBride from New South Wales, and Adrian Beresford Wiley from ALGA. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I don't have a document identifying who's. Do you? Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll just go around the uh, the gallery. Uh, Mr. Edwards, you take an oath or affirmation. Affirmation, please. Mr. Edwards, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Ms. Lake, I understand you'll affirm. Ms. Lake, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. Beresford, Wiley, I understand you'll affirm. Yes, I will. Mr. Beresford, Wiley, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Ms. Kwan, will you uh, take an oath or affirm? Uh, affirmation, please. Ms. Kwan, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Mr. McBride, oath or affirmation? Affirmation, thank you. Mr. McBride, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Ms. Daly, oath or affirmation? Uh, affirmation, thank you. Ms. Daly, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. Pinnegar, I understand you'll affirm. That's correct. Mr. Pinnegar, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And Dr Johnson, will you affirm or take an oath? I will affirm. Dr Johnson, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. That's everyone, uh, Commissioners. Um, just to set the scene, if I may, may I begin with you, Mr Beresford Wiley. You're the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Local Government Association, which I'll refer to as ALGA. Um, you provided a submission... Sorry, a response to a notice to give information dated 15 June 2020. I have that brought up, LGA 501 001 0001. One of the questions that we raised with uh, you, your association was, if we go to the next page, um, to indicate the ways in which the financial or structural capacities of local governments vary in relation to prepare, preparation for response to and recovery from natural disasters. Um, you identified in that response in the first paragraph that there are 537 local governments which make up the third tier of government in the Australian Federation. Uh, in the next paragraph, in the first two lines, you identify that the local government areas vary in population size, area, and geophysical characteristics. Uh, you also identify that their remoteness is also a relevant factor. The last two paragraphs on that page, you identify issues in relation to revenue, uh, that the revenue base for um, local governments is, uh, in terms of their rates, 
uh, fees and charges. In the last paragraph, you identify local government raises only 3.6% of Australia's tax revenue, but has responsibility for managing 33% of public infrastructure. And you go on in that paragraph to identify restrictions on the ability of local governments to raise revenue, uh, and also on the next page, some issues concerning uh, revenue suppression, uh, and also um, culminating in the conclusion in the second paragraph that all of these factors have significant implications for local governments' ability to respond to and assist their communities during crises, including natural disasters and pandemics. And then making the observation that rural and regional councils um, have even further issues. Um, that's, that's picking up quite a number of, of, of factors at once, but how does local government, just speaking um, from this point of where we are, post the 29-2020 uh, bushfires, with all of the recovery obligations and the resilience initiatives that would sought to be pursued by the different councils that we've heard about over the last few days, um, how does this financial matrix um, take us to that point or take us past that point? I think I've, uh, I was asked for a, to, to well, in a sense, the, uh, the association was asked to present a high level view. Uh, and the high level view is, as we put it, it's a challenging um, uh, environment that all councils face in terms of the financial resources that they have available to them, to, them, to deal with the issues that have come up uh, in terms of the bushfires, uh, and in addition to that, in terms of uh, the pandemic. The pandemic, of course, has, uh, has depressed the revenues <coughs> of many councils, um, especially some uh, unexpected uh, uh, revenue depression in terms of major metropolitan councils, which have additional revenue sources uh, through things like parking, which, uh, uh, as we know, the inner cities have closed down. They've been severely impacted. Councils, obviously, will do the best they can with the resources that they have available to them. Um, there are mechanisms for receiving funding support from other levels of government, uh, and in particular the federal government through the, the disaster recovery funding arrangement. Um, councils will, will incur uh, expenditures uh, and seek to get uh, reimbursement of those expenditures through their states, uh, as long as their eligible expenditures are being undertaken by eligible enterprises. Um, they'll make submissions of, uh, of statements of expenditure to, uh, to their state governments, uh, and those might come through to, provided the state government agrees, provide those to the to the Commonwealth. Um, but councils will just have to manage, I think the, the view has been put forward, to be honest, uh, in the in the pandemic from the federal government, councils will have to manage, in a sense, as best they can uh, with the, the resources that they have. They're expected to, where they can, to borrow. Um, they're expected, where they can, to run down reserves if those reserves are, are able to be used uh, for general expenditures. Uh, but in a sense, uh, in these cases, it's, it's all hands to the pump for all levels of government, and that includes local government. Has there been any, um, one of the roles, or the, one of the principal roles that ALGA has is as a policy and advocacy body on behalf of local government across Australia, as, as I understand it, is that correct? Yes, that is. Has there been any, um, I've just talk, uh, drawn attention to the revenue side, has there been any contemplation of, in a sense, handing back the responsibilities or transferring back the risk to the state governments if there's not going to be a revenue platform in which to engage with or, engage with or deliver on these responsibilities that have been delegated to local government? Um, at, at a national level, that's not a debate we, we have engaged in or, or probably would engage. It's really a matter for individual councils. Uh, to look at, uh, at what they are able to do. Of course, um, their roles, my state colleagues will speak more fully on this, I suspect, are, are set out in, in state legislation. Um, but, but individual councils must uh, must do what they can uh, to meet their obligations under uh, that, uh, that legislation. There may be some opportunities for councils uh, to, to delay expenditures in their uh, uh, infrastructure investment um, and transfer those funds uh, to, to current and recurrent costs. Uh, but I'm, I'm not aware and wouldn't necessarily expect to be aware of individual councils considering what they're able to do and how flexible they can be in meeting their responsibility. Well, perhaps I might take this. I will come back to you for, uh, later, uh, Mr Beresford-Wiley, because I do have a number of matters I want to take uh, up with you further. Um, 
if I could go first to what I want to do now is do a quick whip around to um, to each of the associations that are here, the state state associations, to provide a sense first to the commissioners of the number of local government areas in each state and their distribution. If I might start with um, South Australia, uh, and I have LGASA 500-001-0001 at page 0047 shown. Um, this is from uh, the LGA submission, and indeed it's part of the um, uh, uh, Local Government Emergency Management Framework adopted by the LGA Board of Directors uh, on July, in July 2019. These are the emergency um, management zones in South Australia. Um, it doesn't... I don't have a document that identifies the... Uh, the LGAs that are the subsets that make um, that are parts of this, but as I understand it, um, perhaps uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Daly, um, the LGAs in South Australia um, are, are organised by within these 11 emergency management zones as part of the emergency management framework. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Um, yes, that, that's right. There are 68 uh, councils, local governments in South Australia, and they're divided into those um, different zones. All right. Um, we'll just see if we can also have that uh, uh, audio um, cleared up a little. It was a quite echoing there. But just while we're looking at that map, um, the the map or the 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 map to the to the in the bottom left hand quadrant is of the. Uh, Adelaide city area or, or suburban or urban area, is that right? If you could yes. see it. <laughs> see, sorry about that, but yeah. And, the, and the, there we go. So we see northern, western, eastern Adelaide and southern Adelaide. And then to the right, the Adelaide Hills and the Florio and Kangaroo Island Emergency Management Zone. Um, the evidence before the Commission so far has been that the fires have been in that Adelaide Hills area and, of course, in Kangaroo Island. Um, but the rest of the areas, the emergency management zones, um, identified that map of South Australia are essentially rural um, zones. Is that right? That's right, yes. That's correct. Um, so we now go to Victoria, RCNs 900 025 0002. And uh, Ms. Mm -hmm. Ms. Lake, what we see here is the statewide uh, distribution of LGAs in Victoria. Is that right? Correct, Ms. Hogan. During this, 79 councils in Victoria, 31 in the metro region, and the remainder in rural and regional Victoria. Um, Commissioners, I can show you triple uh, zero one, which is the metro region. So I've just shown you the Adelaide metro region. I'm now showing you the Victorian metro region. If we can go back to the statewide, um, the statewide uh, distribution. Uh, you also have as a subset of your membership the from the um, Municipal Association of Victoria has has there's another body which is Rural Councils of Victoria is that right? Uh, correct, Miss Hogan Doran. Uh, in this case, Rural Councils of Victoria represents those smaller councils and groupings of councils with particular characteristics do come together from time to time. All right, and the. Um, and the uh, last one I want to show you, Commissioners, just to orientate you, is New South Wales, LGN 500 001 0001 0029, which should be showing you the New South Wales 128 local government areas. Ms Kwan? Yes, that's correct. We have 128. Um, in now, Commissioners, what I want to show you about this map is that it identifies, it has more detail in it relevant to your inquiries. Uh, in the yellow, towards the left, uh, to the west of the of the state, identifies drought-affected um, local government areas. Uh, the red portions are the bushfire-affected ones, which are the subject of a natural disaster declaration for the purposes of the DRFA. Um, and then the ones that are in a sort of a brown uh, colour are both bushfire and drought affected. Um, is that an accurate uh, description, Ms Kwan? That's correct. All right. um, and I think there's a, 
an additional map uh, double zero double uh, double zero three zero, which is showing the metro. That's correct. Yeah. All right. Um, this is identifying the bushfire affected metropolitan councils as at March 2020, and what we can see is uh, Penrith to the left, Sutherland to the south, and Karingai, which is in the northern suburbs of Sydney. That's correct. Right. And are each of those, sub it says natural disaster declaration, so even though they're within the metropolitan region, they have been declared um, bushfire, uh, natural disaster declarations have been made. That's correct. All right. Yes. All right. Now, um, commissioners, if you want to go and ask me questions about those, we can have that, um, uh, we can return to those. So if I could just go back to the group of you now. Um, we commenced these hearings with evidence from the Local Government Association of Queensland that indicated that local government arrangements in Queensland have the following key features. The first is that local councils have primary responsibility for emergency management. The second is that the peak body LGAQ has a central role in decision making at the highest levels. And the third is that LGAQ has a permanent workspace in the State Disaster Coordination Centre. What I would like to do is to go to each of you in turn, each state in turn, and ask you to compare the position of your association to the Queensland model. Um, and as I'm doing that, I'm going to identify to the commissioners the roles as they're described. Um, South Australia, if I could go to you first, if we could have LG LSA, sorry, LSA 500-001-0155. Now, this is an extract from what I understand to be uh, the South Australian Local Government Functional Support Group Plan. I'm not quite sure if that's still only in draft or whether it's been adopted, but it then goes into describing the State Emergency Management Plan structure and identifying the responsibilities of um, LGASA as part of, of that structure. Now, I'm not sure which one of you would be the best would be best placed to speak to that, um, uh, Ms. Daly, Mr. Pinnegar, or Dr. Johnson. I'll speak to that council, Matt Pinnegar. Sorry, Mr. Pinnegar, you're the chief executive officer of LGA SA. So, when Mark does against the uh, LGA Q role, does Local councils in South Australia have primary responsibility for emergency management under the existing framework? Uh, no, they don't. In South Australia, it's a, a shared responsibility. Um, there are some legislative uh, requirements over a range of acts, including the Local Government Act, um, which uh, prescribes the roles of local governments. Um, the uh, page that you're referring to is uh, an extract from the State Emergency Management Plan, which also makes up part of the local government uh, functional support group uh, plan. And this uh, page outlines what the responsibilities are for the local government association under that State Emergency Management Plan, which is a state plan. So LGASA is a representative on the State Emergency Management Committee. Now, as I understand it, that's the committee that prepares and maintains the State Emergency Management Plan. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. That is a committee made up of, uh, headed by the Department of Premier and Cabinet. Um, it has the heads of all of the control agencies in South Australia, including the police, uh, the country fire service, metropolitan fire service, etc., and also the heads of uh, all of the key state government departments and also the LGA. And what role does the LGASA have in relation to uh, the Local Government Emergency Management Framework? So under the State Emergency Management Plan, um, the Local Government Association operates as a local government functional support group. Um, so we have a range of obligations which uh, include um, uh, assisting uh, state control agencies during an emergency, um, which includes managing the, uh, uh, manning the state uh, emergency centre uh, and playing a, a, a coordination and communication role um, with uh, local governments uh, during an emergency. Um, we also have a role 
on the State Emergency Management Committee, which is one that I sit on, and there may be various subcommittees that sit under the State Emergency Management Committee that we will also uh, provide uh, input into. Just under item K there, we see establish and maintain fit for purpose state command centre capability. Is that is that in a, is that the same thing as as LGAQ, which is, you know, having a workspace in effect or in the state disaster coordination centre? Are they essentially the same, essentially similar? Yes, they are. They're, they're, they're the same thing. Right. So that that is a, a state-run uh, facility. When there's an emergency, um, we will man that facility on behalf of the local government functional support group. All right. Thanks so much, Mr. Pinnegar. All right. Could I now go to um, MAV, the Victorian uh, Association, Municipal Association of Victoria? Now. Um, Mr Edwards, you're the Director of Policy and Advocacy and Ms Lake, you're the Manager of Emergency Management Policy. And that document can be brought down. In terms of the Victorian um, arrangements, do local councils have the primary responsibility for emergency management in Victoria? In Victoria, local government's in, responsible for the Municipal Emergency Management Plan where their role is, is to facilitate a multi-agency multi planning for emergencies. Uh, which brings together the various players across uh, the state to respond to a natural disaster. All right, so that sort of shared responsibility as opposed so very to, to the content. lead. Right. Uh, the peak body, uh, you're, you as the peak body, do you have what role do you have in the decision-making uh, uh, framework? So the MAV is integrated into the, into the state's emergency management structures uh, and we perform an important role not just in liaising between local government and the state government, but influencing decision making and assisting with that. Uh, in many ways, the features will be similar to LGAQ and uh, Local Government Association of South Australia, where we sit on the State Crisis and Resilience Council as the peak uh, Victorian public sector body. Uh, I'll just have that brought up. Mental. I'll just have that brought up to assist uh, the commissioners. MAU 500-001-0026 at. Uh, I think we'll start at 28, but we may go over to 3.0. So within that straight crisis and resilience council structure, the MAV then, similar to uh, no, Queensland, when there is an emergency on, we will be involved through a state control team and state emergency management team structures in the state control centre here in Victoria, uh, where we will again seek to liaise and influence the state through the response to an emergency. All right. And what about, uh, you may have said it when I wasn't uh, listening well enough, um, what about in terms of the, the command or the state control centre? Um, it, it looked like in paragraph 17 on that page, on, on page, yes, thank you, operator, that you did have a secondment of that council office into, into the state control centre um, uh, in the last summer. Could you just speak to that? Correct. So there's probably two elements there, Mr Hogan Dawn. One is the uh, representation on the state emergency team uh, and being involved there. And then secondly, in the state relief and recovery team, where during the 1920 bushfires, we were able to work with emergency management of Victoria and place uh, two council officers into the straight control team to act as a liaison point to assist with secondary uh, assessment processes, which is a significant function for local government, but also to act as a liaison to the MAV. And uh, as you can see there, that's something that I think both EMV and local government found quite useful and we'll be looking to replicate that into the future. And paragraph 14, uh, you're also a member of Victoria's Emergency Management Joint Public Information Committee, uh, comprising senior communications officers from agencies and organisations across Australia. Um, this talks about um, discussions, but is it more than just discussions? So, Ms. Hagen, during, during a during an emergency like the bushfires or indeed COVID, we sit on that MJ PIC, uh, as it's referred to, uh, which brings together Victoria's um, state departments and agencies. And that's really about ensuring that all councils have a flow of information related to particular incidents. We're also able to feed information through that. I think, uh, you know, one of the great challenges during any emergency is the appropriate flow of information. So, again, that, that's a critical form for local government uh, to be kept across how emergencies are rolling out, and that's the role that the MAV fills in liaising with the 79 members. 
All right. Now, there's other matters on that page that I'm going to return to, but if that could be brought down, and I'll just now um, go through to New South Wales. Um, now, uh, Ms Kwan, Mr McBride, Ms, um, Ms Kwan, you're the Executive Director of Advocacy at Local Government um, at the uh, Association, and Mr McBride, you're the Chief Economist, but I understand you have other roles as well. If you could just speak to what those other roles are, Mr McBride, just in shorthand. My primary, uh, well, the primary responsibilities revolve around local government finance and economics. Um, but that also uh, drags me into quite a number of other areas uh, that require either you know, financial or uh, economic input, including planning and uh, delivery of other services and so on. Uh, and I am involved in a number of the emergency sorts, particularly bushfire-related uh, uh, advisory and consultative committees. Now, in relation to those, as you say, Ms Kwan um, and Mr McBride, um, going back to those three key features compared to Queensland and, and to the other states that we've just been through, um, local councils don't have a primary responsibility for emergency management in New South Wales, that's right? That's correct. It's a shared responsibility for the Council Natural Disaster Responsibilities are broadly set out in our State Emergency and Rescue Management Act and expanded on through the State Emergency Management Plan that's established under the Act. Uh, so local go uh, uh, councils uh, you know, admit, uh, chair local emergency management committees and recovery committees and the like, uh, but they don't have a primary responsibility. Right, and if we could go to LGN 500-001-0040, um, it lists the, the range of committees that um, LGE New South Wales participates in. Is it fair to say that in comparison to Queensland that um, LG New South Wales does not sit as at, as at higher level um, of the de central decision-making roles in relation to in the context of emergency management? That's correct. So Local Government New South Wales sits on a range of, of committees and subcommittees, including the State Emergency Management Committee, um, but these are generally advisory committees. Um, in New South Wales, we're not part of the State Emergency Operations Centre. Um, these functions in New South Wales are generally undertaken by the Office of Local Government rather than Local Government New South Wales. So that that's the State um, Department or Office? Yes, the, the um, New South Wales Office of Local Government is responsible for the regulation of uh, local government in All right, thank you. If we could just have that brought down. Now, in relation to um, what do I understand now? We've, looked, we've sort of looked at the looking up. I want to understand what assistance your association provides to your members in relation to disaster management before, during and after. South Australia, if I can go back to you, the Council Ready Program is something that's referred to in your materials uh, in, relation, in relation to identifying um, uh, or doing a stock take, as I understand it, of the approaches to emergency management uh, by the 68 councils who participated in that program. Could you just summarise for the commissioners to understand what's the, what that program is and, and where it got you or got your member councils um, as, they, as they face the 2019-2020 bushfire season? Uh, council, so council ready and, uh, and I respond to, um, is based on lessons learned from uh, previous events. Uh, so when there is an emergency event such as a bushfire in South Australia, there, was, there has always been a review. Um, there were some fires called the Wangari bushfires in 2005, uh, which, in which there were deaths and considerable devastation um, in the Air Peninsula of South Australia. And there was a review done there with, in conjunction with the state uh, government uh, and uh, other organisations, control agencies such as the CFS, and that's what led to uh, I Responder. Um, and from there, and from other events that have occurred in South Australia, um, but it has also led to the Council Ready Program, um, which is co-funded through the National Disaster Resilience Program, uh, and also through the Local Government Association Mutual Liability Schemes. Just pausing there, Mr Pendigo, what I'm going to do is have LSA 500 001 0008 brought up. 
Um, this part of your uh, response identifies the objectives of the program uh, and what it aims to do. The Council Ready Program aims to support councils, clarify roles, facilitate strategic whole of council approaches, enable consistent approaches to emergency management and support councils to increase community awareness of risk and build community resilience. Um, it's identified to be in two stages. Stage one, uh, that time has passed. Stage two, we're in that. Where are you now in relation to stage two? Uh, in stage two, which is the development of, uh, of plans, um, we're in a situation where I understand this uh, well over 50 uh, plans have been um, uh, completed uh, and uh, the program anticipates that all uh, plans will be completed by the end of next year. And I note on page 0009 at the bottom there's no direct count costs for councils to participate in this program? Yeah, that's correct. Um, this program is offered uh, to councils um, and uh, my information is that they've all taken up the program, that, that they may be at different stages of having completed their emergency plans. And you mentioned iResponder. If we could go over to 0011, uh, question five. The iResponder platform. What's the iResponder platform? It's a, it's a platform which uh, we ask um, uh, councils to use in making decisions about how they get involved in emergency response to ensure that it's done in a, um, in a safe way uh, for uh, staff uh, in, in, in order to uh, support control uh, agencies uh, during emergency operations. So really it sets out uh, checklists of things that um, local government staff should be doing and considering uh, before acting in an emergency. Now, I don't want to pass this, probably a convenient time for me just to pause on this page. Um, you mentioned in your earlier evidence that it was initial, that this Get Ready program, Council Ready program was uh, partly funded by the uh, National Dis Disaster Resilience Program. Uh, you identify here on the second last paragraph that it continues to be endorsed by the Mutual Liability Scheme, Asset Mutual Fund and the Workers' Compensation Scheme. Dr Johnson, uh, you have a key role in relation to those schemes. You're the Chief Executive Officer um, of LGASA Mutual. Um, if you could just... We heard some evidence from uh, LGA Queensland in relation to the mutual... Uh, insurance and assurance schemes that they run up there. Uh, is that a similar scheme in South Australia? Uh, yes. Uh, while each state have a slightly different scheme, uh, by and large they do a similar role. And one of the aspects of the platform uh, in the first line, I respond to executive, a risk-based policy process supported by LGASA mutual schemes. Um, is this is this geared towards is I respond to geared to um, identifying so I'll start that again I'm not sure whether it's I responder or whether it's the schemes themselves that deals with the risk uh, to the risk risk um, to public infrastructure or other council assets that are in um, the control or ownership of council. Um, is that managed as part of this iResponder platform or is it only, so, so to speak, insured through your mutual schemes? Yeah, the iResponder platform is more looking at personnel and managing staff to ensure that they're operating safely uh, in an emergency, that they have the right risk management framework that uh, guides them through that. All right, I see. Um, now... Uh, the, if I could just leave South Australia for a moment and go across to Victoria. Victoria has been uh, going through a similar, as I understand it, Mr Edwards and Ms Lake, going through a similar kind of capability and capacity review uh, uh, on, on a joint basis um, with the uh, the Victorian state government. To what extent is that is that um, uh, review what point has it reached? Um, you make some observations in your submissions that phase three appears to have been delayed. I'm not sure whether that has changed since your original submission. That's at page 41. 
um, and how it compares to what was going on in South Australia. So um, local government Victoria, which is a part of the state government, run the Councils and Emergency Project. It's a three-phase project. Uh, the first was to look at the role of councils in emergency management. We contributed to that phase through submissions. The second phase, which finished in December 2019, was an evaluation of Victorian councils against the responsibilities that were documented in phase one. So a report, an evaluation report was produced in or circulated in December 2019. The third stage is um, hasn't started yet. You're right, it's been delayed by both the bushfires and now COVID-19. And that's supposed to look at support strategies and strategies to address the gaps that have been identified through the evaluation in phase two. Now, um, the way that that uh, report uh, evaluated um, uh, participating councils was to identify whether or not they were what, what was the maturity, so to speak, of the council's uh, systems by reference to different core capabilities? And if we could go to RCN 900 013 0056 and have the table shown to the commissioners, table 32. Is that, that, a, that, is a, that summary of the methodology correct, Ms Lake? Yeah, that's, it's based on the um, capability framework that the state government has developed. Right. It's a preparedness framework. So the the responsibilities and activities that were documented in phase one of the councils and emergencies project were categorised against each of those, and then councils were evaluated. So um, just speaking generally, um, councils were either uh, uh, two thirds of councils were on or above target when it came to evaluating their core capability of planning and intelligence and information sharing, and relief assistance, fire management and suppression. Uh, then, um, uh, but less than, uh, less than a third uh, were, um, on, were on or above target in terms of their economic recovery and impact assessment and uh, about a third for built recovery. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the report did show that there were capability and capacity gaps and room for improvement across a range of, range of areas. Um, the maturity model approach was, was something that we recommended um, because it does recognise that there are some uh, core responsibilities of councils and then depending on the resources available to the council and its risk profile, the, um, there may be some additional work that goes um, on beyond those core capabilities or core responsibilities. And if I could just, just, I'll just have drawn to the Commissioner's attention, um, page 65 and 66, just those uh, counts, those, um, 77% of councils being below target on their uh, maturity uh, for a number of range of matters. This is the bottom three on that page and then the rest on the page 66. It's a bit hard to follow from the, um, <laughs> from the way, but um, uh, the, they, they, they do very much seem to be in the recovery uh, area of um, that maturity is very strong, it, at least across councils, uh, in the planning phase and even in the response phase, but less so in the recovery phase. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, that was one of the, the key areas for improvement and capability and capacity gaps identified through the assessment. So that was identified as at December last year. Um, That's right. Those, those concerns as to the maturity of the council um, capabilities in terms of recovery, are you seeing that borne out in the recovery ability of these councils to be able to support local recoveries since the 2019-2020 bushfire experience? Oh. Mr. Fondre, and I, I think that's a fair assessment and I would 
note that the state government's moved to establish Bushfire Recovery Victoria as a standing agency within the Department of Premier and Cabinet, of which uh, MAV's represented on the, the Premier's advisory panel and also on one of the working groups was, a, I think, in many ways a key uh, move to try and deal with the recovery and ensure that those communities can benefit from that uh, connection to the state and the funding that flows from that, but also uh, commits to the long-term time commitment required for recovery. All right. Um, the other matter I want to take you to is something that was referred to on that first page, uh, uh, which was the intercouncil resource sharing protocol. Uh, if I could have MAU 500-001-0039 and 40 um, brought up. Now, um, this protocol for intercouncil emergency management resource sharing uh, has been around for some time, it seems. Paragraph 69 indicates it was in 2007. Um, uh, we've heard evidence today of resource sharing between councils um, in, many, in many states, uh, and we've also heard it uh, in a sense of metropolitan councils supporting councils in rural and um, regional areas. Um, am I right in understanding, though, that this is a formalised process, a process that has already been established and, and, so to speak, refined and tested over time? Yes, that's correct, Ms Hogan-Doran. The resource protocol uh, was developed through uh, MEMEG, the Municipal Emergency Management Group, a number of years back with a view of trying to connect council-to-council uh, -council resource requirements, and I think uh, was referred to in LGAQ's evidence on Monday. I think they simply call it uh, C2C, reference council-to-council. -council. Um, you, know, you know, I would make the observation that you know, the fire, um, the relief and recovery tasks from the 1925s far exceeded the capacity of the councils involved to deliver that. Um, they received a significant amount of support from unaffected councils across Victoria, and, and you've noted metropolitan councils playing a big role in that, and, you know, that professionalism and expertise, I think, was well received. Um, many of the, Much of the support around the protocol uh, generally happens in a kind of cascaded way where you have regional emergency management clusters that have been established by council as the kind of first port of call. Um, you then have opportunities for direct council to council engagement and you heard Taolong today, Ms Pagan, refer to the links that they had with Darabin as part of that. Then you have the resource sharing protocol where uh, assisting councils can provide resource direct to affected councils and um, often the case, it's often the case in an emergency, and this year was no different where, you know, I understand many CEOs were offering assistance to the impacted council CEOs very quickly in that process. And then in addition to the protocol, you also have, you know, some, you know, I suppose the, the last stage of the MAV doing some brokering of particular areas of expertise to impacted councils as well. There's generally that kind of cascaded approach as part of that. So, as I understand, just so I understand it, the the resource sharing protocol work is designed to go be on a council to council basis. So, a little bit like um, LGAQ talked about the C to C program, and then MAV uh, is essentially the custodian of that protocol and refining that protocol. But paragraph seventy five and page um, forty says that as a direct result of the 2019-2020 bushfires the MAV developed an online human resource sharing database to assist requesting councils in ex accessing offices of support. And I'll come to wherever it is expanded below. But is is that, was that, um, you say it's a direct result, is that filling a gap or was it filling a problem that was identified in the course of the 2019-2020 bushfires? Yeah. So perhaps if I just expand on that a bit, Council, mm -hmm. I mean, the scale of the fires um, led to significant offers of support from Victoria's uh, councils, and we felt at the time that the only way we could kind of marshal the support offers was to put in place a, an online portal to allow impacted councils to connect to. So I guess it was uh, it was a little bit of um, a reaction from a particular need that came up, and part of that need was marshalling the extent of the offers that were, were flowing through to both the impacted councils and to the MAV from, from CEOs offering a wide range of support, everything from emergency management, expertise through to communications, building practitioners and the like. Um, that resource, uh, the database now has something in the range of 420, 430 offers from 54 councils across the full range of 
uh, functions in local government. So that, you know, so we're hoping that that'll continue to be a resource that we'll be able to um, enhance the protocol that exists in, in future emergencies as well. Uh, it's worth noting that um, there's something like 100 officers were deployed off that database in 200 rotations through uh, through the 1925s. Um, last matter I wanted to raise with you, you also talk about um, MAV holding a contract for crisis works, which is an incident management system used by local government. Um, uh, how has that been sort of um, expanded or is, was it expanded and used in the 2019-2020 bushfires and to what end? So CrisisWorks is the incident management software that most Victorian councils use. They, in response, it's used to track requests and, um, and manage rosters and log offers. And in recovery, it's used for case management, damage assessments, and that sort of thing, including secondary impact assessment. Mm -hmm. Because most councils are familiar with crisis works already and the MAV through MAV procurement hold the, the master contract, we worked with the developers of crisis works to uh, really quickly establish the human resource sharing database. So it meant that councils already had logins and they could log offers directly. They didn't have to email them through to the MAV for us to put them in the database. They could have access. Um, and then the affected councils, um, while it does have the capacity for them to go in directly get offers, the way we um, worked with them was that we, when we received a request from an affected council, we would pull a list of appropriate offers off our database and sent it to them so that they could work through the finer details and make sure that they were the right people were being deployed. So there's some element, uh, I wouldn't say brokering, but there was some element of facilitation by MAV. Yes, it was a facilitation role. It wasn't a rostering or straight deployment coordination role. I see. Um, if I can go now to New South Wales. Um, uh, does, does LGNSW or alternatively is it the New South Wales Office of Emergency Management um, operate or facilitate uh, resource sharing in any formal sense as between councils on a council to council basis or across, across groups of councils? In response to the most recent bushfires and you know, as the scale of the recovery effort became clear, Local Government New South Wales worked with the New South Wales Office of Emergency Management, New South Wales Office of Local Government, City of Sydney and the Sydney Resilience Office to establish the Local Government Bushfire Recovery Support Group. So that group was uh, assisted council disaster recovery by coordinating council to council support. Um, and forms of assistance included things like records offices, planners, engineering staff, work crews and media and communication staff. Um, and so that was hosted by City of Sydney as they had an existing system that we could leverage. Um, and our role was to help to establish uh, the system and how it might work and contributing to FAQ documents for councils and also using our networks to encourage councils to both request support and, and to offer support. In terms of um, the numbers we received through that um, group, over 560 offers of support. Um, the completed number of deployments through the group um, as it stands is over 50. Um, we're still receiving some requests for support. Um, have much of the work remained on hold, you know, remains on hold because of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but that was something that we, uh, through our participation um, in the various subcommittees, recognised was a bit of a gap and so we worked very closely with those New South Wales government agencies and the City of Sydney to set that up and it's been very warmly welcomed from both um, councils that have needed the support and also councils that were unaffected that wanted to offer support and resources to you know hit the ground running and to be able to support those councils in their recovery. I might just move, I'll stay with you, Ms Kwan, and, and, and direct you to opportunities for improvement of coordination, which I'll ask all the panel. I'm going to look at horizontally and then I'm going to look vertical, if I may describe it in that way. Can we have LGN 500 001 0051 
which is Volume 4, Tab 4, Commissioners. Um, this is the list of recommendations that LGNSW has identified for consideration by the Commissioners, and the Commissioners may have questions in relation to other ones. Um, I just have two that I want to ask them. Um, recommendation 15, which we can't see yet. Here we go. Um, the last one you mentioned is that uh, the New South Wales Government consider how it can support and reintroduce, when necessary, the successful recovery model pioneered by the Local Government Bushfire Recovery Support Group. Um, to what extent is uh, was the support group um, uh, supported by uh, state or Commonwealth um, resources or funding, or was it all entirely done by councils and LG NSW? Uh -huh. The Office of Emergency Management and Office of Local Government were actively involved um, in the program. So they offered they um, had they offered resourcing to support the group. Um, I am not unclear if there was funding involved. I don't think that there was funding. Um, it was more in kind in kind support. So staffing to be able to look at the offers and be able to adequately match uh, the you know the request for support with Office of Support. So it was a, it was a collaborative effort between the between local government New South Wales, those two government departments, and the city of Sydney. That's a, lo a long list of recommendations. You've also included the recommendations that you've made to the New South Wales Inquiry. Um, I'll just give the reference, but I won't take the commissioners to it. It's LGN 500-001-0026. Out of those, maybe Mr McBride, you're in a, a good position to answer this. Um, which of these recommendations require urgent action before the next fire season? That is, are ones that the Commission should be focusing on by way of priority to any recommendations it might consider making. Sorry, are we referring to... Can we just clarify, is yes. this in relation to the our submission to the New South Wales Government Inquiry or to the Royal Commission? The first one, the Royal Correct. Commission, yeah, which is the appendix one that one should be displayed. Um, I can see it here. I can't see it on the broadcast. It's the Appendix 1 Summary of Recommendations, um, LGN 500-001-0051, the one that had the New South Wales Recommendation yes, 15. Yes. yes. Um, I might just start and then hand over to Sean, if that's okay. Um, I, I think that um, the questions around the DRFA and betterment funding is something that needs to be addressed sooner rather than later, given the many councils are in the process of rebuilding their infrastructure um, and that given the limitations of that current funding arrangement, if they are built, uh, if they are rebuilt as like for like, uh, and we do have a, another natural disaster, those, uh, that infrastructure is vulnerable. That's so recommendation that, four? That's recommendation four, yes. So that, that our view is that the Commonwealth needs to look at amending that to provide greater provision for betterment. Mm -hmm. particularly given that we're in the, the, the process of rebuilding right now. All right. And you also say eligibility criteria be extended to include local waste and water utility infrastructure. What, what's, um, yes. is, is, and that's on the back of the experience in uh, some of the uh, councils we heard earlier today. Is that right? Yes. yes. And I think it's also related to that we consider those are essential assets. We consider that, you know, particularly waste you know, it can be a public health issue if it's not um, addressed. And so excluding those from the DRFA means that often the accountability for funding any rebuild or recovery of, um, in, in relation to those assets falls to the local government, which, you know, I think as, as um, may have been pointed out in some of the submissions, you know, the local government have financial capacity constraints. And so their ability to fund over and above, you know, these recovery efforts is very limited, particularly when the extent of the bushfires is, and has been so widespread. Now, um, I'm very mindful of the time. We did start a little late, so I'll just cut short some of the matters I wanted to take you to, because I want the commissioners to have an opportunity. Uh, the I note that, Victoria, you also identified a review of the DRFA program uh, for further review and also um, seeking uh, as an urgent matter, um, any impediments to sharing of impact assessment data with councils should be addressed before the 2025 season, as well as the bushfire shelter option and neighbourhood safer places um, uh, policies. Uh, 
If I could just go to the coordination issue on a vertical basis in terms of, and bring um, you back in, Mr Beresford-Wiley. Um, we've just heard New South Wales identifies one of their um, second aspects of the recommendation for is establishment of a natural disaster mitigation program. And one of the matters that ALGA has advocated for is a dedicated $200 million mitigation fund and also ben betterment funding. Um, how does how does ALGA um, advance those kinds of recommendations from uh, state and territory associations to the national policy um, making uh, decision making bodies? Uh, well, we're, uh, as you point out, we're, uh, our job is advocacy. Um, we have been arguing for an increase in disaster mitigation uh, for an extended period of time, actually, probably going back to around 2011 or 2012. Uh, we put forward the, uh, the argument uh, in favour of uh, a targeted disaster mitigation program uh, to a, an inquiry of the Productivity Commission, looked at uh, disaster uh, funding uh, and provided a report in 2014 in which it supported the idea that there be a $200 million uh, dedicated mitigation fund. Uh, it's something we've pursued through the intergovernmental forums of which we're a member. Um, so it's something we've pursued through meetings of ministers, uh, emergency management ministers, and in particular the supporting um, groups that, uh, that uh, provide support for those ministerial meetings, uh, in, including the Australian New Zealand Emergency Management uh, Committee. Um, I'm, I, I'll be blunt and say we've been relatively robust and unceasing uh, in our view that there should be a dedicated fund uh, for mitigation. There previously were funds for disaster mitigation, um, those funds uh, uh, have since been rolled into various national partnership agreements. Uh, and I think the, uh, the direct line between funding from the Commonwealth and disaster mitigation projects at the local level has been lost. Right. Uh, that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, Commissioners, I, I, I have other questions, but I think I need to <laughs> pass it up to you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms Hogan. Dora. Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Um, can I pull up... Um, LGN 500 <clears throat> I just want to ask um, Ms Kwan a question about the issue she just raised about the disaster recovery funding arrangements definition of essential public asset. You'll see then the top paragraph is the argument by, made by New South Wales Local Government Association about that definition. My understanding of the DRFA in this respect is that it has what might be called a positive list, so a list of, of essential public assets that are treated as essential public assets for the purposes of the, the DRFA. Then it has a negative list, so a short list of, of assets that aren't included. And then it has a process for allowing um, governments to apply for other assets to be treated as essential public assets for the purposes of the DRFA. Um, have I got that correct, firstly? Yes, that is correct. Yep. Um, it, waste, as I understand it, waste and, and waste facilities and waste water facilities uh, are in the, the final category. That is, they're not on the positive list, they're not on the negative list. They're ones where you can apply. Do you know of instances of where councils have applied or state governments have applied for those assets to be treated as essential public assets and have been knocked back? Uh, well, I don't think any council's been successful in uh, having them treated as uh, essential uh, public assets. I think part of the problem has been, like with water and sewerage utilities, for example, as you know, New South Wales and Queensland councils manage them in regional areas, um, water utilities under national competition policy were determined to be businesses by definition, it's a sort of theoretical construct, and um, as such, as such, were not considered the essential infrastructure, public infrastructure. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. So, I'd just like to go. I've got a more fundamental question, a strategic question. I'll I'll lead into it and, and work up because of of where I'd like to get an understanding. All of you, if I understand it, and I've been having a quick Google on your websites and I'm taking the evidence that you presented, and also all the LGAs, most of the LGAs we spoke to um, given evidence over the last uh, week have talked about the importance of uh, the local government associations, the various associations. And, uh, and so 
just hearing what you're talking about now, you now you, you play a, a very important role in, in governance, helping councils in their development, policy support, we talk about developing risk frameworks, so all those things that are important for the functioning uh, of, of governments. Um, we've also heard you talk about your advocates. So you're there, your job is to advocate uh, for, uh, for the, the local governments. Also, uh, another statement, I think you just said, you're intermediaries between the state and, uh, and the local governments and the, and the councils. And so very good policy position, very good uh, in the advocacy role. And I can understand all that with the, as an association. I, can you just talk me through how you ended up performing an operational function of state government. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and anyone can start, but, but we've heard about the importance of, the, of you coordinating and facilitating the resource sharing between LGAs in an operational sense. And, I, and so this is where I just need a bit of an explanation. How did a policy advocacy group that's very important to developing the governments and the, the like uh, of local governments end up in the middle here and performing an operational function of a state government. Perhaps raise a hand. Yeah, please. <laughs> no. Okay. I'll uh, I'll go why because I'm just uh, um, because then and, and this might be an easy one to answer. If the state government's not a part of the resource sharing decisions that are made between the local governments, because you're facilitating all that, from our side and what the Commission is looking at in the coordination sense, how do the states know that the local governments are reaching capacity, have gone beyond capacity, and how do the states then know to forecast ahead that they might actually need to request Commonwealth assistance? And so is there a process where that all works? Um, From a New South Wales perspective, I yes, would say that we we have a very limited role in in operations. As I mentioned, we our main role is in advocacy. We were involved in the local government bushfire recovery support group, uh, but that was more in our you know we are a member organisation, and our we identified that as a member need. So we we participated in that group more as a you know on behalf of our members rather than a taking over a role of state government per se. Um, I think in terms of your broader question, the Office of Local Government in New South Wales is the government department that is responsible for regulating local governments and also uh, you know, auditing them each year, um, understanding their financials and things like that. So they do have a key role in communicating to the rest, you know, to, to other state governments in regards to the capacity constraints of councils, financial capacity, resourcing capacity, all of those sort of things. And then I think also because of the active role that local government and councils play more generally in, in all of these committees, recovery committees, emergency management committees and things like that, there is a lot of information flow that goes through all of those committees um, that then should become quite apparent to, to state governments and, and potentially up through the, um, the federal government uh, in terms of just the, the needs of local government more generally. Okay, thanks, Ms. Quay. I appreciate that. And I wasn't talking about capacity over a year or two. I'm talking about the evidence that we've seen so far is local governments have hit capacity within a day. And uh, and so how that might get rolled together and aggregated to a, to a good picture for the uh, for the, the state state government. I might go to Commissioner Bennett. I think Mr Pinter yeah, also no, help. No, thank you. I just wanted to ask, because my question that I was wanting to ask actually was very much in the same line but slightly more specific because bearing in mind, I mean I understand bearing in mind that you know that there are you do sit on emergency management committees and recovery committees and I understand that you can be a conduit from the um, the the state government organizing down through to the local to the local gov individual local councils I get that but bearing in mind the important the, the evidence we've heard about the importance of local knowledge, um, both in, in terms of mitigation, response and recovery, if you're the ones on the committees, how do you ensure that the individual local knowledge is transmitted in a timely fashion up through the, the, the overarching organising committees themselves? 
thanks, no. thanks. Uh, yes, Miss Lake. Um, yeah, I'll get with Miss Lake first, then I'll go I'll get us. I think South Australia must say something. Go on. Victoria. Thank you, Commissioner. So I think there's um, there's there's two ways of um, supporting small councils. One is the council to council approach, which I'd like to talk about the benefits of that in a minute. But there's also an escalation up through um, the regions to the state. And so that ensures that, um, as you say, you know, where a role that is best played locally continues to be played, but there is support from the regional and state level. Sorry, sorry, I, but I, I, sorry to interrupt for a second. Maybe I didn't make myself clear. I thought that it, it was your bodies that sat on some of these um, committees yeah. in, in the in the in the overarching committees, and yeah. I, I understand yeah. the support the local governments give each other, and I understand that they may that you know. <laughs> what happens when it gets down there. But in terms of getting that local information from them, if you're the one sitting at the table, how do you get that local information up to where it needs to be at the decision-making at the operational level? We sit on the state emergency management team and the state relief and recovery team. And while there are uh, control agencies and emergency services on those committees and the state emergency management Commissioner, uh, the Emergency Management Commissioner chairs the State Emergency Management Team. We are we're a support agency there. Um, the decisions are being made in the State Control Centre and um, by the the Control and Coordination Teams. The State Emergency Management Team is much more about strategic sharing of information. Um, and in terms of how we get our information, it's um, it. It's through our membership, so usually direct lines into me by or the CEO, and usually that's where, when it's a uh, broad scale issue that is affecting a lot of councils, we will raise it in those state level forums, so that they can, so it can be addressed through their control and coordination arrangements if necessary, or we'll use our relationships. Um, within the state government departments, if that's more appropriate. Um, so, but in terms of sort of the what's happening at the municipal level and the incident uh, incident control centres, we are not around the table, the incident control centre or the regional control centre. Only once it escalates to the state level, and even then, it's only in the sort of um, advisory role. Thank you. Is it much the Make same? Th thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lay. Is it much the same? I think, um, Mr. Pinniger, I think you wanted to say something from South Australia. Just to, so, from the, the Wangari bushfire um, uh, review, uh, recommended that um, local government be part of the state emergency management plan, and it ended up being the local government association to answer the question before. And yes, we are an advocacy and membership based organisation. And when we came in, to this role, there was a state funding to assist us set up a local government functional support group, and that funding has subsequently been withdrawn. We've been advocating um, for many years for the state to reinstate funding to assist us and uh, play our role in the state emergency management plan. In terms of accessing information, um, there are zone uh, emergency management committees which are ongoing. So there's a wartime and a peacetime operation in, in peacetime things such as reviewing policies, procedures, training, planning, networking, all of these things are happening in preparation for an event. When an event occurs, there's a zone emergency support teams that's set up to give live information back to the local government functional support group, which is sitting with control agencies in the state emergency management centre. So when updated briefings are occurring during an event, we know what's happening in a council or a zone area. We know what councils are in need and what they need. But at the same time, we also know what other councils can offer to assist control agencies and assist other councils. Thank you. Did you want anything from um, anyone from New South Wales on that one? Uh, no, look, we, okay. we operate in much the same capacity as outlined by... Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that clarification. No, and th thanks. I, I appreciate complex questions don't have simple answers and these aren't simple simple times and, and trying to get a better understanding of it all. I appreciate that. Commissioner McIntosh has another. Uh, Thank question. you, Chair. Um, I know we're, we're running short on time, so I'll be very quick. Um, could, operator, could you put up LGA 5010010012? 
third para. Um, just a question for you, Mr. Beresford Wiley, about your submission. Y you raise in that paragraph um, issues with transparency about the National Bushfire Recovery Agency and funding decisions concerning local councils. I think what you've said there is pretty clear. I, I just wanted to ask you whether um, you know of or encounter similar transparency issues with other recovery programs. Uh, the answer is no. This was a, um, I'm talking there about the, uh, the $60 million um, fund, which uh, the Prime Minister announced, I think, on the 9th of January, um, and uh, and the allocation of, uh, of those funds. The initial um, announcement uh, tied the funding to councils uh, which, uh, which were within areas where a particular category of assistance under the DRFA had been activated. That was Category C. <clears throat> and there were 42 councils originally identified. Um, and, uh, and $42 million was distributed. Um, there was a, a subsequent um, uh, press release from the, from the Prime Minister, a press conference, uh, on the 15th of January, where he announced that a further 17 councils, and in fact the total rose to 60, 17 councils uh, were, uh, were also uh, Category C councils now, and funding would be, would be um, provided, uh, and there was a $17 million bucket that was left. Councils actually formed the view um, uh, uh, the misapprehension, perhaps, or, or they, they actually believed that there was a link between the Category C funding and them, uh, and thought that there'd be an automatic funding of a million dollars. That did not turn out to be the case, um, uh, and there was a, um, a, a, a lack of um, clear understanding uh, for local government, and, uh, and it wasn't clear uh, to, to councils um, that, uh, that there wasn't a direct link between uh, the, uh, the $60 million and councils which had been classified as Category C councils. Uh, the end result was that, uh, that uh, councils were left in some doubts about whether they would receive uh, the million dollars. Uh, uh, some councils did not. Uh, the number of councils now who um, uh, are classified, I think, as Category C councils is more than 100. Uh, the $60 million uh, was expanded slightly to be $62 million. About 68 councils received funding uh, under a, um, uh, a process that, uh, that was run by the National Bushfire Recovery Agency. For a while there, there wasn't any um, uh, public release of information about how much funding individual councils had received. Uh, there is now um, uh, information available on the NVRA website, uh, which tells individual councils how much money was, uh, was provided. But this seemed to be a special circumstance in which there was a rapid response from the government to provide funding, uh, which was outside the normal um, type of funding mechanisms that councils would normally um, access, that is through the DRFA. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, this um, this transparency gap uh, arose. Um, uh, to this point, uh, the, um, the reality is that the funding has been distributed to councils. It's not going to be increased. Uh, there's 68 councils that have received funding from a $62 million bucket. Uh, the rest of councils' um, uh, resources or their, their needs are expected to be met from within the broader DRFA program um, and some of the other funding provided by the NBRA in terms of its uh, community recovery fund, which has uh, recently been announced. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Ms Hogan Doran. Uh, we have gone over time, Chair. Uh, but it's been worthwhile. It's yes. been a good discussion. So. Um, there are other matters that we'll take up that have come out of the course of the afternoon uh, and um, particularly maybe of assistance to the Commission to re review again in uh, coming hearings. No, I appreciate that. This, is, this has been a good week and this is a good way to end uh, leading into uh, working with the states Next, uh, in the next two weeks. So I, I appreciate everyone making themselves available for the panel this afternoon and giving us a good insight to, to the local government associations. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the work that you do. We appreciate that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May they be excused from their summons, Ms Hogan Doran? Yes, indeed. You may be excused from your summons. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Chair, that, that completes all the material by way of uh, legal virtue evidence. Um, we, there has been a substantial amount of material that has been uh, tendered today mm -hmm. and, in fact, over the course of the week. Um, it may be that there are other matters that arise. We may need to um, revisit them depending on what they are. Yeah. Um, otherwise, uh, it's proposed that we would adjourn to Tuesday next week uh, in uh, to commence looking at issues within state responsibility, state and territory responsibility in the context of natural disasters in Australia. Okay. 
so 10 o'clock next Tuesday, um, noting that we might have to come together and uh, make sure we've, uh, we've tidied up all the, uh, the, the submissions and the like to be tendered. Okay. Until then, 10 o'clock next Tuesday, we'll adjourn. Thank you. All rise. The Royal Commission has adjourned until 10am Tuesday. <laughs>